Introduction to the New Idealism. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. The New Idealism by May Sinclair. Introduction. This book is dedicated to William Pepperell Montague, who will not agree with the word of it. Introduction. The aim of this book is twofold, to examine the foundations of realism more critically and to outline a reconstruction of idealism more closely than was possible five years ago. The latest developments of philosophy demand a revision of the whole problem from a shifted standpoint. Since 1917, realism has gained in solidity and a certain intricate precision. The critical realists have discovered a flaw in its theory of perception and tried to mend it, not, I think, with conspicuous success. Professor Whitehead has laid down its first principles once for all, and Professor Alexander has built it up into a system among systems. Realism is ten times more formidable than it was in 1917. And since 1917, the issue has been narrowed down to the field of space and time, and it is there that the battle between realism and idealism must be fought. That issue is very clear. For, however realists may differ among themselves, whether they say with Professor Alexander that space-time is the ultimate reality, or with Professor Whitehead that the ultimate entities are events, they are all agreed that mind is not the ultimate entity, and must be kept out of the problem. Nature, Professor Whitehead says, is closed to mind. Mind, on any realist scheme, is only one more entity, one more change in a sequence of changes. The last thing, not the first, though highest, if you like, in the scale of values. The problem of the realist, then, is how to account for mind as part of a system in which mind was not present from the beginning. I have tried to show that this attempt to get mind out of the mindless lands us in endless difficulties and contradictions, contradictions which are only removed from one level of the inquiry to crop up again on the next that it is easier to obtain an uncontradictious space-time continuum from ultimate consciousness than to produce consciousness from an ultimate space-time. Take this affair of the continuum. Professor Whitehead tells us that it is secured by the covering which one event gives to another and to its own event particles. You can divide an event into an infinite number of event particles but the whole event extends over them in unbroken duration. This is true. It is also true that if once you start splitting up events into event particles, you are saddled with all the inconveniences of discontinuity. The event as a whole, as a covering continuum, exists only for consciousness which holds together all the moments of its duration. For the idealist, consciousness is the covering event. I have tried to show both that consciousness is ultimate and that there is consciousness and consciousness and that the realist attack bears hard not on primary consciousness which perceives feels wills remembers conceives and imagines but on consciousness which returns on itself on that secondary supervening consciousness which reflects judges infers and reasons professor whitehead is right when he says that it is no explanation of anything to say that there is a mind knowing it, if he means that things are not made or modified by the play of mind on them. But this play is the act, not of primary, but of secondary consciousness. I have not seized on this distinction because it is an easy way out of the difficulty, but because it seems to me to be a simple fact of experience. I should be ashamed of treating so plain a platitude as if it were a discovery were it not that it is continually overlooked the main assumption of realism that in knowing we know that things exist in themselves apart from any knowing rests on the confusion i have tried to show that this assumption is not justified that primary consciousness knows nothing about things outside and apart from itself and makes no affirmation of their independent existence that this again is the work of secondary consciousness 
and that we have only to examine our primary consciousness in its innocence and purity to see that it is so the affirmations of secondary consciousness which are what realism goes on come too late it does indeed report a distinction between itself and what it knows but what it knows is nothing more nor less than that primary block of consciousness in which there is no distinction between knowing and things known i am not going to apologize too much for this book for it is not a defense of my defense of idealism on the contrary it is an attempt successful or unsuccessful to remedy the many shortcomings of that light-hearted essay the worst of these were its failure to realize the supreme importance of space-time in the problem of consciousness and the bearing of values on the moral problem i am still in the curious position of admiring beyond everything the work of the realists with whose conclusions i am not able to agree i have no longer any prejudice against realism and would even be glad if somebody would convert me to it so that i might enjoy the advantages of the position for example its freedom from metaphysical care about all the arguments for idealism there is an air of melancholy compulsion while for sheer intellectual delight give me realism it has turns of surpassing fascination and surprise such is professor laird's idea that when you remember mont blanc you are really and truly back in the past beholding the mountain such professor whitehead's theory of time and professor alexander's correlation of space-time and his vision of deity these things come on you like the first burst long ago of plato and spinoza of kant and hegel on your excited youth i know no other philosophy that provides a comparable thrill as it was not possible while still struggling with my opponents to convey any sense of my profound indebtedness i record it here lest in the agitation of controversy i should seem to have forgotten what it would ill become me to forget if i betray ignorance of many contemporary idealists it is because for years i was satisfied with kant and hegel relieved by schopenhauer and mr bradley and because lately my chief interest has been in seeing what can be said against idealism it is the realists who have made me look to its defences and who have most helped to show me the possible lines of reconstruction i could have done nothing without professor alexander's work on space-time much as idealism owes to idealists its larger debt must be to the first realist who taught them to take space and time seriously so after years of devotion to mr bradley's absolute i wanted to see what would happen if i simply followed the trail which thanks to professor alexander i saw before me if it happens to have struck across somebody else's trail so that i seem to have borrowed without acknowledgment i apologize the part of the present essay i feel most nervous about is that in the second section of chapter three where i have ventured to criticize professor whitehead's work the idealist who has no expert mathematical knowledge must always be haunted by a ghastly fear for all he knows the mathematician may come out at any moment and slay him with a set of equations and he will not even have the benefit of knowing how dead he is again i am afraid that in my chapter on the antinomies of space and time i have done less than justice to professor boudin who has written three brilliant philosophic works time and reality truth and reality and a realistic universe besides his essay on cosmic evolution he has succeeded in making even pragmatism fascinating but it seemed a pity that so fine a thinker should have taken up with such a lamentable view of space and time the more so as his pragmatic realist intentions have not blinded him to certain aspects of the case that make for idealism and he has shown very clearly that he sees where the root of the matter lies thus in time and reality quote, we can never prove that what appears as continuous is not objectively discrete thus the surface of the water and the pictures of the vitoscope appear as continuous though objectively we know that they are discrete the continuity here is in the perceiving subject not in the perceived object the only way then to be sure we have a continuum is intellectually to construct one if you ask then how we know that there is such a continuum whether it is not merely an ideal construction 
we answer that this is irrelevant to our purpose but if there is objective continuity at all it must be thus constructed End quote. the uninstructed student should be warned that realism is more formidable than it can be made to look also that when the critics of professor whitehead and professor alexander have done their worst space time and deity the inquiry concerning the principles of natural knowledge and the concept of nature are likely to stand with the greatest philosophic works of the twentieth century i do not imagine for one moment that my own idealism is watertight or that no doubt will ever trouble me as to the truth of its assumptions all metaphysics are highly problematic and the idealist is not more bound than other people to furnish a watertight system enough if his theory does not leak too much he cannot prove anything any more than other people his assumptions need not even be a better description provided they give a more adequate and consistent explanation of the facts but they must be adequate they must be consistent and they must explain i can hardly hope that mine fulfill these requirements at all points it must be admitted that idealists before now have spoiled their case by injudicious statements i have tried to avoid injudicious statements but it is more than likely that i have not been so successful as i think the worst or the best that can happen to me is to be found out i shall not care if some idealist comes along and says this isn't new idealism so and so has said it already ten times over for then i shall have so and so's support or if another idealist says this will never do this isn't the way to reconstruct idealism i can show you a much better one i shall not care provided he does show me and i hope i shall not mind very much if a realist comes and smashes the whole thing to smithereens provided he convinces me of some truth i have not seen i can only say this is the truth about idealism as i see it now i submit myself to the judgment of those who know how hard it is in this adventure to escape disaster may sinclair london july twenty ninth nineteen twenty one end of introduction recording by expatriate in bangor maine book one chapter one section one of the new idealism by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine book one the critical preparations chapter one the old idealism section one the position what is the exact position of idealism at the present day what is likely to be its position in the future how is it going to emerge if it emerges at all from its encounter with the new realism there is no denying that the new realism has made a prodigious disturbance in philosophic thought a disturbance so vital and far-reaching that philosophic thought will never look the same again the idealist is fatuously sanguine if he expects his own pet system to come up out of the turmoil looking just the same never before has there been such a ruthless exposure of the weak points in his position at the present moment it seems fairly safe to say that the old idealism i mean the idealism of the eighteenth and nineteenth centuries of berkeley of kant and hegel of the new kantians and new hegelians all the old logic and epistemology horrible word will have to go and give place to an idealism which will take serious account of the world of space and time the old idealism owes its present rather dubious position not only to its more recent excesses but to the shadiness of its transactions in the past consider its origins it started with the crime of question begging descartes i think therefore i am was really a very glaring instance since then idealism has never ceased to mix up the ratio ascendi with the ratio cognoscendi and to glory in the confusion still one aspect of idealism should not be lost sight of hitherto it has always been a reaction against some foregoing dogmatism it started critical even with descartes it started critical it may even be said that the most valuable part of the cartesian philosophy is its criticism its scepticism its method 
and modern idealism properly speaking starts with kant following hume even realists will admit that as hume's philosophy like berkeley's was a justifiable reaction against the dualistic realism of locke kant's philosophy was a justifiable reaction against the dogmatic realism of wolf every great philosophic system is a reaction or a development from its predecessor in either case it must be critical since development also involves selection and rejection idealism then is primarily a criticism whatever construction or reconstruction it may end with it begins empirically with an examination of experience in kant's hands it became a system that any realist can in his heart respect even when he has danced on kant's antinomies and his unity of apperception and his transcendental ego we know that the critical philosophy ended in a formidable skepticism a drastic doubt of appearances a thorough-going system of relativity even the schemata of space and time even the categories constitutive of experience though they may be apply only to appearances not to things in themselves by a beautiful irony of logic kantian idealism ends in dualism too there is a gulf fixed between thought and the thing in itself kant's schemata fall apart from his categories the august categories after all are not constitutive of reality they are barely constitutive of phenomenal appearance though they receive its taint they are ready-made intellectual forms salvaged from an exploded logic clapped on to the given stuff or content of sensation frames into which sense data like so many window panes somehow amazingly contrive to fit constitutive or not thought partakes of the phenomenal the ultimately unreal character of its sensuous content knowledge is cheated of being if the thing in itself remains unknown and unknowable at the same time this dualism between appearances and reality was simpler than the dualism of descartes and spinoza simpler than any preceding realism and the next step in simplification was obvious hegel took it he knocked the bottom out of dualism with one immense simplifying phrase thought is the thing in itself why go out of your way to assume any other the ding an sich does not skulk and dodge unknown behind phenomena it is part the most essential and permanent part of the entire show an ultimate unknown skulking and dodging ding an sich is an unwarrantable and superfluous duplication of the real he called it a deadhead wherever you pick him up he is concerned with the process of self-determining self-realizing thought with opposing and opposing and reconciling of its differences with a world of becoming of passing away and with the passing away of the passing and the thing in itself emerges again and again in higher and higher forms as it swings itself upwards eternal and self-same through all the intricate movements of the triple dialectic nothing could be more complicated yet nothing could be simpler it seems almost childishly simple when you catch the trick of it the world is neither more nor less than a system of thought relations a transparent system the net in which hegel snares the unwary world is a net of diamond sense itself the crux of hegelianism what is it but one of two terms in a thought relation this cosmos of perceived relations is through and through objective for us for finite and relative consciousness but the subject object relation itself falls into the net of absolute thought its being is to be known pure unqualified being is the thinnest and poorest of the categories but absolute knowledge is being in its totality it doesn't greatly matter whether this is or is not a true account of absolute idealism it is the account that passes for it with most of hegel's followers and all of his opponents i do not think it distorts hegel more than he distorted himself in his logic anyhow it is what we mean when we talk about absolute idealism and it has secured a firm and independent footing under that name that the grand totality of thought is itself only a moment in the process of absolute spirit that spirit should be regarded as a neutral third the underlying unifying reality of matter and consciousness 
that in hegel's system properly understood the logical aspect is ultimately transcended all this may be urged with equal passion and reason by the devotees of hegel in spite of them in spite of his own reiterated protests his logic stands as the most thorough paced system of epistemology that horrible word again ever known thought is the thing in itself it is ultimate reality it is the whole so comprehensive is it that it renders spirit or any other metaphysical entity superfluous we are forced to the preposterous conclusion not only that all knowing is being but that all being is knowing which appears to say the least of it improbable observe that in each system of idealism some fundamental element of reality escapes the net thus berkeley takes little account of thought hegel is not serious with sense kant fails to correlate them all three neglect the metaphysical and creative will End of Book 1, Volume 1, Chapter 1, Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Book 1, Chapter 1, Section 2 of The New Idealism by Mason Clare. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Book 1, The Critical Preparations chapter one the old idealism section two epistemology now if it fails to establish an absolute consciousness carrying and covering the totality of things idealism is done for its reductio ad absurdum is solipsism of the world before consciousness we shall be obliged to say either that it never existed or that it only exists now from moment to moment in consciousness that provides it with a past time and a behavior deducible in consciousness from its behavior here and now we shall have to say of the solar system of the plesiosaurus flopping on his mesozoic beach of the club mosses and tree ferns of the carboniferous age that they have only this problematical existence they never really were they are constructions in consciousness of what they would have been had there been any consciousness to perceive them when i go out of the room the room and everything in it ceases to exist i give birth to the hall and stair passages instead as i go along them i may carry all space and all time about with me but within them the vast cosmos lives and dies according to whether i am conscious of it or not when i am unconscious space and time also die to return to sanity the vital problem for the epistemological idealist is the problem of the synthetic judgment the judgment by which we enlarge our experience at first sight it looks as if such judgments could only be empirical as if it were truer to speak of experiences by which we enlarge our judgment as if there could be no such thing as synthetic judgments a priori all judgments concerned with a priori material all judgments of pure space-time all judgments of pure mathematics even the simplest so long as they advance from a lower to a higher power from the point to the line from the line to the plane from the plane to the solid are synthetic and are a priori in the sense that they are true independently of actual concrete experience but mark what follows according to the old idealism the mind is the origin and home of all the a priori stuff there is you would therefore suppose that in any judgment a priori the mind is not travelling along the field of experience and arriving at fresh knowledge it is merely unloading the thought stuff which previous to all experience it carries about with itself as a matter of course consequently no a priori judgment can be synthetic in the sense of giving it something that it hasn't got it is in the field of space and time that the self adds to its knowledge and that synthetic judgments become possible if kant is right and space and time are forms of sensible experience alone not only will pure mathematical knowledge be independent of space and time but there will be no such thing as synthetic mathematical knowledge a priori no advance no discovery in the higher mathematics when boy i found that two parallel lines can be drawn through one point contrary to euclid's axiom 
contrary you may say to all previous experience of parallel lines you would have thought that if ever there was a synthetic judgment it was that the whole business is purely synthetic neither contained in the notion of parallel lines nor provided for by their definition and it is purely a priori since no possible concrete experience would give you the behavior of bolyai's parallel lines and so far from denying all this kant declares very emphatically and in leaded type that all mathematical judgments even some apparently analytic ones are synthetic and yet if he is right and the mind supplies the a priori elements of the cosmos he has no business to talk about a priori synthesis at all bolyai would not have discovered new properties of parallel lines the pure mathematician cannot discover new properties of anything he does nothing but cart old properties about with him in his a priori portmanteau and take them out and look at them as he goes along the old idealism is in a dilemma if kant is right and space and time are schemata of sensible perception only they may provide for the synthesis but they do away with all the a prioriness if hegel is right and they are forms of a priori thinking where is the synthesis on either theory it is clear that you can't have both this affair of the synthetic judgment is crucial for idealism the epistemological idealist has got to account for the unearned increment of mathematical knowledge for the mathematician's advance from the known a priori to the previously unknown when on his hypothesis the a priori unknown is a contradiction in terms but an a priori truth becomes an empirical truth as soon as it is known that is to say is taken up into the general body of experience on the other hand no possible manipulation will convert an empirical truth into an a priori one so that properly speaking there are no immediate empirical truths only empirical facts from which truths are derived by a process of generalization it is a fact that i see a brickbat fall to the ground but it is not a truth though my judgment may be true or false according as it agrees or not with the fact it is a truth that action and reaction are equal and opposite but it is also an empirical fact it is obvious that though newton arrived at his third law of motion by a process of thought it is not a law of thought that he arrived at but a law of motion so when the idealist i mean the epistemological idealist says that the universe is the work of thought what does he precisely mean presumably he does not mean that it is the work of an ingenious creator manufacturing a cosmos after a pattern of ideas in his head he means that thought is more intimately connected more deeply interfused with the universe than that he means that thought is the stuff of it and that so far it is downright concrete and objective he does not mean merely that the universe is of such a sort that it may be understood that by taking thought we can find out all about it he means nothing more nor less than that thought builds up a solid barracks of a cosmos with the bricks of sense data and the mortar of the categories if he is a post-kantian idealist he will of course reduce space and time to thought relations and settle them down comfortably among the categories too and he will tell you all about the categories but of the sense data he will not be able to give any coherent account at all even the nature of the correlation will be left obscure enough that somehow or other we can and do apply changing the metaphor the neatly cut pattern of our thoughts to the unreasonable and shapeless stuff of sense and all the time there is no state of consciousness no real process of thinking that in the least resembles this process except that afterthought which recognizes the presence of the categories in any given section of experience true that cut it where you will experience will yield to thought at least the categories of space and time of relativity of quality or quantity or both and equally the data of sense will play so to speak into their hands they will not on the first casual encounter show themselves hard and recalcitrant to thought that is a later development up to a certain point they will submit placably to thought relations so far so good but the epistemological idealist takes little or no account of cosmic processes 
which are in no sense processes of thought. He can make nothing of cosmic relations, the terms are which are not terms of thought, but such things as matter and motion, energies, inertias, velocities, chemical actions and reactions, life, growth, and reproduction. The sequences in which he builds up his universe are ludicrously unlike the sequences in which the universe would appear to have built itself up before thought, before consciousness came into it. The epistemological idealist declares that the being of the external universe is to be known. And though you may say of any given section of experience that in the perception of its quality you join the category of quality onto its sense data, that the finding of the cause of any given effect involves the application of the category of causality, and so on through the whole list, still, this is not the method by which experience is increased section by section. The external world becomes known by processes of synthesis and analysis, not by such synthesis as the dabbing of categories onto sense data, nor by such analysis as disentangling them again from the result, but by thought's patient, subservient following of processes, the majority of which are inherently irrational, irreducible to any thought. The idealist may be able to face without a qualm the idea of the plesiosaurus disporting himself on his mesozoic beach when there isn't anybody to look at him. The idea of primordial matter in motion, of worlds indubitably real, whirling away in space millions of years before the appearance of consciousness on this planet. His absolute ensures him against loss. His cosmos is perfectly safe, floating about in the vast consciousness of the absolute. The plesiosaurus is not playing to an empty house, for he has the all-appreciating eye of the absolute upon him. So far, the idealist has nothing to worry about. But what he ought to worry about and doesn't is the idea of a cosmos claimed to be the work of thought and the very process of reason, which yet contains so many things that are not reasonable, so many processes that are not processes of thought at all. When we consider what reason is and what it does and what it doesn't do, have we any reason to suppose that in the absolute consciousness an irrational relation becomes a rational one, or that matter in motion, say, is known as spirit at rest? It may be. The pattern of the cosmos as a whole may be a purely static affair. Within the absolutely resting whole, matter in motion may turn out to be a mode of the manifestation of spirit. But if it does, it will not be by virtue of its epistemological qualities. And at the present stage of proceedings, we have no business to assume its spirituality. For it is the thoroughgoing irrationality of the universe that is dangerous to our idealist. The bosom of the absolute is not the comfortable home he thinks it is. It is too comprehensive, too hospitable to those irrational elements. Look at some of them. Who can measure the proportion of reason and non-reason in the universe? There is reason in certain complexes, in all adaptations of means to ends, in all laws derived from laws, in all generalizations from generalizations, in all measures and proportions. There is reason in a physical equation, in a resultant whose factors are known in all mathematical processes apart from their ultimate terms, in every calculation of causes whose effects are known or of effects whose causes are known, in every calculation whose terms are known, in every relation whose terms are known, in every quantity-quality correlation when the original connection between quantity and quality is known. But there may be no reason in the original connection. For example, between vibrations of a certain wavelength and the quality red. No reason in the connection between molecular nerve change and stimulus, and between nerve change and the sensum red, or between an act of will and muscular contraction. No reason in chemical action and reaction, in magnetic attraction, in gravitation, in the transformation of heat into energy and energy into heat, or in any other physical permutation no reason in certain fundamental axioms of mathematics, in any irreducible, indefinable term, in any ultimate entity. We shall presently see that there is no reason in pure space and pure time. No reason, it would seem, in the very elements from which the cosmos is built up. 
and besides his confusion of being with knowing and his neglect of those ultimate irreducible things the idealist ignores the will will is chief among ultimate irreducible things if will is to be treated merely as a department of human psychology why not thought in what respect is a category which after all has got to be put there by somebody or something more commendable than an act of will epistemology is always shirking this fundamental problem of the will what are we to say then is the realist right in regarding all knowledge as primarily discovery the idealist is faced with the glaring fact that there is discovery not only in the physical sciences but in his own a priori realm if he stopped to consider seriously what he means when he talks about experience he would see that he is juggling with the double meaning of the term even when he is honest and calls the thing consciousness all the time he is landed in queer places it is not that my private and personal adventure the process by which i enlarge my knowledge is made to figure as an ontology the idealist distinguishes between the empirical experience of the ego in space and time and the ontological function of the categories he can insist that knowledge is only discovery for us for finite consciousnesses progressing in space and time experiencing is not experience but this doesn't help him very much the trouble is that the actual process of the cosmos bears no earthly resemblance to the means by which he affirms it to have arisen in consciousness it looks as if he would have to surrender to the first realist who comes along and confronts him with the difference but no it is at this point that he makes his bolt for the absolute now supposing the idealist is not thinking of consciousness as we know it at all that he has made a successful bolt and found his refuge in the absolute it is not possible that thought alone should be this absolute whatever else it does the absolute must cover must somehow provide for all those recalcitrant irrational unclarified elements that make up half the fabric of the universe he can only arrive at his absolute by exposing the relativity of the ultimate categories of thought and filtering them away the absolute is nothing if it is not a higher more comprehensive term than thought higher and more comprehensive even than consciousness after all being is not knowing and knowing is not being so that epistemological idealism is broken on its own wheel end of book one chapter one section two recording by expatriate in bangor maine book one chapter one section three of the new idealism by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine book one the critical preparations chapter one the old idealism section three the future of idealism for this generation anyhow epistemological idealism is dead and i confess i do not see how there can be any resurrection for it with its one-sidedness its blindness to the actual pattern of the universe its fantastic logic its failure to correlate the forms and processes of thought with the forms and processes of things it was bound to provoke a formidable reaction i think it must be admitted that new realists are right in contending that there are things in the universe which forever escape the snare of thought that you might as well put salt on its tail as try to catch the universe that way by no conceivable process can it be reduced to terms of mere knowing to consciousness as we know it the universe presents an obstinately objective front now it is against all precedent that any philosophic system should appear again in the precise form in which it originated if idealism is to survive if a new idealism is to spring up by way of reaction from the new realism it will be a system as far removed from logics and epistemologies as the idealisms of kant and hegel of green and bosanquet and bradley are removed from the sensational idealism of berkeley and of hume if it is to survive it is unthinkable that idealism should remain unaffected 
by the profound change that has come into philosophy with the appearance of the new realism clearly it has got to move on or go under these essays are an attempt slight i am aware and imperfect as such tentative efforts must be to estimate the effect of the new realism to map out the first lines of possible movement one thing is obvious that no advance is possible without definite revisions and surrenders idealism must not underrate the enemy's forces and it must be prepared to cede certain territory it must leave behind it certain nobly built redoubts certain cherished positions no longer tenable it must give up its unnatural logics scrap its obsolete apparatus of thought relations and it must change its methods it must once more be empirical critical reactive and that is no simple affair of surrenders and concessions idealism must effect an entire change of front it must come out into the open and external universe of things it must somehow contrive to reconcile the universe of things with the universe of thought without doing violence to its palpable objectivity it must cease to make nonsense of the plain principles of physical science and of the plain man's progress in the world of so-called physical realities and it must be proof against all attacks based on the behavior of that world first of all then the new idealism has to do as professor alexander tells us take space and time seriously end of book one chapter one Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Book One, Chapter Two, Section One of the New Idealism by May Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Book One, The Critical Preparations, Chapter Two, The New Realism section one the realist position the new realism was bound to come other philosophies anticipated its insurgence against the persistent tyranny of the absolute and the one i think it was william james who first pointed out that the appetite for unity is not a universal one it seemed to him a perverted appetite or at best an acquired taste a psychological eccentricity which as it has no bearing upon conduct the pragmatist need not take into account but humanism pragmatism and vitalism did little but revolt they were incapable of accomplishing a revolution none of the three had anything that could be called a logic or an ontology still by setting up irrelevant standards they succeeded in sidetracking philosophy for quite a number of years humanism defending the honest man's claim for possession of a world of real things uncontaminated by subjective processes pragmatism turning its back on the quest for ultimate reality and substituting its scale of working values for the logical criteria of truth both boosting the many at the expense of the one vitalism presenting its elan vital as the ultimate reality and reconstructing the perceived cosmos with reference to our action and our action only going from one contradiction and confusion to another in its attempt to reconcile realism and idealism physical science and metaphysics they have nothing in common with the new realism but their respect for external reality and their distaste for the absolute of idealist monism they need not detain us here realism then starts with a criticism of the idealist theory of knowledge and being its method is strictly empirical it takes the cosmos provisionally at its face value and asks why assume that this is a universe rather than a pluriverse why assume that it is a world of appearances rather than of real things why assume that its being is only to be known if you are going by appearances which is all that on your own showing you have to go on then the cosmos presents every appearance of plurality every appearance of independent reality utterly outside consciousness but this independence and outsideness is more than a mere matter of appearance it follows from the nature both of reality and of knowing 
if a thing is known ipso facto it is something more than the act or state whichever it may be of knowing idealism assumes that this act or state is simpler than it really is knowing involves at least two terms and a relation whether you take the subject and object as your terms and consciousness as your relation or consciousness and the object of consciousness when your relation will be an unknown x in either case the object will stand on its own feet as a separate and independent entity which is all that realism wants now the realist complains with every show of reason that the idealist mistakes the nature of the terms and the relation and confuses the ratio ascendi with the ratio cognoscendi when the two theories are tried out pluralistic realism shows itself more scientific and would seem to conform better to the actual known processes of the cosmos the new realist revolutionizes philosophic thought by abandoning the egocentric position the egocentric position is to him what the ptolemaic system was to copernicus a whole stellar cosmos turning round a comparatively insignificant earth this looks as if the new realist ignored every form of idealism but solipsism but if you grant his premises objective and absolute idealism are equally vulnerable to his attack no act of mere knowing even if it were absolute and knowing is purely relative to the known and to the knower no act of knowing could confer reality upon its object things are not there because we know them we know them because they are there and the absolute even if it existed could not know for knowing would at once involve it in relations so that outside finite and relative consciousness there is no knowing to sustain the universe and no finite and relative consciousness is equal to the job besides we have no experience of any finite and relative consciousness but our own and it is obviously absurd to suppose that our own consciousness confers being on a cosmos known to have existed ages before we did even now that we are here by far the greater part of the cosmos continues to exist outside the bounds of our awareness and according to laws which are very far from being the laws of our thought obsessed with the idea of knowledge as being the idealist ignores its essential nature as discovery obsessed with the unity of the whole he forgets that discovery is partial and incomplete what trifling unity there may be in a pluralistic universe is a real unity independent of the alleged unity of consciousness but though the new realist cannot abide unity in any sense of totality and excludes it from his pluriverse he swears by continuity that continuity of time and space which ensures the reality of both and with it the reality of all objects and movements and relations in the world of space and time in a cosmos said to be real absolutely real you cannot have insoluble contradictions of time and space to the realist the real is absolute though the absolute is not the real mr bertrand russell for one would probably object to my saying that he bases the reality of the perceived external world on the findings of pure mathematics he would contend that the realist theory of perception can very well afford to stand on its own feet all the same it is clear that he regards the mathematical continuum of the compact series as destructive to any idealist theory based on the antinomies of space and time the last thing that the idealist desires is their solution and it is precisely this solution that the realist confronts him with between any two points in space or any two instants in time there is an infinite number of points or instants there are that is to say no gaps and no nextness of point to point or instant to instant nothing anywhere that is not pure space and pure time an indisputable continuum it will be seen at once that this theory links up the space and time of pure mathematics with the actual space and time of physics in one system of reality so that unless the idealist can succeed in picking a hole in the mathematician's continuum he cannot throw any metaphysical doubt on the reality of motion achilles even if we conceive him moving in pure space and pure time 
achilles with a given velocity would cover any given stretch of space in any given time and would infallibly overtake the tortoise and the new realism claims to have done away forever with the kantian antinomies of space and time thus given the absolute external reality of space time and motion the absolute external reality of matter follows unconditionally and in approaching the problem of perception from the periphery the realist succeeds in bringing his philosophy into line with physics and mathematics in no sense are things there because we perceive them we perceive them because they are there and they owe nothing to our perceiving this is true even of such apparently subjective affairs as pain or anger pain according to the new realist is not a subjective affection it is a thing as objective and external as a tree in a field pain is where it professes to be and where i perceive it in my big toe and not in my consciousness it follows that we perceive things as they are and that they are what they appear to be properly speaking in a realistic universe there can be no appearances for every appearance is itself a reality we shall have to return to this question when we are considering the nature of reality but for the present we may take it that in the universe as an existence there is no deception and things are what they appear at the moment of their appearing and every aspect of reality is real the straight stick appears bent in the water the cube is convex one minute and concave the next as you shift your eyes but the stick's crookedness in water is as real to the eye as its straightness is real to the touch both are real aspects of the stick but in different contexts the same holds good of the convex and concave cube in mistaking appearances for reality we are not dealing with appearance at all we are simply referring reality to the wrong context in the case of the stick we say that touch corrects the finding of the eye that it is truer but this only means that it affirms a more constant relation the eye also sees truly what is there the visual and temporary aspect of the stick in water but there are eyes and eyes my friend is blind to red to him all heather is blue and all poppies are yellow it may be said that his eye sets up a private scene in contradistinction to mine so it does but his scene is just as real just as external to his perceiving as mine in the matter of objectivity there isn't a pin to choose between them at the same time it is now evident that the sensible properties of this spectacular universe depend on something private to the spectator in what sense then do we see the same things it is clear that we do not see the same forms for we each approach them from a separate angle and see them in a different perspective only when i have changed places with my neighbor can we be said to see the same thing but our seeing is now in another time our times and our spaces can never by any possibility coincide therefore we are perceiving different universes and there will be as many universes of sensible qualities as there are spectators and each one of them will have the same absolute reality independent of our perceiving and all these universes will arise from the play of the ultimate unperceived constituents of matter in motion within a system which is one and the same for all of us it is our bodies each with its complex of nerve cells sense organs and brain cortex that multiply the sensibles of this universe into so many sensa and break up its one space into innumerable perspectives first we have certain converging lines of matter in motion communicating their vibrations along our afferent nerves to our various sense organs which pass on the shock of the encounter to the cerebral cortex if we say that the sensum blue is a fulguration to use professor alexander's word arising from this contact we shall have as many different sensa as there are shocks it follows that in the absence of bodies with their sense organs and cerebral cortices no sensa will be there only sensibles permanent possibilities of sensa when we all leave the room the room as a constellation of fulgurations a complex of sensa ceases to exist not because our minds have moved on but because we have removed our bodies thus all our movements will affect the universe profoundly 
our approaches will mark the swift or gradual increase in the vividness and complexity of the fulgurations our departures their swift or gradual diminishing fading and extinction one coruscation arising swiftly or gradually as another vanishes with a continuous overlapping of edges our cosmos will only stay put when we stand still we shall have to consider the full implications of this theory later on meanwhile observe that it gives to space and time and their correlations an importance which they can never hereafter lose of which any future metaphysics will have to take account it may be said that the new realism is literally the first philosophic system in which space and time have been taken seriously this is especially owing to the brilliant work of mr bertrand russell professor whitehead and professor alexander now as on some realist's own showing every spectator carries about with him his own system of fulgurations in his own private perspective since we are not conscious of the same sensa in what sense can we be said to inhabit the same world this is a question not of ontology or of the nature of reality nor of epistemology of the nature of knowing nor yet of psychology but of physics and mathematics we do not perceive the same sensa but we perceive the effects of the same sensibles we inhabit the same world of space and time of matter in motion of geometrical construction and proportion of quantity and number there may be two or two million blues for every two or two million spectators there is only one space and one time one matter one set of energies and motions only one set of laws of motion one set of geometrical axioms and problems one set of each system of coordinates one algebra and one arithmetic in two words one science this uniformity it should be noted only holds good within a given system when we come to examine the metaphysical validity of the statement we shall find that we have to accept it with certain reservations the important thing for realism is that within our cosmic system we have only one physical space and one time and that as all spaces are parts of one space and all parts of space are spaces and all parts of time are times and all correlations of space-time are spatio-temporal it is possible to correlate all private perspectives with what mr bertrand russell calls public space the same will hold good of times and therefore of events end of book one chapter two section one Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Book One, Chapter Two, Section Two of the New Idealism by Mason Clare. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Book One, The Critical Preparations. Chapter Two, The New Realism. Section Two the realist theory of memory now if the subject is the mere spectator of its percepts what happens when we remember imagine and anticipate hitherto even materialists have surrendered memory and imagination to the subjective side denying their external reality on that account hitherto as regards the memory image and the image of imagination is only a memory image torn from its original context and placed in another setting the idealist could always claim that this incontestably subjective thing bears every mark of its objective prototype except scale weight organic behavior and practical utility the horse of my memory is chestnut he has the color the shape and all the points of the real horse he may even be said to have motion over a certain limited field of remembered space but he cannot be weighed he isn't alive and i except in memory cannot ride him a certain vague memory of weight may seem to attach to the image of objects once held or carried but this obviously must be counted as memory of muscular sensations associated with the image rather than a property of the image itself still as far as it goes the memory image presents the same sensory appearances as the perceived thing when i am carrying on a train of thought in words the words are memory echoes but they have the sound of words spoken if i visualize them as printed typed or written 
they will have the look of real print type or writing and the idealist has a right to say if memory images are mental in the sense of existing in consciousness and nowhere else if they present the same qualities of extended color of shape sound and so on as the original perceived objects what grounds have you for denying that those original perceived objects may be mental may exist only in consciousness too the materialist can do nothing but reply that the memory image though not a real outside object in a real outside space world does not owe its existence to consciousness any more than the perceived object does but is a mere sensory revival arising from internal stimulation of the sense organs through the cerebral cortex and the idealist may still retort that he knows all that that we have nothing here but the same psychophysical correspondence he is already familiar with in the mechanism of perception and on his theory the entire system of correspondence falls inside consciousness since his body and the space-time it moves in are already inside this argument from the common qualities of objects perceived and remembered is met by the new realists in a very drastic fashion what earthly reason have you for supposing he says that the memory image is an image at all or that it is mental if the object perceived and the object remembered are both real outside things in a real outside world that would account for the sameness of their qualities it would be possible on a realistic theory to regard memory images as sensa revived by internal stimulation of the cortex having their place not in the great world of public space but in a circumscribed area somewhere inside your head but this is to do less than justice to their wide spatial character their distances and perspectives the image theory therefore involves phantasmal reduplication of space but new realists are scrapping all this clumsy apparatus of the memory image professor laird for one does not hesitate he declares roundly that the object remembered is the same thing as the object perceived quote, recollection seems to be direct acquaintance with the past End quote. to the new realist things are what they seem quote, things perceived and remembered are independent of the mind and directly apprehended by it our grounds for this conclusion were briefly that they seem to be so that the best reason for their seeming so is that they really are so and that all arguments which purport to prove that they are not so are inconclusive End quote. thus quote, according to the usual theory smith's recollections of his ascent of the matterhorn are a series of representative images in his specious present these images are what is in his mind when he relates his adventures at his own fireside and in that case there is no room for direct recollection of the ascent itself smith's memory is not split in two he does not see these images and also the matterhorn there is only one thing before his mind as he tells his modest story and our problem is what that thing is he remembers i think the very thing that he perceived for in both cases he is aware of the matterhorn End quote. this because if he did not if a series of images interposed between him and the object of his recollection he could never be sure that what he was remembering was the matterhorn to remember the matterhorn is to have it immediately before consciousness on the image theory what is immediately before consciousness is an image memory is in fact perception not of the object as it exists now for the object may be changed or dead but as it was perceived we perceive it forever as we perceived it then quote, smith's memory is limited to the past matterhorn just as his perception was limited to the matterhorn at the time he perceived it smith therefore remembers the mountain in the state in which he formerly perceived it memory does not mean the existence of present representatives of past things it is the mind's awareness of past things themselves in every case of remembering then we perceive and it is only by its time element that we distinguish between memory and perception objects that have changed their context we in memory perceive in their original context those that are changing that go on changing their context as in continuous motion we perceive in all their successive contexts each with its own date and objects may exchange contexts 
observe on this theory the importance of the role of time these objects outside as they are in real would be occupying each other's spaces if it were not for time that divides up their spaces and gives to each one its proper place in the past and it is the same with the imagined object professor laird's stuff of fancy the imagined object is essentially stuff a real thing a memory object serving in a context which again is itself made up of memory contexts in which the object need not and commonly has not originally figured i do not know how far professor laird would allow that this shifting of complexes this transplanting and rearranging of memory objects in different space and time contexts is the work of the subject but on any realist theory the subject cannot create it is not even making something up out of ideas in its head it is using old material all the time real outside material images are the mimics of percepts but quote, these mimics of sense which we call images must have the same status as percepts if the latter are objects the former are too if one is a mental event so is the other the image saint sophia is domed and minareted and shapely just as the perceived saint sophia is so that if the perceived saint sophia cannot be mental on the ground say that the mind itself cannot be colored or extended the image saint sophia cannot be mental either for precisely the same reason images have the same states as perceived and remembered things they are apprehended things confronting the mind and not varieties of mental operations they are given to the mind like anything else that it discovers End quote. but they are not identical with perceived things with things remembered probably i think professor laird takes the image to be a memory object torn from its context in memory he regards its elements as having been once perceived quote, and in that case there is nothing to hinder us from supposing that the elements imaged at any time are literally the same elements as those formerly perceived End quote. so that when keats wrote about magic casements opening on the foam of perilous seas and fairylands forlorn he was merely rearranging his old percepts of open casements and foam and seas and his concepts of peril and forlornness in a new and charming juxtaposition with other old percepts picked up god knows where and labelled magic and fairyland and the objects of anticipation ought to be every bit as real and outside as the objects of memory but i gather from professor laird that they are not quite they refer to the future and not to the past and even a new realist cannot say that the future is perceived to be sure so far as an anticipated event is really a present or past event projected into the future it has outside reality it has not the directness of the remembered object expectation is always a present fact representing the future our anticipations represent the future and yet we can never be directly acquainted with the future the future is never observed whereas our memories do not represent the past they present it here i think professor laird is not getting all the advantage he might out of his realism in a sense anticipation is literally a looking forward as memory is a looking back and the stuff of anticipation like the stuff of fancy is taken from present or past outside experience only set in a firmer context and in so far as future events have a way of differing profoundly from past and present ones our anticipations are apt to be wrong the true anticipation is a lucky hit a projectile that coincides with its target rational prediction is another matter inasmuch as it is firmly grounded in the present and the past it is not a hit but an extension of the real outside uniformity of nature it is this grounding in the real that enables us in some sort to share each other's memories and anticipations so that even in remembering and anticipating we inhabit the same world professor alexander's theory leads directly to the same conclusions but in this connection i have preferred to quote professor laird's a study in realism rather than space time and deity because he has given an unusually important place to memory and imagining whereas in the larger work they are more or less subordinate to professor alexander's general view of space time 
there is yet another very vital sense in which we inhabit the same world there will be as many percepts or complexes of percepts as there are sensa or complexes of sensa and there will be as many sensa as there are acts of sensing even when we are dealing with one subject only but to many acts of conceiving by many subjects there will be only one concept or complex of concepts concepts in the realistic universe are not the work of thought they are independent external realities according to mr bertrand russell they subsist out of space and out of time according to professor alexander they are deducible from space-time in either case the mind is passive and not active in conceiving it adds nothing we are merely spectators of our concepts as we are spectators of our percepts with this difference that we are all looking on at the same thing if it were not so there would be no truth only private opinions and so far again the new realism would seem to satisfy the requirements of the world as we know it end of book one chapter two section two recording by expatriate in bangor maine book one chapter two section three of the new idealism by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine book one the critical preparations chapter two the new realism section three the realist theory of relation and knowledge the position of the categories on this scheme is particularly interesting as outside entities independent of consciousness categories are objects among other objects planted out in the universe thus they will be constitutive of the universe in a very definite and real way a way that so far from implying that the universe is the work of thought sets thought altogether on one side as a casual looker-on casual because it is indifferent to the reality of the universe whether it is looked at or not thought is not the builder and the mover it is the discoverer of reality thought moves so far as it can be said to move at all always in the path of discovery it corrects experience by experience finding complexity in the given simple simplifying relations in the given complex it has the power a power that any critical onlooker might have of adjusting old experience to new and though it would seem to have an altogether independent power of selection and rejection its choice is really determined for it by the requirements of the given and external context power is not a word that should be used in this connection thought in the sense of thinking always finds relations and does not make them therefore in no sense can thinking be said to relate like the sensum like the percept each thought category will be a little absolute on its own account hitherto we have been dealing with terms of relations only on the new realist theory every one of these is a hard and fast reality but the relations themselves have a still more peculiar position for each relation is also an independent entity external not only to consciousness but to its own terms that is to say relations are absolute where relations are themselves related they do not lose this character because this relation will be external to its terms too and absolute at least this follows from the theory of external relations it is only fair to add that not every realist is committed to it without reservation mr bertrand russell will not allow that any relation is grounded in the nature of its terms because in the case of the whole and part and subject and predicate relations you would get no real neat distinction between the terms nothing but a common mush of unity if that is to say you have got your relation tucked into your terms already concealed in their nature their entering into that relation will make no difference if it is not tucked in if it does make a difference it is an external relation but dr moore is rather more precise he distinguishes between relations and relational properties and admits that while some relations are external in the sense that it makes no difference to the numerical identity he might just as well have said the substance or existence of the term whether it has a relational property in question or not 
others may be said to be internal in the sense that without some particular relational property the term would not be what it is its nature is not indifferent to the relation i take it that dr moore's subtle distinctions and reservations amount to that thus to the complete individual king edward it is indifferent whether he is the father of george or not and to the father of george whether he is or is not the father of more children but it will not be indifferent to him whether he has or has not certain relational properties characteristics of his personality without which he could not be king edward there is a still more precise sense in which dr moore admits that a relational property as distinct from a relation is grounded in the nature of any term which possesses it Quote, namely that in the case of every such property the term in question has some quality without which it could not have had the property in other words that the relational property entails some quality in the term though no quality in the term entails the relational property End quote. the stickler for external relations might reply that you have no business to consider the general nature of the terms outside the particular relation king edward as he exists say outside his fatherhood if his fatherhood is the question within a given relation the relational property may be something added to the terms of the relation and thus remain outside them as much as the relation itself what is to be said then of logical processes of thought's functions the new realist will not allow that thought relates even in its logical functions it does not relate the judgment in each premise is a statement of reality a case of mere reporting all processes of deduction are the unravelling of implications of the given real all processes of induction are discoveries of given reals or of relations that obtain between reals the relation of a conclusion to its premises is an external relation of external conceptual entities particular or universal to be is not as lotze affirmed to be in relations relation is simply a special example of being as definite and irreducible as its terms thus new realism begins in atomistic ontology and ends in logical atomism it will be seen that on any realistic scheme of the relation between knowing and the thing known the role of consciousness and the subject is considerably reduced consciousness as mere knowing or awareness has no content you must no longer talk about states of consciousness consciousness properly talked about has no states it is a pure featureless transparency let down between subject and object and dividing them if it can be said to divide what was never joined and never could be joined all the color and richness and movement and tumult are on the other side no states of consciousness if consciousness can be said to be itself a state of the subject it is a state without quality or identification mark all the identification marks are on the other side to be sure you can and do distinguish between sensing perceiving remembering imagining reflecting judging reasoning believing and opining but only since consciousness has no content because their objects are different of course we can and do reflect judge reason have beliefs and opinions about one and the same thing or about one and the same thing in different relations but whether in any given instance we reflect judge reason or have an opinion or a belief will depend on the character of the thing and its relations of the whole block before consciousness and above all on the sufficiency or insufficiency of our experience at the time there will of course be differences of value in these several acts both as between different subjects and different states of the same subject at different times thus some people judge better and reason better than other people and better at some times than other times but these differences in value can hardly be said to touch the essence of these affairs or to give consciousness a content and even when you have admitted that there is a distinct difference of type between reflecting judging reasoning believing and opining and between the various forms of judgment and reasoning and that they all have some content since they all consist of propositions still in itself this content is featureless and colorless and if you contend that on the contrary 
propositions have subjects and that these subjects have color and feature still that color and feature are derived from the objects of thinking which are outside thought all the time it is objects making a difference to consciousness not consciousness making a difference to itself once for all whatever it happens to be doing the relation of consciousness to its object is purely to use professor alexander's word a relation of compresence and the essence of the act if it is an act itself is contemplation and it is nothing more and contemplation by itself is very thin only in doubting believing expecting do we seem to catch an authentic gesture of the self an attitude but here our judgment of knowing is in suspension and that suspension is due to the uncertain appearances of the object or the insufficiency of our experience or both and there are willing hoping and fearing desiring and undesiring trusting and distrusting loving and hating there are repugnance and disgust these are all indubitable acts or states of the self but they are not knowings their content their comparative thickness is conferred on them solely by their grip on the world said to be external to consciousness they all have their feeling tone if they are not all pure feelings even willing which is obviously not feeling has its feeling tone and that is a physical affair it belongs palpably to the external world of the body loving at first sight would seem to be a unique affection of the self with a strong objective reference either to the perceived or to the remembered object and for new realists these two are one but even when you have recognized that passion need not be entirely or even mainly sexual there is such a thing as a passion for pure truth yet qua passion it remains very much a matter of physical vibrations and excitements indeed even in its most immaterial manifestations in its purity its devotion its abnegation its transcendence of its own delight its utter selflessness love on any strict realistic theory falls to the world outside consciousness non-conscious reality bags the lot my experience of passion is my calm presence with feeling objects my fulfillment of passion is my calm presence with certain objective events my renunciation of passion is my withdrawal from events of one order in favor of events conceived to be of a higher order on the realist theory both concept and higher event are part of the external and objective world once you have begun drawing the line between consciousness and the objects of consciousness i do not see where you are to stop so that the margin of consciousness and of the self is the narrowest conceivable some realists surrender to it very handsomely the whole world of art and the aesthetic emotions but i do not think that a thoroughgoing consistent realism allows of this concession the aesthetic emotions are not on a more subjective plane than other emotions their plane is of anything less so and strict realism is bound to regard all emotion as objective the finished product of art the poem the picture the statue the opera is eminently objective a real outside thing in a real outside world if anything could make it more objective than other objects it is that character of inevitableness and universality that art has at its highest you can almost think of one art form as more real than another and of the highest art as the most real thing there is you have of course to allow for the work of the artist for his creative will but that is another story we have seen how the new realism deals with creative imagination we have yet to see how the creative will fits into the new realist scheme consciousness then is contentless it neither gives nor receives it is what professor alexander calls a calm presence to quote professor alexander again it contemplates and it enjoys but enjoyment would seem to be only another word for mere awareness it doesn't amount to realization let alone that applied to consciousness realization is a double-edged term very dangerous to realism enough that consciousness has no content it is the only relation that is not immediately an object though it may become one when we think about it in either case it is a pure blank transparency at least this extreme conclusion seems to me to follow from a consistent realism 
again it is only fair to add that it is not allowed even by so devout a realist as professor whitehead Quote, our perception of natural events and natural objects is a perception within nature and is not an awareness contemplating all nature impartially from without natural knowledge is a knowledge from within nature a knowledge here within nature and now within nature and is an awareness of the natural relations of one element in nature namely the percipient event to the rest of nature the conception of knowledge as passive contemplation is too inadequate to meet the facts nature is ever originating its own development and the sense of action is the direct knowledge of the percipient event as having its very being in the formation of its natural relations perception is always at the utmost point of creation End quote. knowledge then goes on inside nature it is one of nature's events among others it is nature apprehending its own events recognizing its own objects quote, objects enter into experience by recognition and without recognition experience would divulge no objects objects convey the permanences recognized in events and are recognized as self-identical amid different circumstances End quote. this is not to be interpreted idealistically the being of the object is not to be recognized is not to be perceived neither recognition nor perception does anything for it or to it the object is simply a given element the permanent element in the flux of events neither must we take recognition in a platonic sense it is not anamnesis it is certainly not the mind's recognition of its own content but the object if it is to count as an object must be recognized known again through all its recurrences for what it is by its recurrences its comparative permanence amid the passing of events it lends itself to recognition rather than to apprehension contemplation will thus be a protracted recognition nature recognizing makes a perpetual return upon herself seen from nature's side consciousness enriches the cosmic process of which it is a part but seen from its own side distinguished from objects and events for all the intimacy and warmth of its includedness it remains a blank transparency and realists have every reason for insisting that it must and can be and is so distinguished do away with the distinction and you do away with realism press realism home and nothing is left to consciousness but its calm presence its detached and limited capacity for looking on end of book one chapter two section three recording by expatriate in bangor maine book one chapter two section four of the new idealism by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine book one the critical preparations chapter two the new realism section four the strength of realism the great merit of realism is that it does distinguish that it respects the integrity of being and puts knowledge in its place that it makes a dangerous and ferocious stand against vagueness and loose thinking that it recalls us to seriousness realists are all for hard clearness they never use a term they have not previously defined they revel in distinctions they have tidied up with a thoroughness unknown before in philosophy thanks to the work of mr bertrand russell and professor whitehead formal logic has become an instrument of almost perfect precision new realism has done what vitalism set out to do it has reconciled philosophy with science by turning the stuff of consciousness out of doors and taking things at their face value as outside reality for the moment it simplifies its problem new realists have apparently steered clear of contradictions and dilemmas at any rate they have avoided as far as possible certain well-known occasions for contradiction and dilemma thus they have made things uncommonly hard for any idealist who attempts to come after them they have set philosophy in a clean place 
and whatever else it does idealism really cannot be allowed to mess it all up again it will have to adopt some at least of the realist distinctions or perish the idealist's only hope is to go further on this happy path and distinguish between distinctions end of book one chapter two section four Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Book One, Chapter Two, Section Five of the New Idealism by May Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Book One, The Critical Preparations. Chapter Two, The New Realism. Section Five objections for after all the new realism has a suicidal subtlety if it is taken literally and you cannot imagine that its intention is to be taken otherwise it ends by disintegrating the world in thought thought that realism will not allow to build up even its own universe has this power to dismember and pull down taken literally realism is committed to the doctrine of external relations and external relations taken literally do not really relate they are cut off from all possibility of relating not only by an endless regress fatal to their reality but by their hard and cruel indifference to their terms at the start they are only contemplated as relating and if realities are contemplated as doing what they do not really do then contrary to the first principles of realism they appear as they are not and we do not know them as they are nor is contradiction altogether avoided if the new realist takes exception to the absolute idealist absolute on the grounds that it is related the idealist can object to the realist relative on the grounds that it is absolute the terms of his relations and his relations themselves are in the hard recalcitrance of their reality so many little absolutes Take, for example, the subject and its predicates. The new realist has a special spite against this innocent relation. You would have thought that if ever there was a clear case of an internal relation securely grounded in the nature of its terms, it was this. But no, the same predicates are related to different subjects and the same subjects to different predicates. And if we were once to admit that all these relations were internal and securely attached to their terms, we should have that unity in difference which is so abhorrent to the realist with his pluralism the pluralistic realist if he is to be consistent cannot really affirm that the rose is red or that it is colored only that it has a red color for if terms have reality apart from their relations then the red of the rose and the red of the pillar box will be the same detached reality and he will be affirming that both the rose and the pillar box are it that they are so far the same thing he can only save himself by greater precision by saying that the rose is damask red and the pillar box scarlet in this case the predicates have turned out to be different after all but his trouble is only postponed till the moment when he comes across two subjects with the same predicate and this will hold good of all the qualities of a thing Note of course they never will have the numerically same real quality but neither will they on the idealist hypothesis End note. to be sure even supposing their red to be the same red the rose and the pillar box will have other predicates that you might think would distinguish them sufficiently the rose has a smell that the pillar box hasn't they have different shapes and the pillar box is a useful public servant in government employ which the rose is not but these differences will not avail them anything for they are all the predicates of other subjects too the pillar box in russell square is not the only public servant in government employ it is not even the only pillar box and my sealing wax has its color and my studio stove its shape and again the differences between my stove and the pillar box are the predicates of other subjects the attachment of predicates to subjects is the only thing in the realist world that would appear not to be absolute but mark what follows if the relation between the thing and its qualities be not grounded in the nature of its terms we cannot in this case break the thing up into its qualities 
we cannot take it as the sum of them or as the relation itself for the relation is outside the thing and the qualities therefore the thing and its qualities fall apart and we have the thing in itself all over again that thing in itself whose existence new realism strenuously denies whatever else relations may do they do not relate the universe is a collection an assemblage of entities hard and recalcitrant as atoms it is not even a collection or an assemblage since that implies a relation that relates these entities are not even just one damned thing after another as their sequence would constitute a relation that relates they are in their ultimate analysis irreducible atoms repugnant to all relations but as the universe certainly presents a semblance of relatedness the new realist is landed in the very last place where he would wish to be in a world of appearances supported or apparently supported by a vast number of things in themselves distinguished only by those positions in space and time which constitute their numerical identity i do not see how on any thoroughgoing theory of external relations he can avoid this catastrophe and when you come to the subject object relation the consequences are tremendous here if anywhere the relation must be strictly external if realism is to stand that is to say if you take the subject and object as your terms and knowing as your relation knowing will not be grounded in the nature of either subject or object subject and object alike will make no difference to knowing though if we take dr moore's reservation into account knowing may make a difference to the terms it may make a difference to the object then as well as to the subject but this is just what cannot happen on a realist hypothesis so that dr moore's reservation which rested on the distinction between relations and relational properties cannot in this case apply subject object and the relation of knowing will be three hard distinct mutually repellent entities and it is hard to see how on the new realist theory they ever could have contrived to come together nor are you a bit better off if you take the form of this relation to be the subject's knowing of the object or reduced to the simplest possible terms contemplation of object when whatever mysterious relation of may be it is equally indifferent to contemplation or to object on the other hand once recognize that terms are sympathetic to their relations once admit that it does make a difference to the object to be known and to the subject to know and you have let in the thin end of the idealist wedge if knowing is not grounded in the nature of the object it will at least be grounded in a relational property of the object and this can only mean that there is something in the object by reason of which it is known it has a side by which knowing takes it but this relational property so far from being the only property of the object which is known is precisely that property which is not known since it is impossible to mark down the property in question and say it is this rather than that and supposing all the properties of the object to be known except this one property which makes it known each of those properties will have its own relational property which makes it known so that we cannot think of this particular relational property as being one property of the object among others but as something pertaining to or inherent in the object as a whole and in each one of its properties and that is as good as saying we cannot think of it as a property at all but as a relation grounded in the nature of its terms which brings us straight to the idealist position that the nature of known things is to be known in other words that being known makes a difference to things or you may knock out the term nature as introducing an unnecessary complication and say simply the relation is grounded in the object and the being of objects is to be known but modify the position in the interests of realism and say things are and are such that they are known draw a hard and fast line between the are and the are such and you are landed again with an unknown thing in itself carry on the process with each of the are suchnesses and distinguish between their being and their suchness and you are only multiplying things in themselves within things you can only avoid the conclusion by regarding consciousness as an empty transparency and you are then faced with a difficulty if consciousness is an empty transparency that makes no difference to its objects 
its objects presumably must make a difference to it but it is hard to see how anything can make a difference to an empty transparency either objects are the content of consciousness or they are not if they are they cannot be said to be either outside or independent of consciousness if they are not consciousness remains an empty meaningless transparency meaningless because if it had meaning its meaning must profoundly modify its objects and if you contend that objects themselves have meaning you must either distinguish between the meaning and the objects or not distinguish if you do not distinguish you have no business to talk about meaning at all if meaning is to have any meaning it must be distinguishable if you then say distinguishing that objects have meaning for consciousness which they have not apart from it you are again admitting that consciousness makes a difference to objects consciousness will invade them at all points of meaning if you simply say that consciousness adds its own meaning to the object you are again carrying consciousness over into the objective world but the crucial discrepancies are those which involve space and time even mr bertrand russell admits a difficulty here Quote, it is said not wholly without plausibility that these different shapes and different colors cannot coexist simultaneously in the same place and cannot therefore both be constituents of the physical world this argument i must confess appeared to me until recently to be irrefutable End quote. he gets over it by referring the discrepant appearances to different spaces not that they have a permanent and independent existence there quote, sense data probably never persist unchanged after ceasing to be sense data End quote. that is to say after ceasing to be perceived their dependence however is not on the mind the subjectivity they suggest is physiological subjectivity that is causal dependence on the sense organs nerves or brain but physiological subjectivity though compatible with pious realism is no better than any other combined with the theory of real private spaces it has difficulties of its own for example you and i are sitting in two opposite chairs naively one would suppose that the part of space from which you see me is the part of space at which i see you on mr russell's theory they belong to different and private spaces which are not mental what really happens when we exchange chairs naively one would suppose that our bodies on which the appearances in each private space depend have transferred themselves to each other's private spaces which is absurd clearly each body has changed its place within its own private space but the chairs have not changed places clearly then we do not see the same chairs the chair that you are now sitting on is not the same chair i was sitting on a moment ago there will be as many chairs and as many rooms as there are inhabitants of a room now the idealist is equally committed to this multitude of chairs and rooms though not of physiological chairs and rooms he is therefore not entitled to complain of the multiplicity but he is entitled to ask if the chairs are private because physiological how about the private spaces space cannot be physiological yet if space is private it must be subjective in another sense it must be somehow personal therefore it cannot be physical and if it isn't physiological it must be mental the idealist can object with reason to the physiological relation it is a subversion of the real relation of dependence for private space is part of one all-embracing perspective space the place my body occupies at any given time is part of my private space how then can the change in my body account for the existence of the whole spatial show of my private world on which its existence is dependent it is one complex of my sense data how can it account for the whole system of my sense data which contains it my body occupies space which however private is still a part of perspective space in a relation such that if there were no perspective space there would be no private space how can it account for sense data conditioned by the space it presupposes it is itself such a sense datum further its changes presuppose and depend on the whole system of physics which in its turn presupposes and is determined by the whole system of the one all-embracing space and the one all-embracing time in the sense that all objects of physics are objects in space and time 
Mr. Russell says that if my body were not there, the whole show perceived in my private space would not be there. Whereas clearly, if my private space were not there, my body would not be there either. The idealist avoids this awkwardness by packing my body and my private space into my mind and referring all the causality there is in the affair to an ultimate consciousness which contains all space and all time. If, on the contrary, you say that meaning distinguished and yet inseparable from the objects that have it is part of the outside pattern of the universe, then, once more, consciousness is a meaningless transparency, with all the awkwardnesses that attach to a meaningless transparency. I shall not insist on the difficulty of discriminating between subjective and objective sensory affections, for the simple reason that new realism does not admit the distinction. Since the new realist regards sound and color, heat and cold, pain and fatigue, as outside objects, equally independent of sensation, it is useless to call his attention to their habit of merging into each other, as if this made any difference to their status. I will only point out that new realism leaves no room on the hairline margin of consciousness for any subjective affections at all, as long as you profess to distinguish between affection and consciousness of affection. The whole world of the self, beyond its blank onlooking, has been hauled over to the outside. It should not be forgotten that the main charge brought by realism against idealism is that in its subjective form it annihilates the cosmos known to have existed before consciousness, while its absolute form is equally fatal to the appearances of that cosmos, its sounds, colors, smells, and densities, appearances which realism affirms to be realities. But on the realist theory, appearances are equally bound to disappear, not because of the absence of sensation, but because of the absence of sense organs. The fulgurating sensa are the result of change in the cerebral cortex set up by the contact of matter in motion with the appropriate sense organs which pass on their shock. No sense organs, no fulgurations, no heat of sun, no cold of glaciers, no thunder of surf on Paleozoic beaches, no green of grass and leaves in Paleozoic forests, no wet, no dry, no light, no darkness, no distinction between sea and land or night and day. The sensibles simply go trying to pass on their shocks without anybody there to be shocked. Of course, if it was so, it was so. It can't be helped and if we don't like it we must stand it. But the new realist should be the last to raise a cry against the idealist on behalf of the solar system and Paleozoic Earth. There is only one hope for them, and that is the idealist's assumption of an enduring supercosmic spirit in whose consciousness they have still endured. For consider the nature of the transaction. We are to suppose that neural change in my private and personal body is the spark that fires the fulguration of the sensa, that makes the cosmos with its system of sensibles burst forth in color, and sound, and touch, and taste, and smell. The visible, audible, palpable, and smellable properties of the world are thus the offspring of changes in my body, which is itself the offspring of that world. That is to say, we have changes in the subsequently existing part, an organism narrowly limited in space and time giving rise to extended aspects of the previously existing whole. Inconceivable when we consider that the neural motions involved are themselves continuations of the motions of the larger world. Inconceivable if we assume the absolute outside reality of the body and its world, and whether contemplation occur inside or outside nature. Inconceivable reality's final leap from the unconscious to consciousness not inconceivable if the whole system of events occurs through and in a consciousness presumed to be adequate to the display the hypothesis may not be capable of downright a posteriori proof but at any rate physiological subjectivism raises more problems than idealism leaves unsolved and to be serious with the new realist theory of memory and imagination is to be landed in difficulties even less remote for consider once more professor laird's mr smith and his matterhorn the matterhorn is an absolute outside independent reality 
in an absolute outside independent space and time independent in the sense that they have nothing to do with either an absolute consciousness or with smith and his consciousness except in so far as smith contemplates the matterhorn and his ascent of it consider that though smith may not remember every detail of the matterhorn and his ascent yet as much as he does remember is literally so much of the matterhorn and of his ascent in memory smith is contemplating the matterhorn itself as it existed when he climbed it he is then contemplating an existence which has a real definite unalterable position in space and time an existence immensely far removed from smith in his present moment and the smoke-room at surbiton where he does his remembering but we are asked to believe that smith sees the real matterhorn the matterhorn itself in a space somewhere between his armchair and the smoke-room door where in fact smith's bureau is standing ten to one that is where smith seated in his armchair will locate his matterhorn he may perhaps remembering his geography give his mind's eye a southeastward turn but that only brings the matterhorn across the top pane of smith's bow window at the farthest stretch smith will see it hovering about outside on his lawn above the pampas grass useless to say that time divides these spaces time only makes the queer business queerer besides the marvel of this immensely distant real mountain disporting itself within a few feet of smith's armchair you have its past telescoping into smith's present impossible to believe that the matterhorn smith remembers is the matterhorn itself when it is behaving so unlike itself and smith can play tricks with the matterhorn of his memory that he could never play with the matterhorn of his perception he can tear it from its base in switzerland and plump it down in venice in the middle of the grand canal he can plant saint sophia on the top of it that he can only do these things with the visible matterhorn does not since he is dealing with the matterhorn itself make his performance essentially less remarkable and though you may say that it is smith's imagination and not his memory that is now at work it is smith's memory that provides his imagination with its material which is again the matterhorn itself there is i believe a way in which smith can do all these things a way in which he can both remember and imagine the matterhorn itself without the intervention of a single image but it is not the way of realism which supposes the matterhorn to exist in absolute space and time outside and independent not only of smith's contemplating mind but of all the consciousness in the universe end of book one chapter two recording by expatriate in bangor maine book one chapter three section one part one of the new idealism by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine book one the critical preparations chapter three some realist theories of perception section one professor broad and the real counterpart part one when realists like professor laird say they believe that realism is true because it looks as if it were it isn't very easy to refute them you can only invite them to prove that realism is what it looks when they add that all the bad arguments are on the other side that is a definite challenge which the idealist should not be afraid to accept some realists like mr edwin holt make statements as against idealists which no idealist would think of disputing as for example that dreams and hallucinations in their own context have a reality of their own as cogent as any other and the realist who asserts that dreams and hallucinations and memories and concepts and secondary qualities and primary qualities are all equally real is difficult to refute he is a dogmatist disguised as an empiricist nearly all of the american symposium of six with the exception of professor w p montague are camouflaged dogmatists and difficult to refute and if any realist has the wild consistency to maintain that every single object of consciousness exists independently of consciousness he will be harder to refute than any of them with such added extravagance the realist position becomes more inaccessible to direct attack you can only challenge him to produce his proofs 
Therefore, it is refreshing to find a realist like Professor Broad, who has some caution and an inkling of the hardships and dangers of his position. If his theory proves, after all, to be vulnerable, this is partly because it is so highly correlated, has so many approaches and attachments, and partly because, out of sheer honesty, he concedes so many points to his opponent. Unlike some of his fellow realists, he is very far from regarding realism as self-evident, or even as the handiest theory there is. He is intensely aware of its difficulties, and with a sincerity no less brilliant than his amazing perspicacity, he does not hesitate to state them. His argument is one long experiment in arguments, and he seems to be always engaged either in setting up some revised form of a theory he has just knocked down, knocking down some provisional theory he has just set up, or reinstating it with suitable modifications. Owing to the swiftness and dexterity of his movements, it isn't always easy for anybody less nimble-witted to keep up with him. He seems to be perpetually doubling and turning on his own argument. But in the end, it is clear that he is only pushing it back and back to the apparently impregnable position where it makes its final stand. This sounds as if Professor Broad were the enemy of his own argument. It only means that his is a strategic retreat that brings him by the safest way to his impregnable position. Still, for reasons which I shall try to make clear, I think this final position is not really so impregnable as it looks. I have no doubt that they are obvious reasons which will occur to every careful reader of Professor Broad's book, but they are so vital to my own argument that I cannot afford to leave them out just because somebody has probably thought of them before, and, no less probably, expressed them better. We shall presently see that it is on the character of tactual perception that he makes his stand. It would be taking a most unfair advantage of his various very handsome admissions to say that the entire system of realism stands or falls by it, but it is clear that he regards the sense of touch as of the first importance in the realistic theory of perception, and it is by its theory of perception that realism stands or falls. He criticizes in turn the non-causal arguments for naive realism the arguments for phenomenalism, for the instrumental, the causal, and the scientific theories of perception. He finds that there is much to be said for naive realism. None of these arguments which are so confidently repeated by philosophers really give conclusive reasons for dropping even the crudest kind of realism. He, however, develops other reasons for dropping it with which no idealist would quarrel. He rejects phenomenalism on the ground that its conclusions defeat its own premises, and ends by adopting the instrumental theory of perception for one set of perceptions, namely touch, while rejecting it for others on the grounds that a. it multiplies reals, b. it conflicts with the causal and scientific theories. There remain the causal and scientific theories, to both of which with certain reservations Professor Broad inclines. He starts the long series of arguments with assuming the distinction between a perception and its object which idealists so frequently ignore, while he admits that not all arguments for idealism rest on this confusion. And he defines the object of perception comprehensively and non-controversially as anything that may be perceived regardless of the question whether it can exist if it be not perceived. So far, so good. With Dr. Moore, he insists on the truism that when you perceive, you perceive something, and that what you perceive cannot be the same as the perception of it. Now, cannot is a highly controversial word. If we are simply taking perception in its innocency as the primary block of consciousness before super-awareness, judgment and reflection have got to work on it, cannot is the whole subject in dispute. It is what the realist has got to prove. And we shall find that even on Professor Broad's own showing, need not is the most that can be asserted as probable. If, on the other hand, by perception we are to understand not what I have called the primary block of consciousness, but that secondary and supervening state in which we perceive that we are perceiving, then every idealist would admit that perception in this sense and the content of primary perception are not the same thing. And as far as he is concerned, the question falls. But even if realists would consent to recognize the distinction as vital to the problem at all, they would not allow that it is perception in this sense which is under discussion. 
and I submit that they have yet to prove that perception in their sense, and what they call the object of perception, and I should call the content of the primary block of consciousness, cannot be the same thing, in the sense that the object or the content can exist when it is not perceived. We must not assume all these exciting matters at the start. But let that pass. We shall see that Professor Broad is not extravagant, and that in the long run he offers us not proof, which in the nature of the case cannot be, but a high degree of probability. To begin with, he examines the various objections to naive realism under the heads of synthetic incompatibility in the evidence of the senses, either of one person or of different persons, relativity to the organs of perception and to states and positions of the organism, the arguments from dreams and hallucinations and from the confusion of sense perceptions with feelings. He contends that the celebrated tests which his opponents apply to naive realism either do not apply or prove nothing against it when they do. There are, as we all know, the temperature test and the color test. You put one hand in hot water and one in cold, and afterwards both in lukewarm water, which will then feel hot to the cooled hand and cold to the heated one. The color test supposes that, say, a red and a blue surface are in contact and that at the points of contact, red and blue will coexist in the sense that they will both occupy the same points. Professor Broad dismisses the temperature test on the grounds that a. it does not disprove the existence of some temperature, and b. that the two temperatures need not be thought of as occupying the same points. The color test goes too, because either contact does not really exist, in which case the colors will remain distinct, or, if it exists, the colors will modify each other and there will still be some color, just as there was some temperature. Now the trouble with these tests is that we really cannot be sure in the case of the water that the two temperatures are not coexisting at the same points when the two hands display so considerable a volume of water, and in the case of the colored surfaces that different colored bodies are not occupying the same space contrary to all that we know of the behavior of bodies. And in any case, the two tests do not run on all fours. A test more analogous to the water experiment would be that of the modification of one color by another that the eyes have been looking at a long time. A real independent body cannot be one color one instant and another the next in the absence of any change in the actual pigments, owing to light or chemical action or any other external cause. As for the common sense view that it is no matter that different colors should coexist at the same point of space, so long as they are the colors of different bodies, it is obvious that it makes a bad business worse. This is also the view of naive realism, which will swallow any trifling difficulty of this sort, rather than admit that colors and temperatures may not be real. Needless to say, Professor Broad does not adopt it even in the interests of naive realism. In dealing with synthetic incompatibility of the deliverances of two senses in one person, that is to say of sight and touch, he dismisses provisionally the typical test of the painted cube in perspective on the grounds that as far as perception goes, the object visually perceived and the object tactually perceived are numerically different. Between two different objects there can be no synthetic incompatibility. The problem is, however, complicated by the spatial relations of these objects. Professor Broad is, quote, not at all confident that the extension and figure and relations analyzed from objects of tactual extension can at once be identified with those that are analyzed from visually perceived objects. What seems to be more true is that in visual extension we can analyze out elements and relations which form a spatial order of the same type as that which we find on reflection to be constituted by the relations and elements that we can analyze out of the objects of visual perception. We do not perceive an elaborate spatial order, but when we come to analyze and reflect upon what we perceive by sight and by touch, we are led to construct spatial orders of the same type. There are not two similar orders left standing side by side, but one which is supposed to include both. It must be noted that when I talk of constructing a spatial order, I do not hold, as so many people seem to do, that this implies that the order so reached cannot be that of the real world. End quote. 
On the contrary, we shall find that it is just from our ability to construct this common spatial order that realism argues to the reality of the real world. And we shall have to inquire how far and in what sense its argument is sound. At the same time, Professor Broad admits that, quote, the evidence of two senses does not add the least certainty to the existence and qualities of an object, so long as that object continues to be perceived. For this certainty, as we have already seen, is the highest we can have, therefore no evidence can hope to increase it. End quote. So that we cannot use the evidence of two or more senses by itself to prove the reality of an object. The evidence of two senses is no more support to naive realism than the evidence of one. So far, we have only been considering the senses of one stationary subject. When it comes to several subjects and several positions of one subject, more serious complications arise. So serious that in the face of them, we shall see that naive realism can no longer be supported. The whole ground of the problem at its present stage would seem to be covered by one dilemma. Quote, Either what A and B perceive is the same or different. If it be the same, there is no problem. If different, then, since the qualities of their perceptions are the qualities of different objects, what matters it if they are incompatible? Why should not both objects exist quite comfortably unperceived, either by A or B? End quote. So that so far, naive realism would seem to have scored. But the problem here is not quite so simple, for it involves the complicated geometrical properties of the objects. A by himself will only see a circle in the flat as circular from one position only. B, or A himself, occupying another position, will see it as some sort of ellipse. Touch will not help them here if the circle is in the flat. But if you have a sphere, the case is worse, for touch will testify to one sphere which cannot be seen, while sight will testify to as many ellipsoids as there are spectators and possible positions of spectators, and none of these ellipsoids will be tangible. Faced with the ellipsoids, Professor Broad throws up the case for naive realism, not on account of synthetic incompatibility, but of the terrible complications involved. Incompatibility there will be none, as long as the objects are held to be different but there will be more real ellipsoids than even realism can stand, so that, quote, one is almost forced to the theory of a common cause of the perceptions of each person and to the degradation of most, if not all of these perceptions, to the level of appearances, End quote. The question as to the communicability of sense perceptions also leaves the issue doubtful for naive realism. We can never be sure that when two people are talking about colors, they mean the same thing. Still less that when they are looking at colors, they are looking at the same thing. In fact, it is sometimes quite evident that they mean and are looking at different colors, rather more evident than appears in Professor Broad's statement of the case. When my partially colorblind friend and I have a poppy field on our right and a vivid patch of heather on our left, and he assures me that the color of poppies is the color of very pale daffodils, and the color of heather the color of delphiniums, I am pretty certain that what he cannot see is red, and that he cannot see it either by itself or in combination. And though I cannot be quite so certain that he really sees daffodils as yellow, I conclude that he does see some blue, since in the combination purple, blue is what is left when you have abstracted the red. But I shall never know whether he and I see precisely the same blue and I can see very delicate rose and blue and green and amethyst and orange in a sheet of ice where another friend, not colorblind, can only see a watery gray. But this is a different case. I can imagine that if my friend had trained her sense of sight, she would have seen those delicate colors too. But again, I should never know whether she and I would ever see the same colors. On the other hand, I should never know it if we didn't so that I think the argument from mere incommunicability alone proves nothing either way, while in certain cases where communicability is established, in the sense that I know what colors other people don't see, the discrepancy involved is disastrous to naive realism. The problem of dreams and hallucinations need not detain us here, as it cuts both ways for idealism and realism and idealists would agree that the distinction between illusory objects and real ones lies in their context and not their character. 
dreams are true while they last and i shall not consider the argument from perceptions that merge into feelings since i am not pressing it here hitherto we have proceeded on the assumption that causality has been left out of the reckoning but by now it is very clear that the deliverances of the senses involve relativity to an organ which brings us straight to the instrumental and the causal theories of perception it is also clear that the distinction between appearance and the real arises at this stage and this brings us to the theory of phenomenalism which must be disposed of first professor broad disposes of it very neatly phenomenalism maintains that nothing exists except perceptions strings and assemblages of perceptions to which no objects or relations of objects correspond as perceptions have no real permanent cause there would be no causal laws only laws of the mysterious sequence and association of perceptions professor broad points out that phenomenalism has thus no right to call its perceptions appearances since it admits nothing to which they appear and no reality to distinguish them from or of which they can be said to be the appearances all the same i confess i cannot see what else it could call them anyhow it is clear that what phenomenalism means is that perceptions have no reality in the realist sense phenomenalism bases its argument on the relativity of perceptions to sense organs professor broad says that it has no right to this base because it would deny that sense organs have a permanent structure but phenomenalism never said anything about relativity to permanent structures all that relativity means to it is relativity to certain impermanent structures which are also mere appearances Professor Broad says that the phenomenalist has no right to talk about seeing things, as his eye will itself be relative to other people's sense organs, and cannot exist when nobody is looking at it. But surely even a phenomenalist may be allowed to make inferences like other people, provided they do not land him inconsistently in the realism he denies. If he says that the seeing of red is relative to the structure of his eye, he is entitled to infer the presence of his eyes whenever he sees red whether anybody sees his eyes or not if you ask him how he then knows that his seeing is relative to his eyes he can say that it appears to be so that he infers the relation from the association of his appearing eyes with his apparent seeing for though his eyes can never appear to his own eyesight they can and do appear to his general sense and his sense of muscular movement he can at least open and shut his eyes and he can make inferences like other people from what happens then that is to say there is always enough association between his eyes and his seeing to warrant his inferring relativity even if no eye has ever presented to him the appearances it presents to the anatomist with his scalpel and microscope who associates seeing with delicate internal structures invisible to the naked sight but it must be admitted that when it comes to objects beyond the reach of microscopes and eyes to the unperceived and imperceptible particles of matter in motion which are to science the real causes of perception the phenomenalist is in a very awkward case he is logically bound to deny the existence of these objects and their relations and with them the existence of the imperceptible matter in motion of the sense organ thus the relativity of perceptions to a sense organ permanent or impermanent goes by the board the idealist who is not a phenomenalist will not quarrel with this statement of the position but i think he will hardly admit the superior happiness of the realist case that boldly assumes real causes of our perceptions rather like their objects end of book one chapter three section one part one Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Book One, Chapter Three, Section One, Part Two of the New Idealism by Mason Clare. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Book One, The Critical Preparations, Chapter Three: Some Realist Theories of Perception section one professor broad and the real counterpart part two professor broad approaches his problem of phenomenalism with two questions bristling with controversy Quote, a 
why should it be held to be a priori more probable that that which is real is perceptions than that it is something like the objects of our perceptions b whether laws entirely in terms of perception will explain the facts better than laws in terms of realities whose general nature is like that of the objects of our perception the answer to the first question is that it is a priori more probable that perception is its own reality because no other reality is directly given in perception this is not denying that a posteriori it may be less probable to the second it may be said in the first place that it is not the idealist who distinguishes between primary perception and the object of primary perception while he does distinguish or rather he should distinguish between primary and secondary perception so that to him laws in terms of primary perception will be the same as laws in terms of objects of perception and laws in terms of secondary perception will be different his is the advantage of not having to decide the question bristling again of likeness or unlikeness in the second place assuming the real to be something distinct from the perception of it the question arises whether it is something that depends on a relation to the organ of perception for example the sensum blue or something existing unperceived apart from it for example light waves or matter in motion which provides the stimulus which gives rise to the sensum blue clearly in both cases the sensum is the object of perception since the other factors are unperceived and clearly there is no resemblance between the sensum blue and the width of a light wave or the movements of matter in motion even more clearly in the former case there is no resemblance between the sensum and that relation to a sense organ on which it depends and the same will hold good of all sensa therefore the sense elements in perception are as unlike the real as they would be unlike the bare act of perceiving supposing primary perception can be distinguished from its content and i think it is not easy to show that it can but the concrete object is never a pure sensum or complex of sensa it has spatial and geometrical qualities and relations which again are not in the least like light waves or matter in motion it has also categorial and relational characters which as they will owe nothing to anything that happens to sense organs might perhaps fairly be real but why like the real unless you are taking the object twice over it will be seen that in the case of tactual perception and unless i mistake him in all other cases involving spatial relations professor broad does take the object twice over once as object of perception and once as causal counterpart and why take it twice over when by the very assumption it and not some appearance of it is what is perceived finally he concludes that the laws quote, of the real causes of our perceptions are most probably those which science finds it necessary to assume in order to account for what is perceived now those laws are not in the least like those which perceptions obey among themselves although they are of course connected with the latter they are in fact laws about the kind of changes that we can perceive in the object of a single continuous perception and the only common characteristic of the objects of our perceptions and the perceptions themselves is that both have temporal relations and can enter into causal laws End quote. and he fairly challenges idealism quote, hence until anyone can make up a theory in terms of laws like those which hold between perceptions which will explain our perceptions better than the theory of science we shall be justified in holding that if there be a real world at all it probably resembles the objects of our perceptions End quote. observe in passing that the one thing science does not account for the one thing that fairly howls to be accounted for on any realistic theory is our perceptions is perception itself science may or may not account for the alleged real and independent existence of the object of perception i think it only accounts for their behavior after they have come into existence leaving perception to account for itself as best it may the challenge then for the idealist is to frame his theory so that its terms will be at once a better description and a better explanation of the facts 
of this later meanwhile professor broad examines the causal theory of perception to avoid misunderstanding let me say at once that i for one do not agree with those people who hold that relativity to an organ is fatal to the reality of sense qualities relativity in itself can only be fatal to the assumption of absolute unconditioned independent reality it is discrepancy in the evidence of the sense organs that is disastrous unless you are content to multiply reals personally if i were a realist i would ten times rather put up with the multiplication than assume a real counterpart characterized as like the multiplied appearances it is hard to see how a real sphere can be like those multiplied ellipsoids though all the multiplied ellipsoids may very well be quite real though relative aspects of the sphere to return to professor broad quote, the fact that what i perceive has a certain relation to an organ of perception cannot possibly be by itself any reason for supposing that it does not exist when it is not perceived for the relation to the organ whatever it may be is not the relation of being perceived since that is a relation to the mind and not to the body idealists will agree to this with positive enthusiasm glad that the mind should have a look in at last quote, to prove the phenomenalist conclusion we need a premise to the effect that the relation r to the organ of sense whatever it may be implies also the relation of being perceived End quote. we are reminded that besides phenomenalism there are two alternatives quote, one that the object continues to exist in the same relation to our organs even when we cease to perceive it or two whilst it cannot be perceived when it ceases to stand in this relation to an organ yet it does not cease to exist when it ceases to stand in this relation End quote. we shall find that the latter alternative sufficient for some realists is not sufficient for professor broad existence uniquely in relation to an organ or organs entailing as it does a monstrous multiplication of reals is no satisfying substitute for the real counterpart to the object of perception his provisional conclusion is that quote, the relativity argument has proved powerless by itself to show that the objects of our perceptions are appearances rather than that the structure of our organs is a necessary condition of our perceiving certain special qualities and characteristics of reality End quote to which it may be objected that even if the relation of the object to an organ is the condition of our perceiving certain qualities and characteristics we have no reason for assuming that these are necessarily the qualities and characteristics of reality since reality is taken to be that which exists unperceived and at certain stages of his argument professor broad appears to admit that the objection holds we have to distinguish between two interpretations of the facts Quote, the instrumental one which holds that our organs and their detailed structure are instruments by which the mind perceives real things and their real qualities and characteristics and the causal one which holds that our organs and their internal structure are conditions of the perception by the mind of objects and distinctions in them both of which for aught we can tell are mere appearances End quote professor broad goes on to test the instrumental view by analogy with a mechanical instrument a typewriter you start with a typist a a typewriter b a blank sheet of paper c and an effect d the example proves fatal to the analogy with our sense instruments because in typing the mind of the typist a produces an effect d on matter c the paper by means of the instrument b whereas in perception the real object c produces the effect d on the mind a by means of the instrument b in the one sequence we begin with mind in the other we end with it the instrumental theory breaks down when we have to distinguish between appearances and realities it is as if the instrumental view had waked professor broad with a shock to the fact that after all there are such things as appearances there is the instrument of the insect's eye so different in structure from our own that it is impossible to believe that objects appear the same to it as they appear to our eyes 
unless we assume that all these differences are appearances caused by one real object we have the trouble that we had in the case of the ellipsoids all over again too many realities for realism to put up with but with one exception the instruments that cause us to perceive all these objects so differently afford no criterion for distinguishing between appearance and reality thus we are driven to the causal theory which however gives us no assurance of the real according to the causal theory i must again quote professor broad's own words for the ground here is dangerous and i do not want to attribute to him recognitions and admissions which are not his according to the causal theory quote, something x acts on the organ the organ and the mind together produce a perception as a whole that is something from which indeed an object can be analyzed out though there is no reason to think that it can exist out of that whole called a perception such an object is an appearance in our sense of the word End quote. as against the instrumental theory which assumed that the sense organs give true knowledge about reality the causal theory is not very encouraging to thoroughgoing realism let us look at it a little closer to a certain extent common sense takes the causal view their combined assumptions amount to this to quote professor broad again a certain objects of perception have events in them which are causes of those objections being perceived and b all objects that are real and are perceived have the perception of themselves caused by events in them End quote. how can we prove that either of these propositions is true the analysis shows that it cannot be done by direct observation we can only start with the object of perception at the moment of perception and there is no way of observing the causal event which on the hypothesis must either have preceded the perception or if simultaneous with it is not to be distinguished in the result let us assume then as science assumes hypothetical events in hypothetical objects and hypothetical parts of the alleged object but these are imperceptible moreover science has already given up the reality of secondary qualities and on this footing will deal only with primary these or rather some of these in certain geometrical relations are all that it allows perception to tell us of the real and all the time the real causal real remains unperceived in other words the scientific theory takes what it wants of the instrumental and causal views and comes to the conclusion that some not all primary qualities are real and that all secondary ones are mere appearances because not discernible in the external cause anyhow we are left with a lot of these appearances on our hands Quote, the crux of the whole question then really is whether we can keep the instrumental view for the perception of primaries if so we can keep the scientific theory as in essence true about a large part of reality End quote. the trouble is that science gives up so many primaries it quote, is perfectly convinced that most of the shapes and sizes that we perceive are not real but are appearances more or less like the reality End quote. why like and how can science tell whether like and we may ask whether primary qualities are not in the same case with secondary qualities in being indiscernible in the real cause how do i know that an object said to be a sphere really is a sphere when all that i perceive of it is ellipsoidal i can go round and round it and correlate my ellipsoids so that together they form a sphere but never at any one moment do i perceive the sphere never the sphere and the time and the ellipsoids altogether i can only construct the sphere intellectually so that either i judge its real which is just as much as its ideal character to be spherical or i can judge all its relative appearances to be real but as far as perception goes i appear to be dealing all the time with appearances am i now before professor broad arrived at the causal theory he decided that the testimony of two senses adds nothing to the reality of an object when its reality has already been testified to by one a thing cannot be more real than real he now inquires whether the instrumental view which asserts the reality of all objects perceived through the medium of sense organs adds anything to what was said before 
whether that is to say it brings in considerations which makes the assumption of their reality more plausible now the only additional consideration it brings if we admit the possibility is that of a direct relation through the instrumentality of our sense organs between our minds and events occurring in objects when our sense organs assure us that an object is presenting itself both as a circle and as an ellipse they are introducing us to appearances and not to realities Quote, if we decide then a that most of the visually perceived objects are to be counted as appearances so as to prevent the infinite multiplication of reals b that all the visual objects and also the tactual objects are connected with a single reality and c that under suitable circumstances this common reality can be an object of both sight and touch we shall have to conclude that the reality is circular and not elliptical End quote. that is to say on the grounds that the instrumental view has made a difference to the question he now decides that after all two senses are better than one for determining reality this after counting most of the visually perceived objects as appearances for an excellent reason it is hard to see how one sense can be said to support the evidence of another when that other is found to be untrustworthy it is also hard to see how the introduction of an instrument which on the theory's own showing only serves to complicate matters should make more plausible what was not plausible without it now does the fact that we can and do correlate the appearance with the reality the unreal ellipse with the real circle make most for the unreality of the circle or the reality of the ellipse it seems to me that once you have admitted the possibility of unreality either in your secondary qualities or your primary ones the game of realism is up the correlation corrupts the primary qualities said to be real more than it rehabilitates the incurably unreal ones science in making use of the instrumental theory is forced to the conclusion that we never see solid bodies as they really are and professor broad asks can we give any reasonable account of what we mean by the instrument being wrongly adjusted or out of order and will not the account of this be so general that it will replace the old instrumental theory altogether End quote. the appearance and the reality have this in common that in the case of the circle and the ellipse they are both shapes what is more the ellipse as professor broad points out is very like a circle you can go further and say that it has such geometrical relations to the circle that it would be the height of rashness to deny that they belong to the same world to the same world then of objects perceived or of objects that exist in the absence of perception professor broad states the argument for idealism with exceeding fairness on page two hundred and forty one on page two hundred and forty two he is less admirable he says that the present position is analyzable into quote, states of brain caused by states of organs caused by states of something else the states of brain however caused produce the same perception whose object is of course an appearance but in some cases the object perceived resembles a reality states in which are a remote cause of those in the organ End quote professor broad admits that while there is a correspondence in our sense organs with the general qualities of objects perceived by means of them we cannot trace any such correspondence with the particular characteristics of those organs but he concludes that the particular correspondence must exist because the general correspondence can be traced but correspondence or no correspondence realism cannot well be content with a theory that obliges it to regard so many qualities of objects as mere appearances while at the same time it maintains that some of these appearances where primary are a guide to the qualities of their remote objects so far realism is arguing from an admitted appearance to a reality assuming that resemblance holds whereas the most that science can assert is that the remote cause of perceptions is common to the perceptions of different perceivers not that it is like the objects of their perception and here with the possible failure of the scientific theory before his eyes professor broad once more challenges idealism Quote, any alternative hypothesis about the real 
will have to rest its probability entirely on its ability to explain the perceived. End quote. It is confidently expected that idealism will not be able to bear the strain. To this it may be said that the scientific theory so far has not explained the perceived in its relation to perception. But let that pass for the moment. Does the probability of the alternative theory rest entirely on its ability to explain, that is to say, on its ability to explain entirely? Supposing the alternative isn't quite so drastic. Supposing science explains up to a certain point, up to the point of psychophysical correspondence, and confesses its inability to bridge not only the gap between the loose end of the physical chain and the psychic fact of perception, but the gap between the real and the merely appearing qualities of the object. Isn't it enough if the idealist theory, while leaving the links of the physical chain intact in their order, does away with all the gaps by denying the distinction between the real and the appearing, and by linking up the chain with consciousness at each loose end? It must, of course, be a probable linking up, a linking up that does no violence to the alleged real. But hasn't the idealist just as much right to argue from the fact of consciousness at the near end to the probability of consciousness at the far end, and to say that the real there is like the real here, as the realist has to argue from the qualities of the perceived object to the qualities of its unperceived real cause, and say that appearance here is like reality there? He has, if anything, more right because in the first place he is not starting with the distinction between appearance and reality here. In the second, he is not leaving perception itself on one side. Let alone that science altogether fails to account for the sensuous particulars in perception. End of Book 1, Chapter 3, Section 1, Part 2 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Book One, Chapter Three, Section One, Part Three, of the New Idealism by Mason Clare. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Book One, The Critical Preparations, Chapter Three: Some Realist Theories of Perception, Section One: Professor Broad and the Real Counterpart, Part Three. Professor Broad sees all this as clearly as the idealist, but after exposing the difficulties of the theory of science, he still concludes that, after all, there is no alternative theory that so well explains the facts. And the idealist may ask him, does idealism disturb the facts? And does the scientific theory allow for all the facts? The one fact that idealism allows for, and the scientific theory does not, is, as I have just said, the not unimportant fact of perception itself. The scientific theory, therefore, is very far from explaining all the facts. It begins by divorcing the objects of perception from perception itself, analyzing them from that isolated standpoint, and ends by leaving perception wholly unexplained. It does not cover perception as a whole covers its parts, and it cannot solve the hopeless contradictions between appearance and reality within its system. And as a matter of fact, we find Professor Broad confessing that the scientific theory would gain in probability by not having to make such definite and complicated assumptions about reality. End quote. He admits all the awkwardness of regarding color and sound as qualities like the real. But when he comes to touch, his difficulties vanish. Here, he argues, we have the indubitable real, the perceived quality that is like the quality of its unperceived cause. He adopts again the instrumental view of touch that he was obliged to abandon in the case of sight. And before we quarrel with his apparent inconsistency, we must remember that in the case of sight he was put off the instrumental theory because of the terrible multiplicity of reals involved, all those ellipsoids. But the troubles of realism are not ended. The instrumental theory of touch has indeed the advantage that it does not involve you in anything of the sort on its own account. But by the backing that it gives to the deliverances of sight, it at once brings all those realities down about your ears again. 
or else you must say that while touch witnesses to reality sight does not a statement not very intelligible in view of the fact that its deliverances can be correlated with those of touch in our geometrical system or say that sight only witnesses truly when it is corroborated by touch and that for the rest it leaves us with all those unreal ellipsoids on our hands that is saying that the most highly specialized the subtlest the most intellectual of our senses the one most concerned in our geometrical judgments is the most untrustworthy and needs the backing of the most generalized the most slapdash and haphazard of our senses next to taste and smell it would of course be irrelevant to point out that sight and sound have been throughout the ages the most valuable of human senses from the most primitive and savage life of action up to the latest and highest life of civilization and of art for they might very well be all this and yet very far from assuring us of reality beyond perception and in any case these considerations are not on the present level of the inquiry the real trouble is that sight does not invariably consent as it ought on the realist theory to follow the superior leading of touch professor broad comes to the conclusion that the circle is real while all these ellipses are not but of a circle or of any other figure in the flat touch cannot tell us anything at all it does no corroborating here it tells us that the sphere is spherical but its testimony stands alone for it is just here that sight obstinately refuses to follow it and when it comes to what we know or rather what science assumes to be the nature of the unperceived real it cannot be said that touch is in any better case than sight or than sound for that matter because unperceived matter is intangible even perceived matter that touch perceives to be dense science demonstrates to be permeable a surface that touch perceives as even or unbroken science declares to be rough and to have no cohesion bodies that touch perceives as at rest in all their parts science knows to be agitated by violent molecular and atomic movement in judging temperatures touch and the thermometer do not agree with any accuracy and in the one role left it as a truthful witness is discernment of three-dimensional figures can we be perfectly sure that it is touch and touch alone that is witnessing immediately and to reality when we see color in mass as extended we may be fairly certain that we are seeing extended color or colored extension whatever that may mean when we draw our hand over an extended surface we may be fairly certain that we are feeling smoothness and hardness when we see a circle in the flat we may be equally sure that while we remain in the position that gives that particular view we are seeing a circle but it may be questioned whether the up and down right and left backwards and forwards of the movements are perceived by any one sense alone it is hard to tell what is precisely the naked role of feeling in so highly educated a sense as touch all our senses are more or less sophisticated by judgment but it is quite clear that we are dealing here with a complex the full account of which cannot be given in terms of mere contact the sense of direction which enters into all our tactual perceptions of figures so far as it can be said to be a sense and not a judgment is a complicated affair involving correlated perceptions both of muscular movements and of sight so far from touch correcting sight here sight has to be called in to supplement touch nor can you leave movement altogether out of the visual relation in fact visual and tactual perceptions would seem to be very much alike in this respect i can see that a sphere is a sphere not all at once but bit by bit by going all round it that is to say by moving my eyes round it and correlating my percepts similarly i feel that it is a sphere not all at once but bit by bit by moving my hands or my fingers round it and correlating my percepts or if it is small enough i can turn it in my hands thus bringing it into the same relation to my eyes as if my eyes were turning round it again as my sense of touch is general throughout my body i can feel surfaces with any part of it but if that part is stationary i shall not feel shapes if my hands were as limited in their movements as my eyes i should not feel shapes any better than i see them 
and if i carried my eyes not inside my head but on an elevated ring like a candelabrum outside it i should see every part of any sphere that came within its circumference all at once and as well as if i had felt it now in tactual perception of three-dimensional shapes if your sphere is small enough to be grasped in one hand say a marble or a ball it may be said roughly that we perceive it by touch as round but the more accurate account of the matter would be surely that we judge it to be round by correlating feelings of contact with feelings of muscular contraction the grip and set of the hand the position of the fingers Note possibly the truth may be that what we once in our exploring infancy judged slowly and laboriously to be round we now do actually perceive to be round by an instantaneous correlation of percepts but this is psychology and irrelevant here End note. so that even here we cannot get touch in the required perfection of its innocence or if we say that the sphere is perceived by turning it in the hands or by moving a fingertip round it in successive circles then equally correlations judgments or perceptions of movement and direction have come in increase and go on increasing the size of your sphere and the role of judgment is increased out of all proportion to the role of touch till if your sphere be big enough all that touch can testify to will be a flat surface or take the tactual perception of a triangular cube we indeed perceive by touch alone the sharp edge of the sides the points of the angles the smoothness of the surfaces correlated with muscular movements of the hand or fingers touch may be said to yield even shape and size though here again and wherever there is such correlation judgment probably steps in and it is doubtful whether by touch alone we ever perceive shape as a whole or size as a whole in fact on professor broad's own showing or indeed on anybody's it can never be said with any certainty that touch in its first innocence and purity conveys anything to perception but those secondary qualities which he has decided to regard as mere appearances there is little doubt that we associate these secondary qualities with our judgments or perceptions of shapes and sizes and geometrical properties generally but in this case we have done it so inveterately and so long that it is difficult now if not impossible to disentangle them from the result though at first sight it may seem obvious that we ought to be able to as it is you have only to extend the scale and complicate the system of your figures for the element of judgment to emerge unmistakably i am inclined to think that so far from one sense correcting or corroborating another this must always be an affair of judgment rapid and unconscious of course but judgment if we could ever catch a sensum in its first freshness it would tell us nothing of reality though on a realist hypothesis it might be it so that if we pay no regard to motion the sense of touch is no more faithful witness to reality than sight yet it is to this sense the professor broad takes his flight from the intolerable multiplicity of ellipsoids and we have still to ask how when with sight and touch and movement all correctly correlated we have succeeded in combining our many ellipsoids into one sphere how do we know that that sphere is a reality that exists when we do not perceive it it must i think be agreed that we do not directly perceive it as a reality any more than we perceive it as one or a sphere and i think it must be equally clear that we have just as much and no more reason to suppose it is a reality as we have to suppose it is one and a sphere and our reasons have precisely the same grounds that is to say that at whatever time we observe it we find that it is separated in space from other bodies and that both its boundaries and its parts have certain geometrical spatial relations to each other such that at whatever time we observe them we find them always the same also as we know from observation that though the relation of each part to our bodies and their sense organs will vary with the movements and positions of these bodies and these organs their relation to their own whole is constant therefore we infer that that relation exists apart from the movement and position of our bodies in other words that in relation to that movement and position it is an independent real 
but this is not saying that the whole is a real and independent of our combined perceptions and we are faced with this dilemma if we deny its independence we shall have to admit between the whole and its parts a temporal cleavage fatal to their spatial integrity that is to say the parts for example each ellipsoid will exist in dependence on our partial perception at a time previous to the existence of the combination the whole and this is a simple dilemma if on the other hand we assert the independence of the whole on our perceptions partial or combined the dilemma is considerably more complicated we shall then have set up a multiplicity of spatially incompatible reals for each ellipsoid was real while it lasted within the whole and introduced a spatial integrity of these reals impossible in itself and fatal to their separation in time for in the whole the parts all temporally incompatible in partial perception inasmuch as they must necessarily fall in separate times and many spatially incompatible where their boundaries overlap all these incompatibles say will be coexisting at the same time and supposing we adopt professor broad's assumption of the independent real counterpart which is like the object of our tactual perception and related to it in a point-to-point -point correspondence i am not quite clear as to whether he does allow this entity to be also the counterpart of the object of our visual perception with its tactual and visual qualities correlated analogously to the qualities of the object perceived but i think he must for otherwise the totality of perceived visual qualities will lose all relation to the real and we shall be saddled with three entities a the perceived visual object unreal but mysteriously related to b the real perceived tactual object and c the counterpart of the tactual object correlated with it at all points but cut off from all direct relation to the visual object moreover if the object of tactual perception and the object of visual perception are different objects one with a counterpart and one without there is no possible sense in which we can be said either to see the same object as other people or the same object that we ourselves feel and the one real and common counterpart will not be the cause of both these objects but of one it will not really be common and yet i am puzzled for professor broad does distinctly say that the visual and tactual objects of perception are not one but two but supposing this counterpart entity contains the counterparts of all the qualities of the perceived object except the secondary ones which the consistent realist would count as real but which professor broad and science will not have at any price supposing that everywhere these prodigious counterparts exist you have then a duplication and i think a very unnecessary and complicated duplication which if thorough enough can only repeat boundary for boundary and point for point those incompatibles it was called in to reconcile and explain and if not thorough on what principle do we pick and choose what incompatibles are we to abstract from the counterpart if it is to remain a counterpart but this theory provides more entanglements than we have realized yet not only is it quote, possible to reason from a visually perceived object of a given shape to the real counterpart of a tactual figure of definite shape events in which do cause the visual perceptions which we have and which if we perform the proper actions would give us a corresponding tactual perception but such a statement as i cannot perceive an atom but i believe that atoms are shaped like dumbbells means that i believe that there exist in the real counterpart realities qualitatively like those events in which cause visual perception of dumbbell shaped figures but the real quantity which corresponds to the sizes and volumes and surfaces in perceived objects is so small that no perception is actually produced End quote as we shall see this is a jolly good thing for the real counterpart if it is to remain real remember the unperceived figure with its shape and distance all its geometrical qualities the figure that exists when we do not perceive it is never the figure we perceive but always its counterpart never the figure we perceive never a figure we have perceived never an object of possible perception 
and yet we are asked to believe that there would correspond to it a tactually perceived figure with the geometrical qualities in question if as a matter of fact we did have such a perception now what on earth is to prevent the idealist from refusing point blank to accept this preposterous counterpart throwing the whole assumption overboard and confronting the realist with what is left the objects of his perception which he has just shown to be more unreal than idealism could wish unreal because perceived and on the top of all this excitement professor broad introduces the dumbbell shaped atom so that the idealist's happy cup is now full up till now you might have supposed that the real counterpart though to our perception unsized and imperceptible would in the sheer contradiction of its nature be a sizable thing since it was a tactual counterpart composed of atoms and now it turns out that it may be an atom itself that would be perceived in the form of a dumbbell were it transcendently magnified and this question of magnitude is exceedingly important it means that if there were intelligences with suitable sense organs of nth magnifying power the imperceptible reality would cease to be imperceptible and as professor broad will have it that nothing that is perceptible is real it would cease to be real the real on this view is the potentially unreal and when it comes to shape and size yet another question arises where do you start and where do you stop what is your unit object of perception are there counterparts shaped like paris hats and empire sofas and buckingham palace and how about distance when i am close up against buckingham palace i can only see a portion of the immense facade if i stand a little way off i see the whole of it and i know the palace has a back and wings that i cannot see will there be counterparts of all these aspects and of all intermediate aspects will there be not one buckingham palace but many buckingham palaces and consider the empire sofa and the paris hat and say that your unit of perception is a room which contains both and many other things besides there will be counterparts both of these things taken singly when they are taken singly and of all together when they are taken together but perceptions do not possess this departmental character they cannot be blocked off from each other they move they suggest at every turn the old image of the cinema is there a separate counterpart for each flicker of the motion i move and i take in more details as i go along is there a counterpart of each phase of the object as it composes and supposing the unit of perception is as much as i can see of the sky on a starry night will the counterparts correspond to the real or the apparent size of the heavenly bodies talk of terrible complications as the unit of perception is incessantly varying with distance there will be as many units as there are possible distances and as many counterparts as there are units and as there are atoms in each unit nobody has a right to object if this is really so but what i cannot understand is professor broad's throwing over the comparatively innocent instrumental theory because of a few poor little ellipsoids more or less and cheerfully entertaining all that multitude of counterparts if he says i am hopelessly wrong and that it is the object of tactual perception only that is the unit i must then ask what is the unit of tactual perception surely it will vary with the size of objects and as i have pointed out large sizes are not given to it all at once but bit by bit and there should be as many counterparts as there are bits in which case there will still be a considerable assemblage of counterparts and isn't it really rather odd that if visual and tactual perceptions are truly correlated one should give you absolute size and the other size that is purely relative to distance it looks as if there were two alternatives both unpleasant for the realist either that the two perceptions are not truly correlated at all or that neither of them is in the realist sense real and when professor broad repeats that in all probability nothing that is perceptible is real i can only wonder again why if this be so he is at such pains to make his unperceived real the counterpart of the perceived and i cannot see that his theory of the continuum solves any of these problems it seems to me in one vital respect to be a hindrance to him rather than a help inasmuch as it bridges the distance between the imperceptible and the perceived 
thus bringing the real elements of the cosmos into the category of the unreal i see no tolerable alternative between that extreme but consistent realism which accepts hospitably the immense multiplicity of given reals and idealism with its sweeping simplifications along the whole line we shall see later on whether idealism can be so restated as to avoid these difficulties and dilemmas if it can it will have provided if not a better description a rather more credible explanation of the facts end of book one chapter three section one part three recording by expatriate in bangor maine book one chapter three section two part one of the new idealism by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine book one the critical preparations chapter three some realist theories of perception section two professor whitehead and the concept of nature part one so far we have been dealing with the simple relation of perceiving to an object perceived in which the object or rather its counterpart is the ultimate reality and so far it has been assumed for the purposes of theory that what is perceived is always an object obligingly present in space and time in other words that the object stands still to be stared at this theory presupposes or should presuppose a ready-made space and time for the object to stand still in which therefore will be more ultimate than it this on a realist theory without prejudice to the objective reality of space and time further any realist theory which assumes the static character of perception and the object perceived so far implies a dualism between perception and the cosmos perception will not be an event within nature it will stand outside it professor whitehead is not concerned with the problem of knowing but with the ultimate elements of the thing known of nature at a moment but nature in its ultimate elements does not stand still to be stared at there is no holding nature still and looking at it the ultimate elements are not objects but events it is its obstinate traditional habit of taking objects first and events after as something happening to objects in time and space which has landed philosophy in everlasting difficulties with space and time philosophy intent on objects catching its object first before any event can get to work on it is necessarily saddled with an absolute space and an absolute time independent of objects and events and independent of each other a timeless space in which objects stand or move a spaceless time through which they move as they move through space a space and time whose accounts can never hope to balance inasmuch as all space stands still at any one instant while no instant ever stands still so that not only must all space occur all over again with every instant but you can whittle away time till there is no instant left for space to occur in and you can whittle away space till there isn't a point left for time to cover it is clear that with such a time and such a space any real point instant correspondence is impossible and where it is arbitrarily assumed you have all the antinomies that have rejoiced idealists from zeno's time till now but professor whitehead like professor alexander denies the existence in nature of this kind of space and time while unlike professor alexander he denies the ultimate and independent existence of space and time at all space and time have no existence apart from what happens in nature that is to say from events they have no existence apart from each other spaceless time and timeless space are abstractions from the fundamental unity of events Quote, primarily we must not conceive of events in a given time or given space and consisting of changes in a given persistent material time space and material are adjuncts of events on the old theory of relativity they are relations between the materials on our theory they are relations between events events are the relata of the fundamental homogeneous relation of extension 
the externality of nature is the outcome of this relation of extension two events are mutually external or separate if there is no event which is part of both time and space both spring from the relation of extension time and space express relations between events other natural elements which are not events are only in time and space derivatively by reason of their relation to events events in a sense are space and time namely space and time are abstractions from events End quote. and the old traditional conception of matter as the ultimate physical reality must give way to the superior ultimacy of events science persists in regarding matter as planted securely in pre-existing space and time its assumption is quote, the outcome of uncritical acceptance of space and time as external conditions for natural existence first philosophy illegitimately transformed the bare entity which is simply an abstraction necessary for the method of thought into the metaphysical substratum of these factors in nature which in various senses are assigned to entities as their attributes End quote. and next following philosophy's bad example quote, scientists presuppose this substratum qua substratum for attributes as nevertheless in time and space this is surely a muddle the whole being of substance is as a substratum for attributes thus time and space should be attributes of the substance this they palpably are not since it is impossible to express spatio-temporal truths without having recourse to relations involving relata other than bits of matter End quote. again quote, it is not the substance which is in space but the attributes what we find in space are the red of the rose and the smell of the jasmine and the noise of the cannon we have all told our dentist where our toothache is thus space is not a relation between substances but between attributes the true relata are events End quote. no definition could well be plainer thus on this theory space and time are nothing but relations and so far from being presuppositions of experience they presuppose the events they relate strictly speaking we are not dealing here with presuppositions but with experience in the objective sense itself with the ultimate entities of nature professor whitehead gives you a list of them Quote, one events two percipient objects three sense objects four perceptual objects five scientific objects End quote. it is clear that perception will be primarily concerned with events and not with objects and that objects are to be carefully distinguished from events thus quote, objects convey the permanence recognized in events and are recognized as self-identical amid different circumstances that is to say the same object is recognized as related to diverse events thus the self-identical object maintains itself amid the flux of events it is there and then it is here and now and the it which has its being there and here then and now is without equivocation the same subject for thought in the various judgments which are made upon it the object is permanent because strictly speaking it is without time and space and its change is merely the variety of its relations to various events which are passing in space and time objects are only derivatively in space and time by means of their relation to events the chief confusion between objects and events is conveyed in the prejudice that an object can only be in one place at a time that is a fundamental property of events End quote. it is equally clear from its place in the list that perception so far from standing outside nature is contained within it as one event among others quote, the essential existence of the event here present is the reason why percipience is from within nature and is not an external survey the percipient event is discerned as the locus of a recognizable permanence which is the percipient object End quote and this is as near as professor whitehead will allow us to get to a subject a mind the percipient object is indeed much more akin to a body 
to the natural life associated with one consciousness and therefore definitely within nature which is closed to mind in the percipient event recognized sense object and apprehended event are correlative and inseparable Quote, there is no apprehension of external events apart from recognition of sense objects as related to them and there is no recognition of sense objects except as in relation to external events End quote. the percipient event then is in nature but yet quote, percipience in itself is taken for granted we leave to metaphysics the synthesis between the knower and the known End quote. so that though the percipient event is in nature percipience itself is something beyond nature with which a philosophy of nature is not concerned all the same in making some statements about percipience and percipient events this philosophy is going beyond its book the book of nature nature does not tell us whether the percipient event is inside or outside it and as we shall presently see when we come to consider the intellectual constructions of space and time thought goes far outside nature's book and as in the end these intellectual constructions have to be called on to help out the four-dimensional geometry of events any philosophy of nature which has sworn off metaphysics is in an awkward case but these adventures of thought in the realm beyond nature are another story professor whitehead's problem is definitely not a metaphysical one what he is chiefly concerned with avoiding is just this everlasting problem of knowing and the knower we may object that he is making things too easy for himself by leaving it out but he is perfectly within his rights we cannot be reminded too often that quote, no perplexity concerning the object of knowledge can be solved by saying that there is a mind knowing it End quote though who in their sense has ever said it could idealists may protest against this rude summary of their position they have no business to object to anybody's isolating the object of knowledge for examination so long as they are convinced that the more strictly you isolate and the more thoroughly you examine nature the more surely will you discover nature's inadequacy her failure even to provide the data for a philosophy of nature nature professor whitehead says is closed to mind though not to the percipient event so closed you may add that thought has to go beyond nature to make nature intelligible and yet professor whitehead protests against the bifurcation theory which divides nature up into two systems of reality nature known and conditioned by the byplay of the mind and nature unknown the mysterious cause of knowing with the consequent split between primary and secondary qualities between appearance and reality he refuses quote, to countenance any theory of psychic additions to the object known in perception this dragging in of mind as making additions of its own to the thing posited for knowledge by sense awareness is merely a way of shirking the problem of natural philosophy End quote. and this cutting out of mind as a possible contributor to the perceived result is merely a way of shirking the problem of knowledge and observe that professor whitehead has no sort of anxiety about the incompatibilities that shake naive realism and the doubtful status of secondary qualities on his theory and on the idealists there isn't a pin to choose between primary and secondary qualities Quote, we may not pick and choose for us the red glow of the sunset should be as much a part of nature as are the molecules and electric waves by which men of science would explain the phenomenon as far as reality is concerned all our sense perceptions are in the same boat End quote. but here idealism and professor whitehead are at issue the boat is nature's boat not mine's primary and secondary qualities are one not because they are all one to the mind that perceives but because quote, there is but one nature namely the nature which is before us in perceptual knowledge end quote. still professor whitehead admits that some sort of case can be made out for the bifurcation theory so far as it is based on the assumption of absolute time quote, in the first place time extends beyond nature our thoughts are in time 
accordingly it seems impossible to derive time merely from relations between elements in nature in the second place it is difficult to derive the true serial character of time from the relative theory each instant is irrevocable End quote. and when it comes to the scientific objects the light waves and the electrons and the agitated molecules he cannot but see that there really is a difficulty in relating these with colors for example in the same system of entities it cannot be done unless we produce the all-embracing relations which by the way rightly or wrongly is what idealism has always claimed to have done but for the moment the claims of idealism can wait these all-embracing relations professor whitehead finds in time and space Quote, the perceived redness of the fire and the warmth are definitely related in time and in space to the molecules of the fire and the molecules of the body End quote. he admits further that on the assumption of absolute space and time the bifurcation theory has the merit of all embracingness absolute space and time bridge the gulf between appearances and causal realities by bringing both into the same double system of relations and thus link up what would otherwise fall apart but his objections to the theory cut deeper than time and space they are in short three Quote, in the first place it seeks for the cause of knowledge of the thing known instead of seeking for the character of the thing known secondly it assumes a knowledge of time in itself apart from events related in time thirdly it assumes a knowledge of space in itself apart from events related in space End quote. if we take bifurcation seriously it will split up time and space themselves into the real and the apparent why if we make this great division why stop at space and time quote, why on this theory should the cause which influences the mind to perception have any characteristics in common with the effluent apparent nature in particular why should it be in space why should it be in time the transcendence of time beyond nature gives some slight reason for presuming that causal nature should occupy time End quote. for the mind occupies time but the mind does not occupy space so why if you bifurcate should causal nature occupy space this difficulty we are reminded does not exist for science which seeks only the character of the thing known science is cutting mind out altogether now if you cut mind out altogether it is clear that you have indeed got rid of the tiresome responsibility of adjusting the relations of mental appearances to the relations of causal nature in seeing red if you cut mind out you have only to account for the emergence of red in the field of vision and are only concerned with a chain of physical causation which leads up to red and not beyond it to perception Quote, science is not discussing the causes of knowledge but the coherence of knowledge End quote. and according to realism the coherence of knowledge is to be found not in mind but in nature which is closed to mind we have seen that the main support of the bifurcation theory was the assumption of absolute time and absolute space and professor whitehead's argument suggests that bifurcation suicidally cuts away the ground from under its own feet and again idealists for opposite reasons will agree it fares still worse if on the other hand you take time and space as relative and this on the first blush of it looks bad for idealism which has hitherto assumed that its worst enemies were absolute space and absolute time as bestowing their own reality on objects and events occurring in them it has been supposed to thrive on their relativity but it will not thrive on the relativity professor whitehead offers it relativity is fatal to any idealism which clings to any form of the bifurcation theory it destroys the space and time which were common to causal unperceived nature and the appearing nature of perception time and space will depend on the relations between appearances they will be relations between appearances and you will have to assume another space and another time relative to the events in causal nature idealism can only afford to say why not 
if it can show these events themselves to be elements in some supreme, all-embracing system of consciousness. Now the single crux for idealism is precisely this assumed existence of unperceived causal realities, for idealism can make nothing of reality unperceived. But the character of the unperceived object is, as we have seen, a crux for realism too. And here again on the event theory, after all its elaborate definitions and correlations, which build up the concept of the geometrical continuum, our first contact with matter introduces the incurable discreteness which met us on the traditional theory of space and time. The material object appears to perception as continuous in space and time, and according to science is really made up of discrete particles. But the realist theory of perception stands on the axiom that objects are what they appear or are perceived to be. How does Professor Whitehead, having named this difficulty, get over it? He gets over it by his theory of the ultimate character of events. In the case of a material object, we have a complex consisting of the appearance of the object, its situation, and its causal character. The appearance is thus conceived as an event within an event. Obviously, this theory avoids any contradictions between appearance and reality within the object, while allowing for this distinction within the continuous unity of the event complex. The object, that is to say, is conceived as real and permanent in the stream, and as shifting the responsibility for its character as a mere appearance onto the shoulders of the event, which is its situation. As nature is never standing still, the object will always be in some situation. There will always be some obliging event ready to hold itself responsible for the apparent duplicity. A drop of water, say, is found guilty of a breach of continuity. Professor Whitehead says we must distinguish between the drop of water as it appears, the event which is its situation, and the character of the event which causes the event to present that appearance. At this point, the idealist begins to suspect, and I think to suspect rightly, that objects of perception with their inherent contradictions are being camouflaged as events. And he is not without hope that their eventual character will presently disclose contradictions of its own. End of Book 1, Chapter 3, Section 2, Part 1 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Book 1, Chapter 3, Section 2, Part 2 Of the New Idealism by May Sinclair This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Book 1, The Critical Preparations Chapter 3, Some Realist Theories of Perception Section 2, Professor Whitehead and the Concept of Nature Part 2 we shall have to consider the single crux of idealism later. Meanwhile, it is clear that for realism the crux is triple. On the one hand, the incompatibility between the primary and the secondary qualities, and this whether they are in the same boat of reality or not. And on the other hand, the absence of any intelligible correspondence between the perceptual objects and the scientific objects, the electrons, the light waves, the molecules and again, between all these and consciousness. These difficulties, Professor Broad and Professor Whitehead would remind us, do not exist for science which has no use for secondary qualities and ignores perception. But it is where the difficulties of science end that the difficulties of philosophy begin. And it is at this point that you wonder whether even a philosophy of nature is justified in simplifying its problem by leaving out all the troublesome factors. Professor Whitehead denies that they are factors, and if the way of omission and denial is the first step to arriving at the clear and definite concept of nature, it is above criticism. So I will not at this point raise the irritating and irrelevant question of consciousness of the synthesis between perception and the object perceived, let alone the synthesis between both and the perceiver. I will merely ask whether the concept of nature we have so far arrived at is really adequate, and whether it is self-consistent. The whole problem turns, first of all, upon this question of adequacy. 
Professor Whitehead has given us a concept of nature, built up by means of an elaborate and perfect system of definitions, so clear and precise in its main lines that there is no excuse for any failure to follow them. The concept, as we see it now, sweeps all things in nature, all events, all objects, real and apparent or frankly delusive, into the essentially derivative yet practically all-embracing net of time and space. It presents nature as an endless process of passing events in which objects alone maintain stability and permanence. It regards events as the most ultimate of all realities. There is no getting behind events. It translates all the philosophy of nature into the language of events and of relations between events. Time and space, the all-embracing, are so far from ultimate that they exist only in relation to events. Events create time and space as they go along. Objects are only in time and space, as it were, on sufferance, by reason of their connection with events. In the language of events, the redness of a red object is color in a situation, the situation being determined by events and itself determining the character of the object. Thus, a real object is distinguished from a delusive object by the coincidence of its situation with its cause, a fact that we express when we say that the object is really out there where it is seen. The ambiguous and the delusive object have their situations out there and their causes somewhere else. For example, the image I see in the looking glass has its situation there in the looking glass and its cause in some object behind or beside me in the room. The hallucination I see in the room has its situation there, and its cause in some kink in my optic nerve or cerebral cortex. As the time order and system is nothing but the order and system of events, it is clear that there will be as many time orders and time systems as there are orders and systems of events. And as pure time is a baseless abstraction apart from space, and pure space a baseless abstraction apart from time, and both are baseless abstractions apart from events, time conceived as duration, or united space-time, will have the thickness of space. Time is to be thought of not as a linear series of instants, but as layers, layers formed by the system of events enclosing and enclosed. This extension, this snug covering, that time and space acquire through their relation to each other and to events, ensures their continuity. It forms a four-dimensional stratified continuum in which time is the fourth dimension. It is easy to see that this concept does away at one stroke with all incompatibilities, disjunctions, and antinomies. It has an immediate appeal to the appetite for philosophic unity the appeal of all vast and sweeping simplifications. It is at first sight so satisfying that you can hardly believe it possible to find a flaw in it. You say to yourself, why not be content with this concept? It is so all-embracing in its relativity as to appease even the lovers of the absolute. Why not lie down in this comfortable, uncontradictious philosophy and be at peace? There is nothing damaging to honor in this repose. It is not like taking the brutal assaults of realism lying down. Professor Whitehead is not assaulting anybody. There is nothing polemic or metaphysical about him. On the contrary, he is avoiding the bitterness of controversy by refusing to drag in mind. Almost you could agree with him. Why, after all, worry about perception? Why not call it the percipient event and have done with it? Something has to be taken for granted, and you can't on any theory account for consciousness any more than you can account for nature. It just is, and nature just is, and by far the most comprehensive thing you can say about them is that they are both events. And the most comprehensive thing you can say about events is that they are in space and time. But it is when you get here that the real trouble begins inveterately you conceive events as in space and time. If space and time are to be adequate, if they are to do their work as the required all-embracing relations, all that linking up and unifying business, you must so think of events, and events must be as so thought of. But in so thinking you are doing what Professor Whitehead over and over again insists that you are not to do. 
you have ceased to think in terms of events and are thinking back again in the old tiresome terms of space and time which have landed philosophy in all its difficulties but observe what happens if you obey professor whitehead and think conscientiously and rigorously in terms of events time and space which were to have been the all-embracing relations cease to embrace they cannot on the theory embrace events since only by and in events do they themselves come into being that is to say they fail to embrace the better part of nature the most ultimate realities in nature and they cannot they most certainly cannot embrace objects since objects are not in space and time or are only derivatively in space and time through their situation in events therefore they fail to embrace any part of nature and if i may in passing drag mind in they cannot embrace thought because thought goes beyond nature goes beyond space and time therefore they cannot embrace anything at all they are phantoms shadows cast by events in their passing so that the concept of nature is not adequate to provide those all-embracing spatial and temporal relations it promised us and we are left with events embracing each other and themselves and objects sitting permanent and cold outside this intimacy we have no business at any stage to demand that any philosophy should account for mind account for consciousness or so much as render their existence plausible but a philosophy which goes beyond nature and i cannot see how a complete philosophy can well stop there a metaphysical philosophy must demand an account of mind of consciousness and i think it can hardly be contested that this cannot be given by simply calling consciousness an event and leaving it at that the concept of nature is singularly inadequate here and we have not yet even cited the problem of ethics but again i am reminded that we have no business to press the concept of nature beyond nature enough if we have seen it to be inadequate in its own realm and how about its consistency the consistency of the apparently perfect definitions on which it takes its stand take the distinction between objects and events objects are not truly only derivatively in space and time yet spatial and temporal relations were brought forward as linking up all objects whether of sense perception or of science whether delusive or non-delusive in a unity objects are defined as permanent structures amid the flux of events yet objects are the only things in nature that are subject to change the object of sense awareness and perception is at rest the same object to the eye of science is the center of profound and secret agitation the traditional view also lifts up the object out of the stream of events and regards it as an eternal permanent thing fixed in the block of consciousness which will forever stand still to be looked at while it conceives events as streaming away from the object on every side but it puts the object first and the events after on the grounds that events are what happens to objects and that an object must be there first for them to happen to and i think it must be said that if objects have this permanence and are real apart from perception we are forced to regard them as ultimate more ultimate than events their reality confers on them this ultimacy an ultimacy that they lose if we say with idealism that perception in which i include memory confers on them their reality but perception also takes stock of the events things are happening to the object something changes the lump of sugar is dissolving rapidly in my teacup under my microscope the chrysalis in its golden lattice shell that was once a smooth greenish oval body began to put out buds the other day today it has burst its shell and come out a slender black insect with iridescent wings something changes it is not the event Quote, events never change nature develops in the sense that an event e becomes part of an event e prime which includes that is extends over e and also extends into the futurity beyond e thus we say that events pass but do not change the passage of an event is its passing into some other event which is not it the terms past present and future refer to events 
the irrevocableness of the past is the unchangeability of events. End quote. Then what changes must be either the object perceived or the perceiver or his body? Clearly, in the cases of the lump sugar and the chrysalis, it is not the perceiver. Therefore, it is the object. The object, then, has this twofold contradictory character that it is the one permanent thing in the flux of events and that events change it while they do not change. As far as permanence goes, events and objects seem to have exchanged places. And there is trouble about the parts of objects. It seems that a leg of a chair is not really part of the chair. Quote, now the object during ten seconds is not part of the object during one of those seconds. The object is always wholly itself during ten seconds or during one second. It is this train of thought which led to the introduction of the durationless instant of time as a fundamental fact, thus fatally confusing the whole philosophy of science. End quote. But if you discriminate between the object and its situation, you dissociate it from its time. This is one of the senses in which Professor Whitehead assumes the object to be not in time, and time and space go together. Quote, the derivation of space and time by the method of extensive analysis exhibits the essential identity of extension in time and extension in space. Thus, the reasons for denying temporal parts of an object are also reasons for denying its spatial parts. Again, it is true that the leg of the chair occupies part of the space which is occupied by the chair. But in appealing to space, we are appealing to relations between events. What we are saying is that the situation of the leg of the chair is part of the situation of the chair. End quote. But it is not part of the chair. This is the sense in which Professor Whitehead denies that objects occupy space. Thus the leg of the chair is only part of the chair, as it were on sufferance, by right of its place in the situation. We are at liberty to regard the leg as one object and the chair as another object. And thus the unity of the object disappears, for there will be as many objects as there are parts of the situation. It disappears in the multitude of its parts, and at the same time it is said to have no parts. It is not even a self-consistent object. To be sure, what you lose on the objects you gain on the events. So let us turn to the events. To begin with, there is trouble about the relations of objects to events. Quote, the ultimate natural entities are events. End quote. As we have seen, it is hard to accept this concept if objects are the permanent element in events, if they constitute the material of events. Surely it is to be understood that to convey the permanences recognized in events is equivalent to being an element in or the material of events. But apparently we are not to understand this, for it is distinctly stated that the two types, objects and events, are radically distinct and that the term element refers only to products within any one mode of diversification of nature. Therefore, one type or mode will not and cannot be an element of any other type or mode. So how are we to understand this essential internal relation of objects and events? Again, Professor Whitehead allows objects to be regarded as qualities of events, so that they cannot be the permanent material of events. And even if we could agree that events must needs be more fundamental and ultimate than the qualities they have, the question is whether we can regard objects as of this secondary importance. Mark that this is more than a mere question of precedent and prestige. It involves the very essence of these entities. For Professor Whitehead says that the six questions, which, what, how, when, where, whither, reveal that what is ultimate in nature is a set of determinate things, each with its own relations to other things of the set, where among things objects are clearly included so that we start not knowing which really is ultimate in nature. Now it is the events, now it is the objects, and again and over and over again it is the events. But the very fact that the six questions can be construed as referring to events or to objects surely points to a community in six relations between object and event. How then can they be so radically distinct? 
but if objects through their situations may be said to take part in events and surely they may then there is a sense in which they are elements in events and if they are elements community would follow as a matter of course professor whitehead's contention i think is at any rate it follows from his theory that this depends on the events and not on the objects it is the events that let the objects in for the community how then can objects be said to be qualities of events events have no substance or matter to support qualities and in any case on the theory substance or matter has gone by the board in which case nothing but the qualities are left and the theory will not admit of our identifying events with their qualities the objects so i do not see how and in what sense this relation is to be established and how can an object not in space and time have any real community even derivatively with events which are in space and time how can events extend beyond their time and space to rope in these essentially spaceless and timeless entities or take causal relations take scientific objects for example electrons they are said to express the causal character of events observe that it is never the object in itself which is causal only the situation of the object the events which so to speak stream through its permanence Quote, at the present epoch the ultimate scientific objects are electrons events related to a definite electron are called the field of that object the relations of the object to different parts of the field are interconnected and when the relationship of the object to certain parts of the field is known its relationship to the remaining parts can be calculated as here defined the field of an electron extends through all time and all space each event bearing a certain character expressed by its relation to the electron as in the case of other objects the electron is an atomic unity only mediating in space and time by reason of its specific relation to events End quote. now how can an object an ultimate object express the causal character of events the object in itself is never causal it must wait upon events before ever it can have or be in a situation how does the ultimate object the atom or the electron get a move on so as to express a causal character more fundamental than the object is the event but the event i take it has not yet begun it has to wait so to speak on the electron Quote, the field is divisible into two parts namely the occupied events and the unoccupied events the occupied events correspond to the situation of the physical object End quote. we have therefore in all space and all time which is the field of the electron an infinite number of empty events of possible situations waiting for their physical objects to come along and occupy them observe that unoccupied event is the translation of empty space-time into the language of events by which we seem to avoid this difficulty of object before and event after and we must allow the theory the full advantage of this rendering Quote, the unoccupied events possess a definite character expressive of the reign of law in the creative advance of nature that is in the passage of events this type of character of events unoccupied by the electron is also shared by the occupied events it expresses the role of the electron as an agency in the passage of events in fact the electron is nothing else than the expression of certain recognizable features in this creative advance End quote i take it that we are to understand by this that the unoccupied events are those events in which the electron has not yet played its part but which are strictly determined by the ascertained part it has played in accordance with the laws of nature again this is a translation of the concept of the uniform behavior of electrons in terms of events in terms of events observe to avoid the traditional concepts of space time and matter we must stick to the translation for we shall miss all the implications of professor whitehead's theory if we revert to the original corrupt text but observe also the double part played by the electron it is expressly stated to be an agency in the passage of events 
thus its causal character is declared at the same time that its character as object quote, the expression of certain permanent recognizable features end quote, is insisted on no doubt once an electron always an electron but how can an object be at once a cause and not a cause and this affair of the electron is more complicated still hitherto we have been considering one electron and events as occupied or unoccupied by it but an event not occupied by one electron will be occupied by another electron and the translation will be continued thus quote, the character of event e which it receives from electron a which does not occupy it is one of the influences which govern the change of electron b which does occupy e into the occupation of other events succeeding e the complete formula of change for b can be expressed in terms of the complete character which e receives from its relations to all the electrons in the universe End quote here we have the translation of electrons passing through space and time in terms not of space and time and matter but of pure events it must be admitted that the translation has the immense advantage of simplification and comprehensiveness translated back into the old terms of space and time and matter you would have physical objects hurtling through pre-existing space in foreordained time and in such a manner that if space and time be taken as absolute at any instant the object will be stationary in space thus parting with the event character of its motion on the other hand if space and time be taken as relative matter itself will be infected with that relativity and lose its alleged character as the causal ultimate the question is whether precisely the same thing has not happened to the events whether the formula in terms of events does not involve contradictions every bit as bad as any that the traditional view was landed in take events themselves events do not change they pass they are and are not and event is what it is when it is and where it is definite demarcation all or nothingness is the essential character of events thus events take on that hard quality of exclusiveness which characterize the points of absolute space the instants of absolute time their demarcation seems incompatible with their continuity if events are as self-contained as all that it is hard to see how one event can extend over another or how any duration which is the time of events can enclose or be enclosed by another or how one event can cause condition or influence another if an event which has passed has passed utterly if neither it nor any particle of it is to be thought of as somehow continuing in the event it has influenced conditioned or caused the old antinomies of space and time have broken out again transferred to events we are faced with endless breaches in the continuity of events the theory of duration is presented here as saving the continuum Quote, the continuity of nature arises from extension every event extends over other events and every event is extended over by other events thus every duration is part of other durations and every duration has other durations which are parts of it End, quote. End of book one chapter three section two part two recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter three section two part three of the new idealism by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine book one the critical preparations chapter three some realist theories of perception section two professor whitehead and the concept of nature part three we must think of time in vertical not linear extension in stratified durations because it is space-time in other words event time we are dealing with durations are stratified thus quote, a pair of durations both of which are part of the same duration are called parallel and also a pair of moments such that there are durations in which both inhere are called parallel End quote. again quote, 
a complete time system is formed by any one family of parallel durations two durations are parallel if either one one includes the other or two they overlap so as to include a third duration common to both or three are entirely separate the excluded case is that of two durations overlapping so as to include in common an aggregate of finite events but including in common no complete duration End quote. if you think of this in terms of time only it is meaningless if you think of it in terms of linear extension it is meaningless you must think of it in terms of events events piled one on the top of the other it means that events do not follow one another in a single linear past present future series with point instant correspondence in a procession that has but one starting point but that they form a system or systems and there will be as many parallel layers as there are events contained in one duration but in spite of the extreme precision of these definitions it is not easy to see within a given duration what actual durations will be parallel and what would not take for example the duration of my day the duration of my working times ten a m to one thirty p m and five thirty p m to seven thirty p m and the durations of my meal times eight thirty to nine a m one thirty p m to two p m five to five fifteen p m and eight to eight forty five p m are parts of the same duration which is my day yet so far from being parallel they are successive they fit into alternate places in the completed order of my day and i cannot conceive of their spatial character the fact that one order of events goes on in my dining room and the other in my study as altering this character of successiveness it is clear that such orders of events within a duration are not the parallels we should be thinking of nor do they seem to belong to the excluded case four for two moments which are not parallel necessarily intersect and there is no moment of my working times that anywhere intersects or is intersected by any moment of my meal times so long as i do not work when i am eating therefore it would seem that my working and my eating times must belong to different time systems yet they are all covered by the duration of the event which is my day i am puzzled by this double character of successiveness and enclosure and i am driven to conclude that these parallels are only to be found in any two order of events going clean through any two durations within the same duration and of an equality such that their starting points and their end points respectively will be covered by the same moment the selection of starting point and end point will be purely arbitrary for any two orders of events in any given slice of observation but what is a starting point or an end point for one must be a starting point or end point for the other i think this must be so because otherwise we should have no hold on events we shall be dealing with serial event orders which may outrun the limits of our covering duration at either end and we shall have to stretch this duration so as to cover their unequal starting and end points which may again extend beyond the increased duration and with this game of event durations we shall never have done on the other hand if we insist on the one starting point for all pairs of parallels within the one time system we are back again in the old tradition of the point instant correspondence and all nature at an instant and though all nature at an instant is never given in sense awareness we know very well that beyond our sense awareness all nature at an instant is there and i do not see that the difficulties are avoided by substituting events which are space and time events which are durations for spaceless times and timeless spaces and event particles for point instants however fitly the distinction expresses the timefulness of space and the spacefulness of time for the essential character of an event is that it is a definite thing marked off from all other events and this differentiation cannot be purely qualitative as it is in the case of spaceless and timeless objects for events do not change they pass one moment they are and the next moment they are not and they are to be distinguished from objects by precisely this property 
and by the fact that one event cannot occupy two spaces at the same time. Indeed, an event never can occupy two spaces at any two times, for the moment it occupies another space at another time, it is no longer the same event, but another. Events are what they are, when they are, where they are. True, the actual presence of the event will extend over some duration, but this must surely be in such sort that the event ends with its duration, and is succeeded by another event in another duration. And what applies to durations and events will apply to moments and event particles. So that we are faced again with the old problem of nextness and succession. All that has happened is that we are dealing with events and durations, that is to say with extensions instead of points and instants. But as between event and event, or one event particle and another, there will be breaches of continuity. Breaches that you cannot hope to fill by means of the cantor dedekind compact series, for I think you cannot say that between any two events or event particles there is an infinite number of events or event particles. An event and every part of an event is essentially finite and qualitative, and as such will not admit of infinite stuffing, though durations may. Now can I see that the covering of one duration by another, the extension of one event over another, really ensures continuity, as long as you assume, and you certainly have to assume, differentiation between events and durations. The symbol of this continuity is the Chinese toy, the set of smaller and smaller boxes packed one inside the other, except that in the event continuum there is no smallest box. Its diagram is a system of enclosed and enclosing squares converging to a central point and the packing is indeed so tight and the layers enclosing the ultimate point so thick that for a moment you are juggled into believing that you have here an indubitable continuum. It is only when you translate the hieroglyphics of the diagram back again into the original language of events that you perceive that continuity there can be none. For one thing, events have to be taken, so to speak, in the rough. They are not entirely surrounded. They do not really converge to a point. The point is an ideal limit. Quote, it is evident that an abstractive set, as we pass along it, converges to the ideal of all nature with no temporal extension, of all nature at an instant. But this ideal is in fact the ideal of a non-entity. But the point at the narrow end is not more ideal than the limit, the square at the other end of the scale the all-enclosing, unenclosed event. When you consider seriously these two ends open to the infinite and the ideal, where space and time must either cease or contain and be contained forever, you begin to wonder whether the whole construction is not ideal without any application to actual events. It can only apply, so far as it applies at all, to all nature at an instant which is never given in sense awareness and was dismissed as an intellectual abstraction. For nature is enlarging her temporal borders moment by moment. The two ends of the system of squares are open to the past and to the future. In vain you build up your system of squares. Nature outruns your building. In vain you dovetail time into space and space into time. Nature forges ahead, putting out more and more events into the ever-appearing present, which was once her future, throwing back more and more events into her past. To be sure, in a mathematician's head, and in a diagram on paper, a continuum is achieved in the sense that serial time is vanquished for a moment. Between the squares that contain and the squares that are contained, there is no such solution of continuity as would exist were all the squares unpacked and ranged in a row side by side. They are all, as William James would have said, snug in their own skins. That is to say, they would be if this containing process left them any skins to be snug in. Events have to be well skinned to fit into the system. For if you admit the skin, you admit the boundary line. And between boundary line and boundary line is as bad as between point and point. And since you are dealing with actual finite and partially qualitative events and event particles, you have not the resource of introducing infinities. 
if on the other hand you delete the boundaries you have one unbounding and unbounded event which is a very defiance and negation of the principle at stake and all the time nature is rolling on and on in a past present and future process that fairly cries out for serial time it is only when any section of the process is passed that the mathematician wantonly abstracting from it all that was passing in successive can telescope the events in it one inside the other and in fancy see them as containing and contained i do not mean to suggest that his procedure is not perfectly legitimate in its way nor do i want to deny that nature presents to sense awareness a rough and ready appearance of continuity that is to say sense awareness cannot find a break i do not mean that there is any better way of regarding nature at any given moment of awareness but i do insist that there is no way of conjuring continuity out of a series even a vertical or stratified series of events and that professor whitehead's way only succeeds because of the surreptitious introduction of the very last factor he would desire to admit the factor of consciousness this is what comes of taking events for ultimate realities and flying to them for a continuum why even the comparatively despised perceptual object does more for the mathematician than that it at least does stand still to be stared at if we did not know its secret life of infinite change and agitation its apparent permanence might suggest a kind of continuity in space and time but here again if the object does not exist in space and time its continuity will not help the problem where it is now we have seen that the event duration theory ends by throwing us back on the ideal of a non-entity it would therefore seem that the concept of nature contains a fundamental contradiction somewhere i do not know whether professor whitehead would deny the contradiction on the grounds that nature is one thing and its concept another or on what grounds he would deny it the fact remains that a contradiction between nature and its concept is a contradiction within the whole of reality which is nature and thought taken together it cannot see that realists have any business to say that there isn't any such whole of reality seeing that it is implied in any discussion of ultimate concepts we must then have either a complete dualism between nature and thought or a dualism between nature and the concept of nature within the whole of reality and if reality is to be a whole this is regrettable and in the long run professor whitehead agrees that the concept of the properties of nature at an instant is fundamental in the expression of physical science so that once more we have the deliverances of sense awareness contradicting the deliverances of science which once more is an awkward position for realism but we have not yet done with serial time serial time is stated to be the result of an intellectual process of abstraction we may wonder how the intellect contrives to abstract from events what was not in them already it has been said previously that each element of the series exhibits an instantaneous state of nature but quote, this serial time is not the very passage of nature itself the state of nature at a moment has evidently lost this ultimate quality of passage End quote. so that between a state of nature and nature's passing we have a temporal contradiction and again the lapse of time is a measurable serial quantity we cannot juggle away the serial quality of time by calling it an intellectual abstraction these difficulties however are not created by professor whitehead who gets over them by denying the priority and independence of time and distinguishing between the event time of nature's passing and the passing of abstract serial time Quote, we have first to make up our minds whether time is to be found in nature or nature is to be found in time the difficulty of the latter alternative namely of making time prior to nature is that thus time becomes a metaphysical enigma End quote. the idealist would say that that is precisely what time is quote, the dissociation of time discloses to our immediate perception that the attempt to set up time as an independent terminus for knowledge is like the effort to find substance in a shadow 
there is time because there are happenings and apart from happenings there is nothing End quote. the trouble is that in the long run we have to recognize that quote, there is a passage of sense awareness and a passage of thought thus the reign of the quality of passage extends beyond nature End quote. and we have to distinguish here between passage which is fundamental and the temporal series which is a logical abstraction and so it turns out that quote, time in the sense of a measurable temporal series is a character of nature only and does not extend to processes of thought and of sense awareness except by the correlation of these processes with the temporal series implicated in their procedures End quote. i am not quarrelling with the facts but we may as well notice that measurable serial time which a while back was said to be not the passage the very passage of nature itself is now declared to be a character of nature only yet the character of nature is passage moreover the time in which thought passes extends as thought extends beyond nature so that all time cannot be swept into nature's flux of events or nature's durations and thus time is not an intellectual abstraction the consideration of memory complicates the question further quote, the mere fact of memory is an escape from transience in memory the past is present accordingly memory is a disengagement of mind from the mere passage of nature for what has passed for nature has not passed for mind End quote. we have now seen the inadequacy and the inconsistency of the concept of nature that refuses to drag in mind and we have reached the point where mind refuses to be left out any longer where it obtrudes itself in spite of all the well-guarded defences of realism we have after all to include in the philosophy of nature as an ultimate entity the time of mind which extends beyond nature and to deny any place beyond nature to measurable serial time for all it was said to be an intellectual abstraction since the processes of nature are measurable and calculable in time and yet the time we measure and calculate by cannot be the space-time which events are for nature cannot measure herself it is a mind time which events conform to and so far as they conform and so far as this time is a character of nature nature is not closed to mind what is more it has become increasingly noticeable that the very definitions of the percipient event presuppose a certain psychical limit we are dealing always with nature as observed and there are limits to our observation and a psychical limit i submit is every bit as bad as a psychical addition for a philosophy of nature which is rigorously excluding mind take for example the psychical standard of duration Quote, our observational present is what i call a duration the duration as a whole is signified by that quality of relatedness in respect of extension possessed by the part which is immediately under observation namely by the fact that there is essentially a beyond to whatever is observed i mean by this that every event is known as being related to other events which it does not include exclusion is as positive a quality as inclusion End quote. note that exclusion is of space all the things in nature which we don't have under observation and of time all the things in nature which have not happened for us all the things which both for us and for nature haven't happened yet now if percipience is an event in nature that is to say in the nature of the realist which is independent of percipience anticipation of the future is impossible and meaningless memory is both impossible and meaningless for both memory and anticipation are forms of perception with a change of tense and perception cannot jump outside nature to perceive the things which for nature have passed and for nature have not yet begun again if perception is in nature it can never transcend nature at any moment it can never transcend the stretch of nature which it has under observation at any moment yet in order to grasp that stretch above all in order to make that distinction between perception or if professor whitehead prefers it between percipient event and object perceived that distinction which is vital to realism it must transcend nature from moment to moment 
if this distinction is not given in perception for realism it is never given Quote, we observe nature as extended in an immediate present which is simultaneous but not instantaneous and therefore the whole which is immediately discerned or signified as an interrelated system forms a stratification of nature which is a physical fact End quote. we have already seen what happens between stratifications we have seen that by knocking out point instants we have not got rid of discontinuity it crops up again between durations and here it is at last impossible to exclude consciousness from the problem consciousness emerges as the controller of these stratifications that is to say the percipient event is the measure of the observational present which is nature's here now nature in any here now can be no less and no more than what perception can take in at one bite it is events with their rhythm their vibration that bring discontinuity in while consciousness covers the events consciousness slides from duration to duration without a break it and it alone provides the continuity discerned in nature it or rather the enduring self behind it is the continuum beside the steady stare of consciousness events quiver you can almost hear the tick tick of their passing may not the truth be that events as distinguished from objects space as distinguished from time and both as distinguished from events reality as distinguished from appearances and nature as distinguished from thought are all abstractions from the continuous unity of some all-embracing self even finite selves confer unity and continuity on nature as far as they go though their consciousness is closed to the greater part of reality and there were those contradictions we have seen the twofold contradictory character of objects on the realist event theory i do not see how we are to believe that a real object independent of perception of the form of consciousness could have this twofold contradictory character let us look at it again if the permanent object and its change or changes are not one object but two or more objects the object hasn't changed and each successive state of the object will constitute a literally different object but we can't say this for this is what holds good of events and events are the very stuff of our experience Quote, events are lived through they extend around us they are the medium within which our physical experience develops End quote. i hope i am not confusing the question by an ambiguous use of the word experience what i mean is that to part at any rate of our perceptions the object is presented not clean and separate but immersed in events even when we so to speak take it up to look at it still drips with the stream there will be a stage of perception when it will be both isolated and yet dripping and i repeat we cannot think of a real object there on its own account as thus permanent and separate and at the same time undergoing change and dripping but suppose with idealism that the object only exists when and as it is perceived or recognized suppose that as regards this particular contradiction the duplicity is in our consciousness and that the changing eventful object is the object perceived and remembered and the permanent unchanged object is the object recognized and conceived we shall not have accounted for change or for passing we shall not have solved all the contradictions in the concepts of space-time and of objects and events but at least we shall have pointed the way towards a possible solution end of book one chapter three section two recording by expatriate in bangor maine book one chapter three section three part one of the new idealism by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine book one the critical preparations chapter three some realist theories of perception section three the critical realists part one realism in its later stages has become self-critical it has learned that its postulates are hard to reconcile with the fact that our senses give us conflicting evidence 
that physical objects are not perceived as they really are and that their ultimate nature as disclosed by science affords no explanation of their appearances critical realism is aware that these are downright serious matters very much in the way of a realistic theory of perception unlike new realism it is not extremist it does not turn the whole content of consciousness out of doors on the contrary it draws a curious and very interesting distinction between the content and the object the content the datum what is immediately before consciousness is the critical realists say never the object itself but always an image the logical essence by means of which the object is perceived thus there is no direct perception of objects such as both naive and new realism assume the essence is the mediator between the godlike inaccessibility of the object and the perceiving mind it is as much the instrument of perception as the bodily organism and is as little to be confused with the perceptual object itself the essence is expressly stated to be not an existent either in the sense in which the object is existent out there in space or in any other sense it is to be carefully discriminated from the mental state which is its vehicle the mental state has the status of an existent like any object except that i suppose it would be said to be here in consciousness and not out there in space the pure sense elements of perception are existents and not essences they are mental states contributions of the mind secondary qualities with which it clothes the objects of perception there are some distinctions that simplify the problem of knowledge and there are some that obscure and complicate it it cannot be said that the distinctions of critical realism are of the simplifying and clarifying kind we shall see that on this theory though some bad difficulties are avoided the whole business of perception becomes extremely queer we are no longer troubled with contradictory witnesses to reality since the sole data of perception are the essences quality groups which have their own inalienable character are not existence and therefore do not challenge the objects on that ground since the objects do not come into consciousness at all and since we may suppose that the sense elements do not witness to anything thus compared with the objects the essences are frankly indoor subjective affairs their status is as safe from irrelevant comparison as on any idealistic scheme we have no incompatible existence incompatibilities only arise as between existences in space and time and the essences have no such existence not that critical realists are agreed as to their precise status professors drake santayana rogers and strong maintain that the datum which is always to be discriminated from the mental state which is the vehicle of its givenness is not an existent representing the object Quote, it is simply the essence or character the what of the object known End quote. and always the mental states are existence they may give mental traits feeling traits to the character complex of the datum while to professors sellers lovejoy and pratt the datum is quote, in toto the character of the mental state of the moment and so is an existent though its existence is not given End quote. but these differences need not concern us professor drake trains all the old arguments from incompatibility on naive and new realism alike with deadly effect the position of critical realism is that quote, the existent at a given point of space at a given time never has more than one set of compatible qualities End quote. then what about the alleged incompatibles professor drake will not admit that they arise from differences in relations each supposed incompatible is a downright quality it is what it appears to be but these qualities do not compete with one another on the same plane that is to say of two alleged incompatibles one may be a mere feeling or sensation which is part of the mental state of the perceiver therefore a subjective existent the other may be part of the quality group the logical essence which is really what the object is it is clear that on this theory we are not dealing with two incompatible existents both qualities of the object Professor Drake is not so admirably precise on this point as he is everywhere else, but I think all this may be gathered from his theory as a whole. 
So far, so good. It is when we come to consider the relation of the essences, the not existent data of perception to the existing object, that we realize that we are not much safer than we were before. The data, quote, are character complexes, that is, essences, irresistibly taken in the moment of perception to be the character of existing outer objects. End quote. When we ask what guarantee we have that they are the character of objects, since they are all we've got, we are told that, quote, there never is a guarantee in the moment of perception that they really are the characters of any outer existent. End quote. The guarantee is a purely pragmatic one. Quote, Our instantaneous and practically inevitable belief in the existence of the physical world about us is pragmatically justifiable. This little realm of appearance, that is, what appears, what is given, might conceivably be merely the vision of a mind in an empty world. But we instinctively feel these appearances to be the characters of real objects. We react to them as if they had an existence of their own, Everything is as if realism were true. End quote. This is meant to show that we are not the victims of a series of subjective hallucinations. As we have seen, the essences are not to be confounded with my mental states. The states are existence and the data are not. As we shall see presently, Professor Strong counts secondary and tertiary qualities, sensations and feelings, as might be spots of blue and fits of temper, as states equally mental, thus introducing a further complication. And I gather that all critical realists agree with him. The mental existence make possible the appearance of the essence. If we go and call the data existence, we shall be bestowing existence on our hallucinations, for there are hallucinatory data. Delusion consists in imagining that these exist out there. Here again, in this matter of hallucination, I find critical realism disappointing. For the real datum, the character complex is on the same footing of not existing out there. What is the critical realist going to do about it? He flies to imagination. The character complex of the hallucinatory object is imagined as out there, and we falsely imagine it as existent out there. The character complex of a really existent object is imaginary too, only in this instance we rightly attribute it to a real existent. Quote, These imagined character complexes are our data. Usually some of the traits of the character complex are real, some are merely imaginary. But whether really true or not, they are never found there by a sort of telepathic vision, but are imagined there by a mind. End quote. And you gather that it depends merely on the quality of the imagination, plus our possible reactions, whether they shall count as genuine data or no. Thus, perception is, quote, a sort of imagination, vivid, controlled, involuntary imagination, which is to some extent veridical. End quote. But veridical to what extent and in what instances we have no exact means of knowing. And really, on the theory, we have no means of knowing at all. Imagination is at once the suspect, the witness, and the judge. We have no other. Critical realism distinguishes, much as Locke in the old tradition distinguished, between primary and secondary qualities. It accepts the general verdict which hold that only the primary perceptual qualities are literal characters of objects. And it maintains that, quote, in so far as perception gives us accurate knowledge, it does so by causing the actual characteristics of objects to appear to us. The objects themselves, those bits of existence, do not get within our consciousness. Their existence is their own affair, private and incommunicable. This is all very well, but as most primary qualities, shape, size, extension, and motion, are specially distinguished by their spatial and temporal relations, it is hard to see what their characteristics can have in common with logical essences expressly stated to be not existent, to have no relations in space and time. A queer sort of literalness, this. Again, Professor Drake says, quote, Identical essences can be given by means of very varying mental states. A vivid sensation, a faint sensation, a memory, a conceptual state can be vehicles at different times 
by which one and the same essence can be given. End quote. Now, how on the theory can you possibly tell that it is one and the same? How can you make your leap from existent state to not existent essence? And how can essences be given by qualities which do not belong to them? There is no sense in which the secondary qualities of the mental states can be said to belong, since the essence is the group of primary qualities from which secondary qualities have been excluded. This theory of essence compels us to take our complex data as part existent and part not existent, part mental and part non-mental, which is what Professor Drake said, rightly, I think, we were not to do. That was on page 12. On page 30, he says, quote, We live in the presence of hybrid objects. Existence is really there, but clothed in our mind's eye with the qualities which our mental states put into them. Our data are characters which may be said to be projected, not actually projected, but simply supposed to be out there, imagined out there. Common sense takes it for granted that they are out there and has never grappled with the difficulty of how they are revealed if they are there or what their status is if they aren't there. End quote. And again, it is hard to see how you grapple with the difficulty by saying the projection is imagined and by presenting the content of knowledge as the means to it. You might as well identify our percepts with the physical apparatus of perception. If the content of consciousness is the content, what more do we want? If it isn't, if it is only the means to knowledge, what knowledge have we got? Only the mental state remains indubitably existent and indubitably known. What could subjective idealism wish for more? Professor Pratt's theory does not differ essentially from Professor Drake's. He evidently thinks that the main objections to it are that it involves transcendence and that it makes perception indirect. Idealists will not quarrel with it on the score of transcendence. The real trouble is that it offers as a substitute for the perceptual object a logical essence, which according to Professors Drake, Santayana, Rogers and Strong is non-mental and not existent, and according to Professors Pratt, Lovejoy and Sellers is the total character of an existent mental state a substitute which is not really projected but imagined as out there where the object is. Thus we have absolutely no criterion for judging that our imaginations correspond with reality, and no grounds other than pragmatic for supposing the existence of any object at all. And really, those pragmatic grounds, how can the mere fact that we find it convenient that in the consecrated phrase of pragmatism it works to assume reality, justify us in assuming a reality unperceived, unproved, and otherwise unwarranted. A working hypothesis in the field of experience is one thing, and a pragmatic hypothesis carried into the field beyond experience is another. For the pragmatic test, the fitness, the convenience of working, are all part of my experience, my perceptual content, and have no application to the beyond. My reactions prove nothing. When I see my 53 bus coming along to Piccadilly Circus and adapt my movements to its decreasing state of movement and to its final position of rest, with reference to the curb, when in other words I catch my bus, the bus and its movements and the curb and the circus and my body and its movements are all part of the content of my consciousness at the moment and afford in themselves no possible grounds for the assumption of a real bus and a real circus outside consciousness. The reactions of my fellow passengers do, I admit, appear to give grounds. This is a difficulty for idealism which I hope to dispose of in its proper place, merely remarking that these manifestations of other people are also part of the content of my consciousness, as, indeed, my manifestations are of theirs. But this is not a pragmatic relation. In the logic of pragmatism, the a posteriori cart draws the a priori ontological horse. To return to Professor Pratt, after showing very clearly that the percept is all the datum we've got, and that the percept is not the object, he goes on to say that we do not see the percept, but the object, and that we see it by means of the percept. The object of perception is the object of perception. In seeing my friend, quote, he is the object of my sight, 
I do not see my percept of him. I see him, and I do so by means of my percept. End quote. That is to say, the object is never directly perceived, since it is an outside existent. And the percept is never perceived, since it is the means of perceiving. Yet the percept is the datum, the given content of perception, and yet by means of this unperceived content I perceive. It may be so, but if I have nothing to go on but this imaginary content, I shall never know it. I am shut up with my apparatus of essences, and have no grounds for assuming an object outside them. There is no sense in which I can be said to see or be in any way conscious of that object. And if I am not allowed to perceive my own percepts, it is hard to say what I do perceive. Percepts, Professor Pratt says, quote, are simply my means of perceiving and thoughts my means of thinking, just as the voice is my means of speaking. To insist that I cannot perceive a red house because I have to perceive it by means of my percept is like insisting that I cannot hear the organ because I can only hear the sound, or that I cannot say boo because I have to say it with my voice. End quote. It seems to me that there is some confusion here. I do not perceive by means of my percept in the same sense that I speak by means of my voice. In speaking by means of my voice, I am not affirming the objective existence of voices. I am simply making noises which are the recognized symbols of existence other than voices, and in every respect unlike them. But in perceiving by means of my percept, I am supposed, on the theory, to be affirming the existence of objects in all respects so similar to or correspondent with my percepts that I am said to perceive the very objects themselves. And I contend that from the character of the data at my disposal, I have no business to affirm anything of the sort. Again, to insist that I cannot perceive a red house because I have to perceive it by means of my percept is not at all on all fours with insisting that I cannot hear the organ because I hear only its sound. For in the case of the percept, we have nothing given corresponding to organ while in the case of the organ we have all its other perceptual qualities associated with its sound. Professor Pratt admits the fallibility of knowledge obtained by means of the apparatus of images. Quote, the ultimate nature of reality in itself may be very difficult or even impossible to discover. End quote. And he pleads that our actual knowledge is precisely in this case. But all that critical realism has done so far is to complicate this problem of knowledge further by duplicating it with the old clumsy machinery of images. The only justification for this proceeding being the guarantee of a corresponding reality, a guarantee which is admitted to be impossible. There is no sort of use on any realistic theory for all this imaginary scenery rigged up between consciousness and reality. Nor does Professor Santayana, in his Three Proofs of Realism, carry us much further. He holds the balance between two extremes, the minimum and maximum of realism. The mere innocent presumption that there is such a thing as knowledge, and, quote, the assurance that everything ever perceived or thought of existed apart from apprehension, and exactly in the form in which it is believed to exist, end quote. The problems for critical realism are two, one of the independent and separate existence of the object, one of the literalness and adequacy of knowledge. The problem of existence is concerned with appearance, and that underlying reality to which Professor Santayana boldly restores its old name of substance. This involves relations, so that the problem of existence splits off into two problems one concerning the existence and conditions of substance and appearance, the other concerning the degree of similarity between them, to which the answer of the realist tends to be that their existence is quite distinct and their conditions entirely different, and that, quote, the similarity is great and may even rise to identity of essence, end quote. As we have seen, the critical realist complicates his problem gravely by the introduction of essences, he has in the long run to admit that some appearances at any rate are not similar to, much less identical with, the underlying reality. If you go back as far as the scientific object, a color is not similar to a light wave nor a sound to an aerial vibration. 
so that he is further saddled with the old distinction between primary and secondary or tertiary qualities even if you take the primary qualities only to be essences the secondary and tertiary being mental states you cannot say that they resemble the ultimate physical realities centering round substance and appearances then there will be two perfectly consistent and truly complementary tendencies in critical realism the one tends to separate appearance from substance only in existence the other tends to identify them only in essence the truth according to professor santayana being that they are strictly correspondent and mutually dependent Quote, they hang together and reflect one another like a poet in his works only if arrested and isolated would the material world and the bodily life of animals seem not to involve sensation and thought and not to be involved in them End quote. and once more we ask what criterion have we what guarantee that the appearances of sensation and of thought if separate from substance and existence are identical with it in essence even if the unperceived material world and the bodily life of animals may be taken as equivalent to substance which i doubt we are faced with our old difficulty which was that of identifying the qualities given in sensation and perception with the ultimate elements of matter and their behavior for we can hardly imagine anything more totally dissimilar it is not as if we knew absolutely nothing about those ultimate elements science has at last reduced them to hypothetical electrons to atoms and molecules and their movements and vibrations if you say that these ultimate elements are substance you have the dissimilarity on your hands if you say that they are not substance but the appearances of a reality still more ultimate you have a set of appearances which do not appear you are further off from substance than ever and again you have no evidence to show for your alleged identity of essence critical realism then unites two assumptions Quote, first that knowledge is transitive so that self-existing things may become the chosen objects of a mind that identifies and indicates them second that knowledge is relevant so that the thing indicated may have at least some of the qualities that the mind attributes to it End quote. professor santayana says that these assumptions are instinctive and necessary to the validity of knowledge whereas the truth is that the transitiveness the passage from the external self-existing object to the mind is a necessity created solely by the realistic assumption of separation and externality and the relevance is again the question in dispute on this theory i repeat you can never be certain that your assumption is correct if on the other hand you identify substance with some underlying mind or self and appearances with the content of its consciousness parts or aspects of which content are transmitted to the consciousness of finite selves you have all the transitiveness your instinct can require if it did require it and an indisputable relevance i will admit that our instinct demands relevance you have in fact a direct relevance of consciousness to consciousness without the interpolation of any images or essences which only serve to make this complicated affair more complicated still End of Book 1, Chapter 3, Section 3, Part 1. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Book 1, Chapter 3, Section 3, Part 2. Of the New Idealism by May Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Book One: The Critical Preparations, Chapter Three: Some Realist Theories of Perception, Section Three: The Critical Realists, Part Two. Professor Santayana's three proofs of realism amount to this: One, man as a biological organism adapts his behavior to the assumption that objects are outside him, that is to say, outside his organism. Two even the idealist psychological behavior implies the independent reality of time of other minds and of his own transcendental logic three knowledge involves the external reality of logical essences changeless amid the flux of existence 
the biological proof merely proves that we are conscious of the existence of objects outside our bodies a fact which no idealist would or could deny the psychological proof is valid only as against solipsism the logical proof only as against sensational idealism for the idealist would or should admit the reality of logical essences not external to all consciousness but constitutive of the universe within it the means if critical realism likes to put it that way by which the mind recognizes objects already perceived in what i call the primary block of consciousness professor sellers in knowledge and its categories enters more precisely into the question of separation of existence and identity of essence he insists that quote, mere identification does not meet essential difficulties it must be remembered that in the act of knowledge the idea which gives the content of knowledge the essay intentionale of the scholastics is other than the object of knowledge End quote. yet identity there is it is a logical identity in the sense that the data possess cognitive value professor sellers like professor drake and professor pratt is keenly alive to the difficulty of establishing the relations of passage from and fitness of knowledge to the object it is not done in the moment of perception Quote, only as reflection proceeds is the givenness of content distinguished from knowledge and regarded as the instrument of knowledge End quote. we might even say that this happens only in the reflections of critical realists quote, the physical realm is one we can never intuit as common sense tends to suppose the only realm we can intuit is the realm of data End quote. thus to begin with we must distinguish between knowledge and intuition and further the critical realist holds quote, that we do not infer a realm of existence co-real with ourselves but instead affirm it through the very pressure and suggestion of our experience End quote. and so always at the critical moment when the critical realist is asked to give grounds for his assertion that his ideas and reality tally he puts you off with his dogmatic affirmation that it is so and this after having coolly told you that the givenness of content as not knowledge but an instrument of knowledge is reached by a process of reflection when the idealist's obvious repartee is that his processes of reflection reveal nothing of the sort we may indeed intuit the content of knowledge but if we do not intuit the physical realm along with it neither do we intuit their logical identity and i submit that a bare affirmation has no ground of justification when it rests neither on intuition nor on inference these delicate distinctions between content and object between identity of existence and identity of essence are all very well but how on earth are you to get from one to the other if you may neither intuit nor infer professor seller's method of solving this problem is to add yet another unproved and unprovable affirmation to the rest the affirmation of thinghood you add the category of thinghood and your perception is complete on page a hundred and ninety seven he admits that quote, reflection has discovered that the content with which we automatically clothe these acknowledged realities is subjective End quote. professor drake admits it all the critical realists admit it none of them suggest that the discoveries of reflection are invalid or that any after reflection impugns the subjectivity of this automatic clothing yet on the very next page professor sellers gravely states that the object must be known in terms of the content which is given to the knowing self what could idealism wish for more remember it was stated on page one hundred and ninety five that we do not infer a realm of existence co-real with ourselves we affirm it apparently having affirmed it we go on after reflection to infer that it must be known in terms of the content but the whole process of inference rests on the original baseless affirmation and then again after being told that we do not intuit the physical realm the realm of objects we are thrown back on intuition 
Knowledge, Professor Sellers says, is just the insight into the nature of the object which is made possible by contents which reflect it in consciousness. End quote. And he repeats his statement that the object is known in terms of the content presented to the knowing self. A while back we had the content clothing the object automatically. Now we have the object reflected in the content. I do not want to descend to mere verbal quibbling, but it seems to me that we have here a confusion between two fundamentally different relations of objects reflecting themselves into contents and contents putting their own clothes on objects, of objects taking the initiative and contents taking the initiative, and that this confusion expresses a fundamental ambiguity in the relation, which critical realism has not helped to make clear. And we may ask, if the content, after all, has to be presented, why distinguish between it and the object? What presents it? Not the object for then it would be the content of the object and not a mere instrument of knowing. Quote, the content has cognitive value, end quote. And this is a way of saying that it is, quote, relevant to the object, that it has a sort of revelatory identity with the object, that it contains its structure, position, and changes, end quote. It is implied that there are characteristics which it does not contain, and that those it does contain are not perfectly identical. It has only a sort of revelatory identity. Critical realism is very careful not to commit itself too deeply on this question of identity. Anyhow, we are evidently back again in the old dualism between primary and secondary qualities. Quote, One flower is white and small, another is blue and large, etc., these differences are rightly taken by all to point to differences in the physical object. End quote. But when we ask what is the exact nature of this agreement, we are referred to the total psychological situation. Now the total psychological situation may tell us pretty plainly that there is correspondence of a sort, that there is even a direct connection between the moving molecules of the causal object and the moving molecules of the physical organism. But it does not and cannot tell us of any sort of identity or even of similarity between content and object. Even if we were to grant that primary and secondary qualities are not in the same boat, the utmost possible agreement would be that the structure and position of objects moving or at rest may be supposed really to occupy the same geometrical points of space that they appear to occupy at a given time. Only even so, the image or essence theory saddles us with the insuperable difficulty of objects there in space, and essences or images here in consciousness. And on page 206 we are told in italics that, quote, the critical realist holds that knowledge is a function of the known rather than a peculiar real relation between the knower and the known, end quote. That is to say, the peculiar real relation between object and content presupposes no sort of relation between either and the knower. And yet it was the knower who clothed the object with the subjective qualities of the content, who was related to it as the poet to his work. The fact is, the critical realist is sailing very perilously between realism and idealism. He is trying to get all the advantages of epistemology without its disastrous effects on realism. Critical realism, to do it justice, is only too keenly aware of the danger. Thus, Professor Sellers, faced with the obvious dissimilarity between content and object, says, quote, but we who have given up the sensible physical thing realize that the belief in appearance as a manifestation like the physical thing is misleading, end quote. So that, after all, we are no nearer knowing where we are. One moment we are told that the essence of content and object is identical, that the subject clothes the object with the qualities of the data, and that in seeing by means of our apparatus of percepts, we are really seeing objects, though apparently we may not perceive them. And the next, that to talk of mere likeness between object and appearance is misleading. And again, when it comes to asking plumply and plainly, are the data mental or non-mental, quote, the critical realist agrees with the idealist that the content is mental, 
but strikes his counter-blow by asserting that knowledge is a claim to know an object in terms of this content. The object is known, but not intuited. The content is intuited, but not known. End quote. I confess I cannot see how the idealist is hit by this blow, seeing that it is precisely what he asserts himself. As far as memory is concerned, while the critical realist would, I think, agree with the idealist criticism of the new realist theory, he is in a curious position. He contends that the object of memory no longer exists, but that the claim and content are elements of the present act, so that he is left with a content without an object. When it comes to the nature of the datum, Professor Strong is up to his neck in the familiar incompatibilities. Almost passionately, he reiterates that the datum is not the physical thing. Therefore, the physical thing, quote, can only be either an intellectual construction made on the basis of data or a real existence brought before us by data, end quote. He objects to the word datum, used so freely by the other critical realists, because it suggests that the givenness is given along with the thing. In other words, that we intuit givenness, which involves a relation to the self. He wants his datum clean, cut clear from all the fringes of the self. Therefore, he prefers the word essence alone. There is a purity about essence. It carries no psychological implications. In fact, the persistence with which Professor Strong clears away the psychological fringes seems strangely at variance with the conception of the content as mental and of the mind as clothing the object with its qualities. To Professor Strong, in the case of a physical object, say a face, the content is physical in essence but not in existence. Pain and a fit of temper are not, for example, on the same footing as a face. They are frankly psychological. But the content face is neither psychological nor physical except in essence, but logical. By this time it is clear that this subtle distinction would fairly rule the subject out if critical realism could make up its mind to this drastic action. At first sight, it isn't easy to see how it can deny that the content is psychological and yet assert that it is mental, nor how, if the content is mental in existence, it can prove that the object is physical in existence, nor yet how, still distinguishing between essence and existence, it can prove that the content is physical in essence, since the real nature of the physical object is unknown. Critical realism draws a distinction between what is subjective in the psychological sense and what is subjective in the logical sense. In this latter sense, then, the content is downright subjective. We may appreciate the dangers which have driven critical realism to its conclusions, but our appreciation cannot blind us to the difficulties they give rise to. I do not say that the logical essence of a blue jug or of a smell of fried potatoes is a more staggering conception in itself than the logical essence of deity. And I am not denying the reality of logical essences in their proper place, but I do not think that their proper place is where the jug and the smell are in the world of space and time. On any theory of knowledge or of reality, I do not think that logical essences belong in any sense to space and time. I gather that critical realists do not either, and I also gather that Professor Strong does not regard a pain or a fit of temper as a logical essence. And while I can perfectly well see that a pain or a fit of temper may have a logical essence, out of space and out of time, by virtue of which they figure in logical propositions, I cannot see that a blue jug or a smell of fried potatoes can be a logical essence, seeing that they are in space and time. Professor Strong gets over this difficulty by denying that sense data are in space and time and affirming that only the physical things which the sense data bring before us are in space and time. And I want to know how he knows this about physical things, since his only guarantee is the evidence of data not in space and time. I do not think you could well have any two classes of entities more hopelessly divided in existence and in essence more hopelessly uncorresponding and unrepresentative of each other than entities in space and time and entities timeless and spaceless. 
his denial is also in plain contradiction with the evidence of our percepts which whatever they may not do do at least present themselves as in space and do most certainly occur in time sense data may be in flagrant contradiction with each other they may not agree with any concept of physical nature which science gives us they may for all we know be sheer hallucinations yet they do indubitably appear as visibly or tactually extended or audibly located in space and as spatially related to each other and the dates of their appearing and the order of their appearing are indubitably in time and they are temporally related to each other and if they were not it would be pretty poor data for realism's affirmation of external reality even a pain may be located and a fit of temper occurs in time in a definite relation to other events i simply do not know what professor strong means by his assertion that visual data have no spatial relations to each other here it is in full Quote, the visual data as such are neither here nor there they have no spatial relations to other possible visual data but only spatial relations among their own parts none in short that are not at this moment given End quote. if he means that they are not perceived as visibly related in space to other data not perceived at the moment when they are given this is not saying that they are not so related to other visual data which are perceived at the same time my bookcase is to the right of the fireplace and to the left of the door all the visual content of various data which i have before me at this moment appears to me as spatially and temporally related professor strong says that these data are not so related among themselves as wholes but only their parts and i ask him why not the wholes where separate wholes can be discerned in one block of consciousness and i cannot see how he can deny to the whole what he grants to the parts how a whole whose parts are temporally and spatially related can avoid being itself spatially and temporally related by far the safer line for him to take would be that logical essences have no parts he also denies that they are existences this follows from denying that they are related in space and time and the idealist can have no possible objection in fact by taking this particular line critical realism is playing very obligingly into his hands in order that we may the better realize that a datum is not an existence and remember the idealist is not quarreling with him on this score professor strong insists on the distinction between the datum and the psychic state which is its vehicle by the psychic state he means not the mere psychic fact that we are sensing but the sense element the sensation which we should have supposed to be an element of the sense datum but which now appears as a tertium quid which is in time and perhaps space when the data aren't but as he identifies it with a psychic state it is hard to see how on his theory it can be spatial in fact this appearance of the sense element as a separate psychic entity from the sense datum though it clears the character of the logical essences does not serve to clarify their relations he argues in effect that the psychic state which we have always with us whether we merely feel or whether we perceive is an existent in its own way but affords no grounds for our assuming the existence of the essence otherwise quote, we should have three existences concerned in sense perception the physical thing the state of our sensibility and the essence End quote. this again to avoid multiplication and incompatibility of existence the example he gives as showing most clearly the difference between the perceptual essence and the sensation quote, is that of the after image of the sun projected successively on the thumbnail on the wall of the room and on a mountainside End quote. because he finds that the after image itself retains the same sensible size he argues that the variation in the size of the objects quote, must be something which the after image has as a symbol but not as a sensible fact End quote. i am afraid i cannot see the necessity in the first place i think it may fairly be objected that the after image hasn't these sizes either as symbols or as facts at all any more than it has the projections on the thumbnail the wall and the mountainside 
the sizes belong clearly to the projections and not to the after image they and it are on precisely the same footing and they are in no more peculiar case than the reflection of the sun itself on any distorting or diminishing medium we have here in fact some rather special instances of the relativity of size three sense data in three different contexts clearly professor strong regards the projections as data since he refers to their meaning and so far from the facts being difficult to construe on an idealistic hypothesis i should say they were absolutely damning to professor strong's theory that sense data are not related in space and time if ever there was a glaring instance of spatial and temporal relations it is the relations of that after image and its projections new realism taking them all to be realities in real time and real space is in a still more awkward predicament but this does not make the position a bed of roses for its critics i do not think the objections to his examples which professor strong brings forward in order to refute them are very serious objections but i do think his examples are very serious objections to his theory it must be admitted at once that the arguments against critical realism's view of perception do not apply with equal force to its theory of memory to begin with space and time are not implicated in the same way we are dealing with images which the theory rightly or wrongly assumes to be spaceless and timeless this assumption is clean contrary to that of professor laird and the new realists who regard a memory as tantamount to a perception with its date in the past the memory of the critical realists is the old memory image of tradition reinstated with the complication owing to the assumption that it is the image of an image the idea of an idea professor strong considers that the idea which we have before our minds when we remember is quote, distinct from the mental image visual auditory or other by means of which we conceive it that this mental image alone is a present fact an existence and that the idea is the mere character which we conceive the past fact to have without its existence in short an essence End quote. the idealist has nothing to say against this except that his own alternative theory is not lumbered up with the old machinery of duplicate images he can take the new realist view that in memory we indeed perceive the past thing itself in present time the idealist can do this without telescoping the various real times and real spaces together in an impossible spatio-temporal perspective because he assumes that his consciousness carries past present and to some extent future times and spaces with it consciousness is itself existent in the form of space and time it is precisely in its treatment of space and time that critical realism is most unsatisfactory while in its view of primary and secondary qualities it is dragging philosophy back to where locke left it and playing as locke played into the hands of the idealism that must come after it should be given full credit for its dexterity and skill in dodging the traditional incompatibilities though as we have seen its subtlety lands it in troubles of its own its assumptions in short are reducible to this absurdity we know the reality we can't know by means of knowledge that we haven't got note i am not sure that i understand professor whitehead's method of extensive abstraction i see of course how the system of enclosing squares generates the point instant by converging towards an ideal limit but that is not how it generates the series of point instants you start with a duration and end with point instants to obtain the next point instant you must i imagine slice through the next event and develop another system of chinese boxes whose squares will overlap those of the system you started with but durations are made up of point instants therefore each box will cover an infinitely greater number of point instants than it converges to end note end of book one chapter three Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Book One, Chapter Four, Section One of The New Idealism by Mason Clare. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Book One, The Critical Preparations. 
Chapter Four Antinomies of Space and Time Section One The Antinomies In the theory we have just considered, the antinomies of space and time are supposed to be ruled out in continuity secured intact by a four dimensional system of space times or events. These, as we have seen, are symbolized as packed one inside each other, square within square, diminishing, converging to the point or instant, an ideal minimum or limit which is never reached, and can never be common to all the including durations. That is to say, it will always fall outside the ultimate square. Its perpetual extension beyond the enclosing square of any one duration gives rise to the infinite linear series of instants. Thus, serial time is an abstraction from the system of enclosures. This linear series, with its point-instant correspondence, has been held responsible for the antinomies. It is supposed that within each case, the spatial and the temporal respectively, the vicious contradiction of discreteness in continuity is due to time's character of successiveness imported into space, and the passage from next point to next point. The antinomies of Zeno, Achilles and the tortoise, the arrow, and the three processions, are based on this nextness. Achilles cannot overtake the tortoise because, going from next point instant to next, he cannot possibly cover more than one point at one instant, and the tortoise cannot very well do less. The arrow cannot fly because, going from next point instant to next, it is stationary at each point at each instant. The processions involve a frightful time dilemma. Two of them are moving towards each other past a third procession, which is standing still. They can only go from next point instant to next. There will be a moment when all three will be lined up evenly with each other. But in approaching this position, half of each moving procession will be lined up with half the standing procession in the half time of the total movement. Yet in getting there, each member of the two moving processions will have moved forward one point instant, thus covering successively each point instant of the whole time, so that the half time will be equal to the whole. There will be more time left over than can be accounted for by the positions in space. On the other hand, let the moving processions be in line with the standing procession at the start, and let them depart in opposite directions. At the first instant, the first and last members of the moving processions will be in line with each other. At the second instant, they will be in line with the third member, or next point but one, of the original order. They will each have had to pass the intermediate member or point, but there will be no intermediate instant in which they can have done this. There is not enough time to go round. The antinomies of Kant turn on the discreteness in continuity, the divisibility and indivisibility of space, time, and matter, and on their finiteness and infinity. Thus, the world has a beginning in time and limits in space, because if it hadn't, an eternity of moments and an infinite series of events must have elapsed up to any given moment or event. The beginning of the world would be such a moment or event, but on the theory of an infinite series it could never happen since such a series is never closed. The same thing will hold good of the infinite synthesis of points in space. Therefore the world must have a beginning in time or space. But the world cannot have a beginning in time and space, because if it had, it would be preceded by an empty time and an empty space. And in empty time it is not possible for anything to happen, since no part of such time would have any determining quality of existence and the world consists of objects standing in spatial relations to each other, but in such a space it would have no correlate, and thus it could not be. Therefore the world has no beginning in space and time. Again, every concrete substance consists of simple parts, because if it didn't, supposing you could think away the synthesis, nothing at all would be left. And supposing you can't think away the synthesis, you can't think away the parts which are put together. Therefore, every concrete substance consists of simple, indivisible parts. But no concrete substance can consist of simple, indivisible parts, because if it did, it must consist of as many parts as there are parts of space, and space doesn't consist of simple parts, but of spaces. 
that is to say if space is infinitely divisible matter is therefore no substance can consist of simple indivisible parts the absolute necessity is laid on us therefore of qualifying space time and matter by contradictory characteristics in one and the same relation and at one and the same moment it is not open to us to say that space time and matter are finite divisible and discrete at one moment and in one relation and infinite indivisible and continuous at another moment or in another relation for the character of space and time is that all spaces are alike at all times and all times alike in all spaces all parts of space being spaces and all parts of time being times and the relation in question is a relation of those parts and their wholes therefore these contradictions are inherent in the very concept of space time and matter end of book one chapter four section one recording by expatriate in bangor maine book one chapter four section two of the new idealism by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine book one the critical preparations chapter four antinomies of space and time section two some modern solutions now hegel like professor whitehead and professor alexander contended that the antinomies arising from our deplorable habit of abstracting space and time from their context in the cosmic process only unlike professor alexander and professor whitehead he conceived the cosmic process as the movement of thought in the triple dialectic thus discreteness and continuity are taken up in the higher concept of quantity but as discreteness breaks out again violently in the quantum the antinomy can hardly be said to be disposed of all that the hegelian dialectic does is to bring its warring elements a stage nearer to the ultimate all-reconciling peace of consciousness and this is a bit too late for physics and for mathematics which have to deal with space and time and matter now it is too late for realism to realism the antinomies are peculiarly disastrous if motion is to be real in a real space and real time it must not at any stage involve self-contradiction therefore modern realists fly to the solution said to be provided by the cantor didikin definition of the compact series nextness it is supposed is the sole ground of the contradiction do away with nextness to find continuity in terms which exclude nextness and the antinomies are solved the cantor didikin definition of the compact series does away it is said with nextness between any two points or instants there is an infinity of points or instants and i gather that professor whitehead's series of event particles is similarly compact compactor since he stratifies them in four dimensions the struggles of various philosophers to get rid of the antinomies are both amusing and instructive it can only be done by denying flatly the serial character of time or by distinguishing between real time which is qualitative and continuous and unreal time which is quantitative and discrete in which past present and future are measured off by the falling of the sand in the hourglass by the movement of the shadow on the dial of the hands on the face of the clock this is monsieur bergson's way meanwhile serial time past present and future he calls spurious time a bastard time which is really spatial real time immeasurable time is durée and it is purely qualitative and non-successive when we come to professor alexander's space-time we shall see that it is precisely the time which is spatial which is real and that pure non-spatial time is an abstraction and a contradiction time and space taken apart being discrete and taken together continuous but he agrees with professor bergson in regarding time as stuffing for the interstices of space and in denouncing serial time 
altogether serial time has a bad time of it among vitalists pragmatists and realists professor montague one of the least dogmatic of new realists will have none of it professor boudin a pragmatist on a cosmic scale transcending mere human behavior will have none of it here is professor montague he rejects utterly all solutions of the antinomies but two the relational theory and the punctiform theory and in these he finds serious defects those who swear by the relational theory deny that time and space can be thus divided into instants with no duration and points with no extension they say that these are intellectual abstractions with no real existence and therefore no grip on real objects given with their motions and perception space and time are relations between events so far professor montague is at one with the upholders of the event theory but he objects to their depreciatory view of points and instants as unreal what he calls the punctiform theory is that theory of the compact series which we have been considering as developed by mr bertrand russell according to professor montague's view of mr bertrand russell's view quote, the arrow never does move from one position to the next it is at one position at one instant and it is at the next position at the next instant and that is all there is to its motion i think mr bertrand russell would say it never is at any next position at any next instant because in a compact series there is no nextness but that it flies along the stretch of the infinite number of points in an infinite number of instants professor montague does not deny the reality of the points and instants nor their serial character but he demands rightly i think a thread to hold them together and he has hit upon the brilliant idea of a composite theory the double aspect theory which shall combine the merits of the relational and punctiform views without their defects and he develops his theory with brilliance we must have the points but there is no reason why we should not have the relations too Quote, a spatial line truly contains an actual infinity of points but by themselves those points could never compose the line all points in the series if they are to constitute a line must stand to each other in the relation of besideness or to the right and left of without the points the line could not exist without the relations between the points they could never constitute a line End quote. and the same holds good of time quote, just as the points of space must be related by being beside one another so the instants of time must be before and after one another relations of succession are as truly elements as the instants themselves End quote. we have then the relation of besideness for space and of succession for time and their correlation for motion quote, a moving body besides involving a series of point instant correlations involves equally a series of beside succession correlations the first correlations exhibit motion as a series of occupancies of points through a continuum of instants the second correlation exhibits motion as a series not of occupancies but of slips or from two relations of transition which together constitute an uninterrupted and unitary slide the occupancy answers to our conception of space-time and the slide to what is given in perception and we are supposed to have thus made the best of both worlds but have we if we are to give to caesar the things that are caesar's the occupancy to conceptual space-time and the slide to the space of perception we are no better off than we were before when we still knew that bodies in actual experience do apparently move in an uninterrupted and unitary slide and are not perceived as occupying successive points to satisfy the requirements of the double aspect theory we ought also to be able to say both that bodies are perceived as occupying in succession the points of the line they move along and are conceived as moving from point to point at instant to instant in a slide so long as points and instants remain discrete 
and Professor Montague sees very clearly that the compact series does not do away with their discreteness, you cannot get a continuum out of the relation of besideness and the relation of succession, or the relations of besideness and succession taken together. In either case, the relation is only another expression of the discreteness. This is shown very glaringly in the case of time, and in Professor Montague's answer to the question, quote, if a body at each instant of the time of its motion is in one and only one position in space, when can it move from one position to another? The body can move from one position to another when one instant succeeds to another. End quote. Observe that it is the relation of succession which is supposed to have done the trick. To the obvious objection that when is itself an affair of instants, Professor Montague replies that, quote, the time when one instant succeeds to another is a perfectly real time, though it is not itself any instant, just as the space where one point is beside another is a perfectly real space, though it is not itself any point, End quote. It seems to me that there are two bad fallacies here. You cannot draw a distinction between the time when a thing succeeds and a time with instants. If it is a perfectly real time, it will have instants. And if a perfectly real space points, and the antinomy will have broken out again. And how can an object move in the relation of besideness or the relation of succession? I doubt if even common sense would be absurd enough to maintain that time is made up both of instants that succeed each other and of the succeeding of those instants. For time is not the succeeding, though the succeeding is in time. You cannot treat the relations of space and time as if they were times and spaces. Professor Montague says himself that they are not. Quote, no more is a relation between two brothers itself a brother not even an infinitesimally small brother. End quote. And he does not strengthen his case when he adds that it is as real a constituent of brotherhood as are the brothers related. For in the first place, the relation is not a constituent of brotherhood, it is brotherhood, just as succession and besideness are simply succession and besideness. And in the second place, it is not the reality of succession that is in dispute, but the reality of motion through purely serial or successive time. A body moves, if it moves at all, in space and time, and not in the relations of besideness and succession. Moreover, a body in the relation of besideness is a stationary body. Professor Boudin's philosophy is based on a kind of inspired physics, in which energies and energy patterns are the ultimate realities. There are hierarchies among these entities such that the universe may be conceived as a stratified system of energies working on higher and higher levels. The lower strata are not so strictly closed, but that when on any level the special energy of that level has done its work, new energy streams down into it from the next higher level. On this theory, the process of evolution is not a simple unfolding from within outward, but a combined movement of impulse downward and inward, and of expansion upward and outward. The flooding in of higher energy onto lower levels checks the tendency to degradation of energy on each, and gives the cosmos that series of forward and upward shoves which keeps it going. Thus, life enters the inorganic world, and consciousness, the world of life, just in time to save them respectively from the degradation and ultimate disappearance of their forms. In so far as Professor Boudin's pragmatism is on the grand cosmic scale, it is fairly safe from the reproach of parochialism. But the high purpose and wide sweep, the brilliance and fascination of his performance, must not be allowed to blind us to the inherent inadequacy of pragmatism as a solution of ultimate problems nor yet to certain defects in his special theory of time. And it is his theory of time that more immediately concerns us here. That theory is so curious and in many respects so original that it should not be overlooked in any survey of the philosophy of space and time. First of all, Professor Boudin states the following antinomy of serial time. Quote, 
If you assume your time series to be real, then you have the coexistence of an indefinite number of real exclusive moments claiming the same space, for each moment of time claims the whole of concrete perception with its dimensions. But reality cannot be both one and many in the same respect, hence reality becomes impossible. But if the time series is regarded as ideal, then we have an indefinite number of descriptions of judgments, each exclusive of the other, and each referring to the same reality at the same time. Hence, our descriptions or judgments claiming to be diverse and yet of one reality, in the same respect are contradictory and truth becomes impossible. End quote. His solution is, quote, to regard time as non-serial or prior to series, and to regard series as a derivative construction. End quote. There are, I think, several objections to this theory. To begin with, the solution itself involves the contradiction of regarding non-serial time as prior to anything. And if time is not serial in the sense of successive, then all time is one time, one now, and the universe stands still. Motion in space will be impossible because there will be no time for its successions to go into. Again, Professor Boudin says that, quote, space, eternity, the simul system of significance, must be considered as derivative in relation to the time process, which ever looks upon itself anew under the same formal limitations. End quote. You may ask how a spatial system is to be derived from constellations of objects which presuppose space, or how it can be derivative in relation to the time process when, so far from space and time being identical in meaning, they are antithetical. If in relation to means in contradistinction from, how can the spatial system be derivative in contradistinction from the time process which was said to be derivative to? And how can a time process be non-serial, non-successive? And a process which ever looks upon itself anew under the same formal limitations sounds uncommonly like succession somehow creeping in. Again, quote, time is the negative property which makes all systems unstable, end quote. This because it reduces them to the past and future to the ideal constructions of memory and anticipation. But Professor Boudin would not be driven to this view of the instability of all events, save the present, if, like a good realist, he regarded memory and anticipation as a perceiving of real objects in a real time, or if, like a good idealist, he brought time with all its events into the one comfortable fold of conscious experience. On either theory, both systems are relatively stable, while on a theory of non-serial time, the present which he relies on will exist at the expense of the past and future, and the past and future at the expense of the present, in an impossible and suicidal now. Professor Boudin's correlations of space-time are the exact opposite of Professor Alexander's. While Professor Alexander sees time breaking up and dividing space, and space giving its own continuity to time, filling up the gaps in time, Professor Boudin sees space as, quote, a system of coexistent series, whereas time is non-serial, end quote. Consequently, the function of time is to give continuity of motion to space. Quote, without the negation or passing of time, space would fall asunder into discrete positions. Time is bound up with the fluent or continuity aspect of our world, whereas space is bound up with the diversity or habit aspect, the serial aspect. End quote. If we choose to admit the necessity of Professor Boudin's view and the equal necessity of Professor Alexander's, there will be a very neat little antinomy here too. But I am inclined to think that Professor Alexander has it and that Professor Boudin's view of time is comparatively private and perverse. He maintains further that whereas time, quote, conditions the arising of spatial series, is involved in the ratio fiendi of space, space, as a system of relations on the other hand, conditions the knowing of time, is the ratio cognoscendi of time, end quote. This sounds like a contradiction. 
but only if we persist in regarding time as serial. If you ask how non-serial time can account for spatial series, the answer is that spatial series are not successive but coexistent. Professor Boudin takes a static view of series, but combined with his view of time as non-successive, it makes motion more impossible than ever. We shall see how his solving concept of non-serial time works if we examine his theory of time as causality. As he started with the antinomies of serial time, he now starts with the antinomies of causality. Cause and effect cannot be the same or nothing would happen. You would have one unchanging fact. Cause and effect cannot be different because then they would be two facts and causality would lie outside them. Mechanics reduces cause and effect to static equations of mass and position. There is no process and therefore no time factor. Logic reduces causality to a sort of static position within the whole. In reciprocity nothing passes, but cause and effect, so to speak, take in each other's washing. We have to assume in causality a mysterious something over and above that somehow does the trick and which is not cancelled out in the equation. Professor Boudin asks, can time be so completely excluded? He cannot agree with Kant that some time sequences are not causal. Does he mean that time is this something over and above? That it creeps in, dividing cause from effect? Then he is thrown back on his first antinomy. Again, quote, Time is that element in reality which makes all our descriptions relative, and that is precisely what we mean in the last analysis by chance. End quote. It may be questioned whether this is precisely what we mean by relativity. Meanwhile, it is clear that Professor Boudin regards time as equivalent to chance. Time then is chance, but, quote, the concept of causality involves the idea of connection. It implies the concept of habit, as well as that of chance or time, such habit or uniformity on the part of nature, as realizes expectancy. End quote. And behold, a new and devastating antinomy. Quote, Make uniformity or law absolute, and the time element vanishes. Causality becomes lost in mechanical reciprocity or ideal system. End quote. Incidentally, such uniformity, quote, makes consciousness impossible. If again you emphasize the chance or time aspect, you make any uniformity of law or necessary connection impossible. End quote. His conclusion is not exactly a solution. It is, of course, pragmatic. And when did pragmatism solve any ultimate problem? Causality is a relative and approximate affair. It is good intentioned. Quote, Causality to the end means to deal with real process, but it never does. End quote. It, quote, marks the struggle of the self to synthesize or unify the process of experience, end quote. Thus you have a subjective attempt at unity relating to an objective process. But why process? And how a unity when time disintegrates the elements of all sequences? And I do not know what Professor Boudin means by that ambiguous word marks. He says it, the self presumably, quote, succeeds in this attempt at unification only at the expense of ignoring the very process aspect of existence which it means to explain. Causality thus ceases to be real causality and becomes a timeless category. End quote. This antinomy bursts out again as freedom and necessity when causality appears in the form of consciousness of will. And again, Professor Boudin throws the weight of his argument into the scale of chance. He identifies freedom with chance and chance with time because, quote, wherever there is real process, where events happen, there we have chance. Time and chance, used in this ultimate sense, are identical. End quote. He goes on. Is it true, then, that chance is objective and necessity subjective or vice versa? Neither is true. Both are subjective meanings. End quote. Then is causality a subjective meaning that we give to time? How can this be if wherever there is real process, there we have chance? 
or is chance a subjective meaning that we tack on to real process if so how about time if time is chance there is no real time and observe this sense is ultimate we cannot get back of it to something that will restore reality to time it seems to me that this to say the least of it is a very compromising position for a realist and i don't see how professor boudin is to explain it in the end there turns out to be a sort of social or pragmatic necessity for necessity and for chance necessity so that the course of nature and of social nature may be predictable chance so that experience may not become stereotyped by habit but that new adjustments may arise Quote, causality thus affords a synthesis of chance and necessity End quote. this is all very well but if experience be once tainted with subjectivity at its source i do not see how any pragmatic explanation can save it for realism take uniformity alone uniformity is uniformity of sequence and sequence is of events in time but time is chance and chance is subjective the new unexpected events professor boudin has already handed over to chance which is time so where does real process come in again quote, real process and real futurity lie alike outside the field of scientific description End quote. so that so far as necessity and chance relate to future needs and pragmatic readjustments they cannot be scientifically described we can only say present experience being what it is past events were so made as to be capable of adjustment to this present which was once their future and at this rate in spite of uniformity nothing would be really predictable we could only prophesy after the event all these direful results follow from professor boudin's pragmatic inability to make up his mind between realism and idealism they show what might have been expected the insufficiency of pragmatism in dealing with any ultimate category such as time the case is worse if we fall back upon professor boudin's conclusion that time is prior to serial construction that our serial positions are a posteriori abstractions ideal constructions and that process is prior to ideal construction how can process be prior to serial positions how can process proceed without serial positions if time is not a succeeding if time is also duration yet all succession is in time and of time if time were all one all pure duration with no serial positions no instance before and after events would happen just as at any old time and one time would be as good as another the same event might be happening all the time or all events might be happening in any one time in fact no events would be happening in any sense of sequence which is process supposing them to happen at all nobody would know they would happen or whether they had happened events would be unrecognizable and unpredictable it is not serial time that destroys the uniformity of nature but time credited with an unnatural duration i cannot but think that in identifying time with chance professor boudin fails to distinguish between time and events in time and that the same confusion underlies his treatment of the antinomy of coexistent simultaneity and succession he seems to me to be further mixing up one kind of order in space which is purely simultaneous and static with the order of events in time and the double order of events in time and space the occupation of successive positions which are not only purely successive but owe their successiveness to their time character the sense in which professor boudin holds that all series are static is not as he thinks a real but an ideal sense it is consciousness that keeps the members of a series together holding down each one in its place so that all are known as members of a series a series taking place whether in consciousness or outside it is essentially an affair of before and after and in its temporal aspect irreversible it is professor boudin's process in the making certainly series and order themselves involve ideal construction and presuppose time as a datum if by series and order you mean the series and order of events in time even the series and order of instants in time 
presuppose the time of which they are instants, just as the series and order of objects in space presuppose the series and order of their positions. These again presuppose the space in which they are positions, space-time or point instants being just as ideal or as real as you choose to take them. And Professor Boudin's perverse and peculiar theory of time lands him in a still more perverse and peculiar theory of number. He says, quote, It is not true that each moment in history includes the significance of the preceding moments in the way each step in this number series includes the previous. Old age does not include childhood and youth in the way that three includes one or two. This is due to the fact that the number series is constructed in conformity to voluntary purpose, expresses a formal law of the activity of the self, whereas the concrete historic series involves involuntary elements, must conform to certain objective data. This involuntary and uncertain aspect of history is due partly to the creeping in of time and partly to the pluralistic character of the world. End quote. You would have thought that if ever there were a construction that bore no earthly relation to voluntary purpose, that was a thing apart, and on any realistic theory utterly apart from the activity of the self and beyond its control, it was a number series, and that the way that three includes one and two was a way of iron necessity. You would have thought that, so far from time creeping in to upset our calculations, all our calculations, even number itself, were based on the order of instants in time. You would have thought that if there was a series in which voluntary action tended to make most things exciting and uncertain, it was the historic series, and that if anything tended to subdue this excitement and correct this uncertainty, it was the creeping in of time. I do not know the whence and whither of my existence, but I do know that within its mortal time limit the indubitable certainties are dates, all past and present and some future dates. I do not know whether I shall make this book 300 or 350 pages long, nor whether anybody will be rash enough to publish it. But I do know that if my present time rate and time length of writing continue, I shall finish it in time for publication in the autumn. I know how much time will elapse between certain events, for example, my departure from King's Cross and my arrival at Edinburgh. I know that, short of unforeseen catastrophe, I shall breakfast at nine o'clock tomorrow, and that, even if unforeseen catastrophe arises, time will have no more to do with it than to fix its date and thus render its uncertainty certain. You may even say it is just this element of temporal succession, of ruthless before and after, that in time reveals the necessity of events. I can go forwards and backwards in time, and my memories and anticipations will be precise and certain, very much according to the precision and certainty of the time element in them. Thus time confers fully as much certainty on experience as space. True, an unknown future event will have to happen, if it happens at all, at some moment in time uncertified but it will also probably have to happen in uncertified space too, so that space will so far be every bit as chancy. Chancier, for not all events that happen need happen in space, though they must happen in time. And this spatial consideration makes it clear that chance refers to events and existences themselves and not to time. True, the screen of time separates and conceals from us the face of future events. True, the unforeseen comes out of time like a bolt from the blue. But it is not time, but some other unseen complex of events that shoots the bolt. Chance is not in any sense causal. It is a name for our ignorance of connections and sequences, just as necessity is a name for our ignorance of conditions. Though temporary, it is no more temporal than a bishop's blasphemy or any other unlooked-for happening in time. I do not think that any antinomy is solved by denying the serial character of time taken in itself, or by calling time chance an absolute dynamic non-being. This view leads ultimately to the denial of all truth and to the pragmatic criterion. Quote, 
this absolute non-being is forced upon us we have seen by the instability of our universe including the universe of truth it is invented to account for passing away and novelty we need a negative property as well as a positive property to make change possible End quote. i think it is professor boudin who has forced on himself and invented the absolute non-being of time through his refusal to admit consciousness as the continuum of time rather than face the dismal consequences he is driven to his pragmatic theory of truth Quote, its dependence upon the larger demands for life and its subordination if need be to this demand End quote. we shall see that another deduction can be drawn from the analysis of space-time whatever else truth may be it is truth and independent of life and our demand end of book one chapter four section two recording by expatriate in bangor maine book one chapter four section three of the new idealism by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine book one the critical preparations chapter four antinomies of space and time section three the compact series considered professor boudin's theory so far from affording a solution leaves us with the antinomies in all their nakedness on our hands we are still haunted by the ghost of serial time that ghost mr bertrand russell says has been laid by the contour didican definition of the compact series the infinite continuum let us look again at this definition undeterred by its mathematical prestige and see whether it really does provide an unbroken continuum such as would solve the kantian antinomies and enable zeno's processions to meet his arrow to fly and his achilles to overtake the tortoise between any two points in space or any two instants in time there is an infinite number of points or instants the catch of the antinomies we remember lay in the relation of nextness in the point instant correspondence no possible increase of velocity will take you farther than the next point at one instant or quicker than one instant to the next point so that there can be no movement swift or slow only a disconnected series of stations at points there cannot even be successive occupations of points in the series since the disconnection is such that between points there is no space and between instants no time there is nothing to bridge the gaps now the contour didican definition does away with nextness if between points a and b there is an infinite number of points if between instants a prime and b prime there is an infinite number of instants b and a and a prime and b prime will not respectively be next each other and if you say the same of any two points no two points will ever be next each other you have bridged the gap between the finites with infinity you can do the same with event particles and so ensure on professor whitehead's theory the continuity of events at first sight i admit it looks as if the compact series had done the trick and as if the definition excluded contradiction certainly you will never get anything closer than space and time packed with all those infinities of points and instants and so long as you fix your attention on the points and instants without considering their relations and conditions you cannot escape this conclusion as a matter of fact you have only exchanged the relation of nextness for the relation of betweenness if indeed you have got rid of it at all and a definite condition the existence of a and b or a prime and b prime for an indefinite one any two points or any two instants if there is no betweenness you cannot shovel in your infinities betweenness constitutes as definite a gap as nextness and for every two points or instants or event particles you will have an infinity of betweennesses that is to say you have not avoided discreteness 
you have still just as much discreetness as continuity nor will you really have avoided nextness to be sure a definite a and b or p and q or v and w will no longer be next each other but some indefinite point instant x will still be next some indefinite point instant y and by raising their number to infinity you have only multiplied nextness and discreteness and there is another fatal property of the compact series it excludes infinitesimals you cannot therefore say that you are approaching any point by distances infinitely small the idea of quantitative measurable distance is ruled out and with it the idea of any approximate continuity between any two points or instants you have all those infinities of points or instants so mark what happens in the case of achilles instead of a simple contradiction you have a dilemma achilles will still be unable to overtake the tortoise because of nextness camouflaged as betweenness neither will he be able to get from point a to b in instance a prime and b prime at all because a is divided from b by an infinite number of points and a prime and b prime by an infinite number of instants to say that he can do it in an infinite number of instants means that he can never actually do it neither can the tortoise so that once start them moving achilles and the tortoise can never never stop but here is the dilemma neither can they start for an infinite number of points removes their indefinite starting point x from that indefinite point y which would be the first step in their progress if progress there could be and as their starting point x is similarly removed from any preceding point w they never can have moved at all but must have existed and must continue to exist on x throughout all eternity and goodness only knows how they got there the same things will apply to the movements of the arrow and the processions and to the event particles of professor whitehead's world and the kantian antinomies will remain unsolved though they must be stated in a slightly different form thus the world has a beginning in space and time because if it hadn't it would be separated from any point instant here and now by an infinite number of spaces and of times and could have no existence at any one point instant the world has neither beginning nor end in space and time because if it had at any point instant here and now it would be separated from its end and its beginning by an infinite number of spaces and an infinite number of times by far the nearest approach to a solution is provided by professor alexander's correlations of space-time but professor alexander's theory requires a long chapter to itself Note professor boudin's theory of time is only a small part of his brilliant contributions to evolutionary realism it should be clearly understood that his general theory does not stand or fall by it and cannot be touched by any criticisms of this point alone end of book one chapter four section three recording by expatriate in bangor maine book one chapter five section one part one of the new idealism by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine book one the critical preparations chapter five space time and deity section one space time part one i do not see why the devout idealist should not conceive an admiration for professor boudin's theory of evolution nor admit the momentary temptation to surrender to professor whitehead and wallow in the comfort of his concept of nature elsewhere i have spoken of the irresistible fascination of mr bertrand russell's pluralistic realism and confessed to something like remorse for certain inevitable disagreements with professor bergson and william james I am increasingly aware of the risks which attend this adventure of attacking new realism even now i cannot get over my fear that professor whitehead's mathematics may yet do something to me that i shouldn't like i do not feel in precisely the same way 
that Professor Alexander may be concealing himself in the fourth dimension with a deadly battery of equations. And yet, the idealist who sets out to refute him stands in even greater danger of being converted to realism. At moments, for example, when he is exhibiting the correlations of space-time or the stupendous unfolding of his deity, you are almost overwhelmed by the temptation to forsake all and follow him. Not because of any comfort that he gives you. The encounter with space-time and deity is the most thoroughly uncomfortable, the most upsetting and dislocating experience that the devotee of idealism could well undergo. There has been nothing like it since the outbreak of Kant's critique of pure reason, nothing to compare with Professor Alexander's work, but the work of the greatest system-makers, of Spinoza, of Kant, of Hegel. For this is the first time in the history of philosophy that realism has got itself built into a system. Mr. Bertrand Russell has given us brilliant essays in realism. So have Dr. Moore and Professor Broad. We owe it to Professor Whitehead that the prolegomena to any future metaphysics have been settled with scientific authority and precision. These four have done more to set realism going than any living philosopher beside Professor Alexander, but they have not aimed at building realism up into a great system. And Professor Alexander's is a great and very perfect system, close-linked, creating an almost perfect illusion of inevitableness, and, as a sheer piece of philosophic architecture, exquisite in its proportions. It is all one. Solid block on solid block, no untidy excrescences that refuse to fall into line. When you have got over the incredible surprise of it, the psychological effect is one of almost complete intellectual satisfaction. Professor Alexander knows how to convey the passion of its metaphysical adventure. He has passages that fairly vibrate, and it is hard even for the devotee of idealism to resist his appeal. Space, time, and deity is a new and beautiful thing in philosophy, hence the absorbing interest and the excitement. It is, unlike other realisms, a philosophy of evolution, while it agrees with all of them in keeping mind out of the essential process. Professor Alexander denies that mind is in any way an ultimate or a unique reality. Half the interest and excitement come from wondering how on earth he is going to get along without it. For again, unlike many realists, Professor Alexander does more than merely affirm that the world exists independently of mind and, up to the actual appearance of consciousness, has been evolved without it. He is not content with the affirmation, the assurance that it is so, nor with the irresistible feeling that it must be so, nor yet with the pragmatic belief that it is right for life and conduct that it should be so. Most realists fight very shy of explaining in detail how it actually came to be so. Even Professor Whitehead's constructions begin and end with four-dimensional geometry. But Professor Alexander shows us the process as it may be supposed to have actually happened. He builds his universe, or rather, he records its building, from the simplest elements up to the moment of mind's emergence on the scene and after. For henceforth, mind is not to be kept out. It takes its part as one, though only one bit of the whole complex. The simplest, ultimate elements are space and time. To these, all things, life and mind included, are reducible without residue. Not to space and time as separate entities, but to space and time taken together. For space and time are not really two entities, but two aspects of one entity. Space and time by themselves are unreal abstractions from the one indivisible reality which is space-time. Space-time is the a priori stuff from which all things are made, the universal matrix in which matter crystallizes and from which when it has reached a certain appropriate complexity the empirical qualities emerge to be followed in their turn, when they too are suitably compounded, first by life, then by consciousness. Within the one reality of space-time, time is the restless element which drives space to generation. The world is begotten by time out of space. Matter is space-crystallized, and time is its motion, and its motion again is generation. 
it is the restlessness of time which causes new things empirical quality and life and mind or spirit to emerge and the process does not end here time's restlessness which is infinite sweeps mind and spirit onward till their new complexity breaks out in the form of deity which is a new thing not mind or spirit or consciousness but higher than they it causes deity itself to flower in forms of higher and higher perfection in this process deity is evermore ahead and the world with its accomplished forms evermore behind so that deity is and remains a nisus a perpetual straining for perfection an everlastingly unrealized ideal now at first sight it looks as if the theory provided at least three opportunities for the idealist to put his foot down and protest that such things cannot be you cannot except by some miracle conjure quality out of unqualitied matter nor life out of non-living matter nor consciousness out of unconsciousness to say nothing of non-spiritual deity out of spirit but i think if you have once given in to the initial assumption of the crystallization of matter from pure immaterial space-time you need hardly cavil at the rest once grant the initial assumption and the rest of the system is a matter of such careful dovetailing that the idealist will find it hard to get his knife in anywhere and prize it apart i do think that the alleged emergence of quality or life or mind is miraculous but i do not think it is more miraculous than the emergence of matter from pure space-time the whole system is founded on the correlations of time and space so that there is no way of upsetting it unless you can first of all show that if you assume nothing but space-time these correlations are impossible you have in short to restore the antinomies if you can and i think you can i do not say that the theory cannot be refuted on the higher levels but this will not be the shortest or the surest way that its vulnerable points lie round about the alleged continuity is shown by the care professor alexander has taken to safeguard this issue observe that the whole process which ends or rather never does end in deity begins with pure space-time we start on a level where even matter and motion are not yet obviously if space and time contain insoluble contradictions it will be impossible to evolve out of them a real universe so first of all professor alexander has to solve the antinomies of space and time they arise he maintains only if we take space and time separately and are solved if we take them as they are in experience together we have to realize quote, that space is in its very nature temporal and time spatial now if time existed in complete independence and of its own right there could be no continuity in it if it were nothing more than bare time it would consist of perishing instants instead of a continuous time there would be nothing more than an instant a now which was perpetually being renewed but time would then be for itself and for an observer a mere now and would contain neither earlier nor later you would have thought that whatever it might be for itself for an observer with all his faculties time would not be a mere now but that assuming the possibility of an observer of pure time earlier and later past and present would be held together in his memory and the future with them in his anticipation but no professor alexander says that memory will not help us here Quote, for memory cannot tell us that events were connected which have never been together End quote. To be sure, in actual experience, the observer always has a background of space to mark time off against, as it were. But since a mere background may be conceived as existing independently of time, I take it that Professor Alexander means considerably more than that if time is to be spatial. And he is in fact assuming the possibility of a pure time without any observer. We shall see whether taking space as time without consciousness or memory removes these difficulties meanwhile observe that time and space are at any rate together in perception 
and are only divided by an intellectual process of abstraction. Again, quote, if therefore the past instant is not to be lost as it otherwise would be, or rather since this is not the case in fact, there must needs be some continuum other than time which can secure and sustain the togetherness of past and present, of earlier and later. This other form of being is space. End quote. The same thing holds good of space. Space without time would be a mere blank. In such a space there would be no distinction of parts, no distinct bodies and no motion of bodies. Quote, For space taken by itself in its distinctive character of a whole of coexistence has no distinction of parts. As time, in so far as it was temporal, became a mere now, so space so far as merely spatial becomes a blank. There must therefore be some form of existence, some entity not itself spatial, which distinguishes and separates the parts of space. This other form of existence is time. End quote. As it was space that, enduring throughout all the instants of time, united them in a continuum of time, so time that cuts across this blankness of space divides it up into spaces. It is time that drives space on to connect with other spaces in a continuity. Yet it is also time which breaks up space and makes it infinitely divisible. We are to understand that space holds down the moments of time as they pass and keeps the past and future together with the present. But does it? For all its spaciousness, space cannot hold down more instants than one at a time. The past has gone from it. Its grip on the future has not yet begun. Nor should we give in too readily to the statement that space as pure coexistence has no distinction of parts. Coexistence is juxtaposition of points, and I cannot see how its points are to be conjured away from space in the mere absence of time. Only when you begin to move about among them can you talk of time discriminating the points of space which after all only means that it takes time to get from one point to another. But getting from one point to another is the very opposite of coexisting, inasmuch as a point can only occupy one position at a time. Let us go back to space-time. Quote, Without space there would be no connection in time. Without time there would be no points to connect. End quote. Not only no discrimination of points, you see, but no points to discriminate so much for coexistence in space. Quote, it follows that there is no instant of time without a position in space, and no point of space without an instant of time. I shall say that a point occurs at an instant, and that an instant occupies a point. There are only point instants or pure events. In like manner there is no mere space or mere time, but only space-time or time-space. End quote. But this conception is purely provisional. If there were nothing but this one-to-one, -one, point instant correspondence, both time and space would be broken up and be neither successive nor continuous. There would be nothing but a point now and a point now and a point now without relation or connection, both perishing as they were born. Quote, if the point corresponded uniquely to the instant, it would share the character of the instant and space would cease to be the space we know." End quote. For on Professor Alexander's view, it is the permanence of the point, its repetition throughout many instants, which secures it from perishing utterly. Its self-identical presence at this moment is the witness to the moment which has passed. This is evident, but I do not find it quite so easy to follow Professor Alexander when he goes on to argue that if the instant corresponded uniquely to the point, if it never occupied more than one point, quote, time would share the character of space, be infected with bare blank extendedness, would in fact be mere extension and cease to be the time we know, which is duration in succession. In order that it should be in its own nature successive, and so be able to discriminate points in space, the instant of time must be repeated in or occupy more points than one. End quote. Surely it is the other way about. It is just this occupying by one instant of more points than one which gives extension or spaciousness to time. 
and in this spaciousness its successiveness or time character is lost for every one instant will cover many points in fact every one instant will cover all the space there is and if we could really tie up pure time with pure space there would be no successiveness of time either time must have an instant to instant movement of its own which is not conferred on it by space or it must exist purely in relation to events for example to the movements of bodies from point to point in space it must be noted that in dealing with the more complex spatio-temporal relations for example the relations of the dimensions of space professor alexander has shown triumphantly the mutual interdependence of space and time the whole of this exposition is masterly and should not be missed but there are further and more exciting implications end of book one chapter five section one part one recording by expatriate in bangor maine book one chapter five section one part two of the new idealism by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine book one the critical preparations chapter five space time and deity section one space time part two it must be noted that in dealing with the more complex spatio-temporal relations for example the relations of the dimensions of space professor alexander has shown triumphantly the mutual interdependence of space and time the whole of this exposition is masterly and should not be missed but there are further and more exciting implications Quote, space must be regarded as generated in time or if the expression be preferred by time for time is the source of movement space may then be imaged as the trail of time so long as it is remembered that there could be no time without a space in which its trail is left End quote. now how can time generate space if space is essential to and coexistent with it in this case there cannot be time first and then space and indeed professor alexander presently abandons this notion of generation Quote, to suppose that time generates new space is to neglect the infinity of time and indeed of space End quote. and to suppose that time has generated old space is to suppose a previously existing time to avoid this difficulty professor alexander flies to the theory of displacement and redistribution in space-time thus quote, in a line of advance c b a we have the displacement of the present from c through b to a this is the meaning of motion points do not of course move in the system of points but they change their time coefficient what we ordinarily call motion of a body is the occupation by that body of points which successively become present so that at each stage the points traversed have different time values when the line of motion is taken as a whole in this way we conceive of growth in time or the history of the universe as a whole or any part of it as a continuous redistribution of instants of time among points of space there is no new space to be generated as time goes on but within the whole of space or the part of it the instants of time are differently arranged so that points become different point instants and instants also become different point instants End quote. now we see how it is that time gives its values to the points of space how it discriminates and introduces diversity into that blankness it does not do this of itself as professor alexander's theory assumes but only through a body in motion it is to the body in motion that points successively become present and surely it is the body in motion that by its successive occupation of points by the fact that it is now here now there its inability to occupy more than one point at one instant surely it is this behavior and this character of bodies that confers their time value on the points 
points do not move in the system of points left to themselves they are all present at every successive instant when a body occupies a new position it leaves its old position behind it and we have that existence of all space at an instant which professor alexander denies and as a matter of fact when it comes to total space-time which is divided up not in perspectives that is to say in times which stretch over other times and spaces which stretch over other spaces but in sections which take a clean cut through time and space we indeed arrive at all space at an instant or all time at a point professor alexander denies that these sections quote, represent what the world of space-time is historically or at any one moment for at any moment of its real history space is not all of one date and time is not all at one point End quote. he says that all space at an instant and all time at a point are got by arbitrary selection from the infinite rearrangements of instants among points i do not understand this i can of course see why the clean cut at any one instant should represent all space at an instant and the clean cut at any one point should represent all time at a point and that neither should represent all space time since all space is not at one point nor all time at one instant but it seems to me that for the instant at the instant all space and all events occurring at the instant will be truly and historically represented that is to say the history of the instant will be the history of all events occurring then the events will be truly and historically there true this language is misleading so far as history implies a past as well as a present in this sense we must not say that history is represented but the total fact the whole coexistent complex of instantaneous events is represented and this is all we mean by all space at an instant or through any given duration similarly the one point will be truly and historically one event enduring throughout all time and i cannot conceive why a section should be more arbitrary selection than a perspective on the contrary when we are within the region of space-time pure and simple before qualitied events like the fall of a tree or the birth of a flower or the existence of complex percipients like plants or ourselves the section is the only selection we are justified in making or for the matter of that which can well be made the perspective on the contrary must needs be an affair of qualitied events of events perceived from different standpoints in the process of becoming events distinguished as earlier or later events that is to say selected from the context of experience all our perceptual experience is on this level and of this nature but the ultimate analysis of space-time is not on the level of our perceptual experience and our choice of any particular section will only be arbitrary in the sense that one section will be as good for our purpose as another the purely spatial and temporal difference between a section and a perspective is that a perspective involves a finite stretch of space an extension correlated with a finite stretch of time a duration this correlation will of course not itself be arbitrary inasmuch as the place of events in time through any given perspective will be determined strictly by the places and times of preceding or simultaneous events constituting the irreversible process of nature but the same thing will hold good of the order of pure point instants and our choice of any particular perspective or correlated chunk of space-time will be every bit as arbitrary as our choice of a section and you will not have ruled out the existence of all space at an instant or of all time at a point you can only say that all qualitied events cannot happen at an instant nor can any one qualitied event continue in the same quality through all instants of time you will not have solved the antinomies of space and time nor altered their essential character you will only have introduced the characters of other entities besides space and time on the lowest level of qualitied events matter and motion will themselves be infected with their contradictions we have already considered the antinomies of space and time taken separately but space-time itself gives rise to an antinomy and the antinomy of space-time is this 
one instant of time covers all the points of space that is to say all the points of space will be repeated will occur all over again at each successive instant of time thus time so far from receiving continuity from space will poison all space with the successiveness of repetition in the same way any one point covered by all instants will be indistinguishable in its time character from any other point equally covered by all instants and any instant will be indistinguishable in its space character from any other instant since all instants cover all space so that so far from time discriminating between points it only interferes to confuse them and will be itself corrupted with the indeterminateness of space introduce motion into your complex of point instants and you set up the old point instant correspondence with its antinomies of discontinuity take the total of space-time space-time that was and is and is to be and you will indeed have all space covering all time and all time covering all space but if this mutual covering is to be conceived as a complete fit time must lose its time character of succession it will be what space is an eternal now and space must lose its space character of eternal presence and become what time is succession for ever and ever and within this total at any point or any one instant there will be an infinite number of points at one instant and an infinite number of instants at one point that is to say at any one point or any one instant you will have parts unequal to each other which yet in the whole of space-time are equal to each other and to the whole to every other relation of whole and part the time factor is indifferent but here it figures as itself a term in the relation an amphibious term which stands now for a whole covering all space and now as a part in the whole of space-time and space will be equally amphibious professor alexander tries very dexterously to dodge these antinomies by avoiding the complete fit and setting up within his system of space-time a system of unequal dates he has got to show that all space and all time are not contemporaneous within the total and that one instant is not and cannot be contemporary with all points nor one point with all instants in order to do this however he has to forsake pure space-time and introduce as it were surreptitiously qualitied events of the kind that intersect and overlap events which in one space-time will be of different dates for example the rings of a tree which mark in space its successive ages in time its past thus overlapping into its present and causing a redistribution of instants in space similarly the movement of bodies through space will cause a corresponding redistribution of points in time for the body which when stationary will occupy but one point in successive times will now be occupying many points in succession moreover events have the accommodating property of occupying each other's time though no two of them can occupy each other's space this dovetailing of events is taken as constituting a continuity or packing in space-time but does it constitute a continuity will even the carefully chosen overlapping of events in time constitute a continuity in space-time take two series of unequal and overlapping dates let a series of passing events a c e g cover the instants one three five seven respectively and a series of passing events b d f cover the intermediate instants two four six respectively each instant will be duly and properly covered by an event now if event a is not to be succeeded by event c until instant three it will have had to overlap that is to say to endure throughout b's instant two and if b is not to be succeeded by d until instant four it will have to overlap c's instant three and the same will hold good of the other events and instants and at first sight it looks as if this ensured continuity but though a has endured throughout instants one and two and b throughout instants two and three and c throughout instants three and four d throughout instants four and five e throughout instants five and six and f throughout instants six and seven yet each event ends with its second instant and is succeeded by another event which ends with its second instant 
Besides, if the instants are to have a definite end and a definite beginning, and they must have, if definite dates are to be assigned to definite events, if events are to be calculable, then there will be a repetition or rebirth of A at instant 2. You can only avoid it by running the instants together, which in perceptual experience is precisely what you do do. And if the instants divide events into event particles, the same will hold good of the event particles. Again, Professor Alexander gets his continuity by regarding time as essentially space and space as essentially time. Space-time is a more profound and intimate affair than mere relation. It is an affair of identity. But does the unity manifestly conferred on them by their relations amount to identity of being? Can it be truly said that space and time are one in this sense? When we say that any instant covers all space, this does not mean that the instant is really stretched out into space, that it has the same spatial extension as space, and that while has the meaning of where, only that all points of space are present at an instant. All space has this instantaneous character. So far from time giving continuity to space, time, as we have seen, brings into space its own successiveness and discontinuity. As it is all space that is repeated in time, there will be no space between repetitions, that is to say, between instants. Or take space filled with matter in motion. Here again, time splits up space-time into point instants. Professor Alexander calls this discriminating the points in space, as if without time or without motion from point to point, they would not discriminate each other. But quite apart from time, space is pure juxtaposition. That is to say, points are already discriminated by their positions. They are positions without the aid of time. And from Professor Alexander's theory of change as an empirical quality and not a category, I think it follows that space-time is not directly implicated in change. I mean that change, if qualitative, can only take place at a higher level than that of pure space-time. It comes with the qualitative events of varying ages too late to help us. Therefore, I repeat, I cannot see how we are to get over the difficulty of those successive rebirths of space at each successive instant by this simple device of redistributing points among different dates. True, redistribution is an empirical fact. The all-space of the present instant has not the same configuration or filling as the all-space of the past or of the future instant, seeing that new spatial events are arising all the time from instant to instant. There has been movement, growth, appearance, disappearance, reappearance of forms, in a word, change. But we must not think of change as the movement of space-time itself. There is properly no movement of space-time beyond the succession of its instants. The redistribution, therefore, is not a redistribution of point instants, but a redistribution of events, or bodies in motion, occupying various points at various dates, or of qualities exemplifying various ages of the same substance, the rings on Professor Alexander's tree. But these changes or redistributions of quality will have precisely that empirical character which space-time itself has not. There is no use calling in an empirical quality to help an a priori reality in distress. Redistribution of events or qualities, then, comes too late to save all space from the successiveness of its repetitions in time. You may perhaps say that to ensure continuity, all time, past, present, and future, must be taken together with all space, so that there may be no spaceless outstanding time, no timeless outstanding space. But on the theory this is impossible. It is only in the mind, in mind's memory and anticipation, that past and future can be taken together. And on the theory, space-time is outside and independent of mind. It is what it is in and by itself without any gratuitous mental contributions. And, apart from the anticipating mind, future time has not happened yet, and past time has happened and has passed. You may say that past time, at any rate, has happened, and it has left the trail of its events on all events here and now. But in the nature of the case, future time cannot affect the present otherwise than through the mind let alone that if it were not for memory, for recognition, there would be no trail of the past for our perception.
but every element of every present event would be strangely new. But memory, so important for perception, does not touch the space-time problem as anticipation does. On the theory, the past has happened, memory or no memory. Equally, on the theory, the future as such does not exist, and as providing for all space-time, never will. In this respect, time is at a disadvantage compared with space, which can be all at one instant. So great a disadvantage that on the face of it, it is hard to see how time and space can be taken together as identical. There is nothing in space which corresponds with this non-present existence of future time. End of Book 1, Chapter 5, Section 1, Part 2 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Book One, Chapter Five, Section Two of the New Idealism by May Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Book One, The Critical Preparations, Chapter Five, Space, Time, and Deity. Section 2. The Categories. Further difficulties present themselves when we consider the categories as arising from space-time only. The categories are identity, diversity, and existence, universal, particular, and individual, relation, order, substance, causality, reciprocity, quantity, and intensity, whole and parts, number and motion. You will observe one glaring omission. It is not a printer's error. Quality has been left out on purpose. Quality, Professor Alexander says, is not a category, and we shall presently see the reasons for this singular exclusion. All the categories are said to be ultimately reducible to terms of space-time. Quote, the categories prove upon examination to be fundamental properties or determinations of space-time itself, not taken as a whole, but in every portion of it. They belong to all existence, because if our hypothesis is sound, existence are in the end, and in their simplest terms, differentiations of space-time, the complexes of events generated within that matrix. The categories are, as it were, begotten by time on space. End quote. Identity, diversity, and existence come first, and at first sight they are plainly reducible. Quote, Self identity of anything is its occupation of a space time. Diversity is the occupation of another space time. Occupancy of a space-time is ipso facto exclusion of other space-times. This is all very well, but obviously it can only be true of the being of things in space-time. However, it is no use pressing this point in this connection, as Professor Alexander does not admit that there are any things not in space-time. But he goes on. He takes a big jump clean out of the category and lands in qualitied existence. Quote, Not white is the character which excludes or is different from white. End quote. But not white excludes white, not as occupying another space time, but as occupying another class. It may be empirically true that a not white thing cannot occupy the same space time as a white thing or as any other spatio-temporal existent. But this is not the ground of the exclusion. The exclusion is from the class of whites and not from their space-times. But we must not anticipate the discussion of quality. Let us pass to the universal and particular. The problem of every theory of universals is how to secure to individuals their individuality, their embodiment of the universal here and now. Professor Alexander maintains that it is provided by his doctrine of the universal as a spatio-temporal constitutive plan or habit which persists in the individual as such. The individual repeats the plan, and all repetition is of space-time. Universals, quote, are habits of space-time, and empirical universals like dog or tree or justice are possible because space-time is uniform 
and behaves therefore on plans which are undistorted by differences of place and time they may be called patterns of configuration or to use the old greek word forms of space-time there will be no highest universal because there is nothing higher than space-time and space-time is not a universal it is not even a category it is the stuff from which universals and categories are made Quote, universality is therefore a category or determination of space-time every finite possesses universality or identity of kind in so far as it admits without distortion of repetition in space-time that is can itself undergo change of place or time or both without alteration or can be replaced by some other finite End quote. in other words universality is a determination of space-time because it is absolutely indifferent to space-time and space-time to it quote, universality is begotten like the other categories by time on space End quote. this because of its bare repetition and all the repetition in the world will not in itself give universality the universal implies the quality of sameness it is indeed above all and before all purely qualitative even if the universal could find itself in space-time and this is disputable it would not therefore be constituted by it or derivable from it or reducible to it to say this is to confuse it with a succession of particulars to make it many whereas the universal is the one in the many professor alexander sees very clearly the difficulty of conceiving the relation of the universal to its particulars he says quote, half the difficulty or perhaps all of it disappears when once it is admitted that particulars are complexes of space-time and belong therefore to the same order and are of the same stuff as the universals which are plans of space-time you would have said that this was precisely where the difficulty would begin let alone that all universals are not plans of space-time for beauty truth justice and whiteness are not plans of space-time and though a white angora rabbit is an object in space-time the universal of a white angora rabbit is not an object in space-time or a plan let alone these glaring exemptions the natural effect of space-time on the universal is rather to divide break it up into particulars than bring particulars into its unity they can i think only be brought together as elements in some consciousness which displays universals and particulars as of the same mind stuff a stuff that unites instead of separating professor alexander's view is inconsistent with the doctrine of the concrete universal which he criticizes severely the concrete universal makes for an ultimate individual or universe quote, related to its particulars as a thing to its predicates it is not a law but a system if universals on the discovery of which all science turns are really universes and not merely laws there is in the end only one individual or universe which is self-existent the minor universes are shadows End quote. he calls this absolute universal quote, the devouring maw which swallows all empirical things End quote. swallows that is to say their individuality as if the individuality of empirical things would thus be put off and off until the ultimate universal was reached as if individuality were never attained here and now but if the idealist is right even the ultimate universal is attained here and now if professor alexander is right and universals are merely laws they will be regulative not constitutive of things they will not have come down into the world of things to saturate them with quality they will not have hands and feet and as we have seen if the plan be purely spatio-temporal it will not account for those universals of qualities which are not of space-time although correlated with it what professor alexander calls disguises of qualities higher than mere motion these embarrassments thicken when we come to the category of relation Quote, all existents are in relation 
because events or groups of them are connected within space-time. Space-time is then the mother-father of all relations, and all relations follow the type of relations in space-time. All relation is reducible to spatio-temporal terms. End quote. Now, since it has been already laid down that all relations of space and time are spaces and times, it follows that all relations of entities, however qualitied, will be spaces and times. There is a certain frightful bleakness about this statement as it stands, and I gather that Professor Alexander shrinks from the extreme consequences of his theory. Quote, not all relations of existence are in their immediate character or quality spatio-temporal. But if our hypothesis is sound, they are always spatio-temporal in their simplest expression. End quote. They are, that is to say, reducible. Quote, Since qualities are, we assume, correlated with spatio-temporal processes, the relations, however otherwise represented summarily or compendiously by their qualities, are in the end spatio-temporal. They are at least reducibly without residue to such relations, which are themselves configurations of space-time. Let us try this operation of reducing on existence, which inconsiderately present themselves as disguises, very far from spatio-temporal. We shall have to abstract from them all those qualities of their obstinate complexity which are not reducible. From an individual man we must abstract more than the color and texture of his skin, hair and eyes, and the sound of his voice. You may say that these qualities are reducible since they can be correlated with characters of space-time, since color may be said to be extended in space-time and sound to fill space-time and travel through it. But even when we have admitted them to be spatio-temporal in a vicarious and derivative way, they are only partially reducible. There is still a residue, that definite something which we call quality, which distinguishes blue eyes from black, and brown hair from red, and a voice of one pitch and accent from a voice of another pitch and accent. These distinctions have their spatio-temporal correlates, wavelengths and rates of vibration. But wavelengths and rates of vibration are not black or blue, loud or soft and insinuating. And we have further to abstract qualities which have no spatial character at all, and no temporal character but that of bare existence or continuation in time. All the invisible, intangible things, psychic dispositions, ways of feeling and of thinking, play of motives, acts of will, the whole fabric of a man's consciousness have got to go. You must abstract them all from their spatio-temporal correlates. And, though the association may be constant, there is no sense in which you can derive consciousness from or reduce it to these. Correlating is not reducing. If the result of this experiment is not sufficiently convincing, try it on deity. Observe that if Professor Alexander's theory were sound, what gives character and distinction, say, to a fit of temper would be the space-time in which it happens to occur. Again, quote, the relation of particulars to one another under or by their universal is that one particular may be substituted for another. Things of the same sort are in the first place numerically different and exclude each other in space-time. End quote. The exclusions of numerical identity are thus purely quantitative. The space-time relation does not account for or describe the qualitative difference in things where they are different. And what is to be said of the relation of likeness? This is purely qualitative. It is not altogether an affair of imperfect substitution. The exclusion of like things from the same space-time is not by virtue of their likeness, nor is their likeness or unlikeness as such reducible to any spatio-temporal relation or quality. And again we have the doctrine of external relations. Quote, relation from the nature of the case as being the situation which unites things is outside them spatially or rather spatio-temporally. Surely only if the relation is a purely and directly spatio-temporal one. 
and here there emerges a very flourishing contradiction relations in space and time are themselves spaces and times then space and time can be relations but they are expressly stated not to be relations between bodies that is to say between events as on professor whitehead's theory but only between spaces and times how then are bodies related in space and time for they have spatial and temporal relations bodies are said to be bits of space-time crystals in the matrix time is their motion the terms of spatial and temporal relations then are spaces and times and the relations are spaces and times too how then do we distinguish between the terms and the relations as between categorical and non-categorical entities now relations are categorical and space-time professor alexander says is not it is the source of the categories but the relations are what the terms are spaces and times and the terms are what the relations are bits of space-time therefore both terms and relations will be categorical and non-categorical which is a fine contradiction you may perhaps say they are distinguished by their empirical qualities but empirical quality emerges from space-time and its relations it is both temporally and logically speaking outside the purely spatio-temporal relations we are discussing it is a later birth and its birth comes too late to help us to the distinction we require practically in perception we do distinguish events both by their relations and their qualities the point of the present objection is that if we stand by professor alexander's definitions we shall have no logical grounds for distinguishing between relations in space-time and their terms the point has no practical or scientific value still it is worth considering there should be no logical lapses in a sound metaphysical view of space-time there is no great hardship in admitting that order quote, depends ultimately in every case on spatio-temporal betweenness end quote thus even the moral order so far as it depends on betweenness degrees of goodness badness and so on is derived from space-time but this is not saying that moral qualities are so derived the category of substance is rather more important it is extremely important on the theory substance like the rest can only be a configuration of space-time simple or complex unity of qualities quote, is supplied by the space that is the space-time within which the qualities are disposed each quality inheres in the substance because it is included in the space and unifies the substance End quote. substantial identity is that which endures throughout space-time since then personal identity is a special instance of substantial identity the person or mind must be regarded as extended in space as well as in time if we insist that the mind is only in time and not in space we divide time and space and are back again in the antinomies of their division and because the motions which correspond to qualities do not interpenetrate the qualities of a substance do not interpenetrate thus they will be broken up into parts corresponding with their motions even if you say that their motions are continuous because space-time is continuous you will still have the special discreteness of compounds on your hands professor alexander says they do not matter Quote, we need take no account of the purely empirical fact that within a substance which is compound there may be empty spaces or pores not included in the substance itself End quote. the idea seems to be that if you have once called a thing a purely empirical fact it will cease to worry you but surely it is glaringly evident that from the point of view of continuity the discreteness of substance matters very much indeed at this rate the theory of quanta will not matter but it is supposed that the peculiar continuity of pure space-time is sufficient to tide the compounds over the gaps in their substance because space-time is substance causality is easily defined as quote, the spatio-temporal continuity of one substance with another 
a cause is the motion of a substance, or a substance in respect of its motion. Causation is the continuity of existence within continuous space-time as subsisting between substances, which are themselves motions or groups of motions. End quote. It will at once be admitted that causality is pre-eminently a category where, if anywhere, the spatio-temporal theory may be expected to justify itself. Even with such a reservation, as denying that time can in any strict sense be said to be a cause, we may welcome its immense simplifications. It rules out forever the notion of power and necessity. But for those who obstinately deny the continuity of space-time, causality, if merely spatio-temporal, will be infected with time's taint of relative unreality. There is, Professor Alexander says further, quote, no causal relation between the infinite whole and any one of its parts. There is only such relation between one part and another. The whole system of things does not descend into the arena and contend with one of its creatures. End quote. In this case, causality will be very powerfully tainted, broken up forever into the sequences of event particles. We are driven inevitably from this notion of cause to that higher concept of the ground which Professor Alexander repudiates. This concept does not, I think, mean that the whole system of things breaks loose like a lunatic and descends into the arena to contend with one of its creatures. Nothing could well be farther from it than this image of descending and contending. It means not that the whole universe has a being apart from its creatures, but that each creature is united with every other creature in the universe as their common ground. This can well be if in the whole universe there is but one stuff of all creatures. It could have well been on the assumption that space-time is that stuff if space-time really provided the necessary continuity and was really pregnant from the first with life, mind, and deity. Causality brings us to reciprocity, and reciprocity implies simultaneity. But on Professor Alexander's view, quote, simultaneity is an outcome of the successive character of space-time, a space-time which is occupied by time at various stages of the intrinsic succession of time, allows both for the persistence of space and for its complete occupation at any one moment. End quote. And again it must be urged that space at an instant would be completely occupied by all events present at that instant, and space at the next instant by all the events then present, though they would not all be the same events. But at any instant, whatever the events may be, it is still all space at an instant. Quantity and intensity are reducible without difficulty to space-time. Quote, Extensive quantity is the occupation of any space by its time or the occupation of any time by its space. Space as so occupied is an extension. Time as so occupied is a duration. Quantity is thus equivalent to the bare fact that space is swept out in time or that time is occupation of space. Intensity or intensive quantity, on the other hand, is the occurrence of various spaces in the same time, or the occupation of the same space by different times. The simplest case is the velocity of a simple motion. Intensive quantity is the fact that time may be filled by space, and space by time unequally. End quote. Intensities of sensation on the theory will be only particular instances of these spatio-temporal relations. The derivation of whole and parts follows inevitably. Quote, Time disintegrates space directly by distinguishing it into successive spaces. Space disintegrates time indirectly by making it a whole of times, without which whole there would be no separate times either. There would be no aggregate wholes composed of individuals were it not for the connecting space-time. The intrinsic resolution of space-time through the internal relations of space and time is the basis of all distinction of parts, no matter how loosely the whole is united of them. End quote. The only objection that the idealist can make here 
is that logical wholes are not spatio-temporal. Motion, the last and greatest category for space-time, is obviously spatio-temporal. What is not so obvious is that motion is a category, since motion is space-time and space-time is not a category. It seems to bear an amphibious character, half categorical, half empirical. Quote, but in fact, though every empirical existent is some sort of motion or other, it is the sort of motion that it is that makes it empirical. That it is a motion or a space or a time is a priori or non-empirical. And in fact, the category of motion is but another expression of the fact that every existent is a piece of space-time. Motion is thus the border line between the categorical and the empirical region. In motion, the full tale of the fundamental determination of space-time is told, and motion is consequently the totality of what can be affirmed of every space-time. End quote. And point instants also have this amphibious character. Quote, they are empirical like the infinites, for each point instant has its own individual character, is of this. Yet since they are the elements of space-time, which is the source of all categories, they illustrate that intimate connection of the non-empirical and the empirical, which, but they cannot be treated as finites, regarded as having a separate existence like ordinary finites. Point instants are real, but their separation is conceptual. End quote. And here, Professor Alexander makes a tremendous admission. Real they are, he says, but if the apparent contradiction may be pardoned, they are ideal realities. End quote. That is to say, the very elements of space-time are ideal. The matrix from which matter crystallizes is ideal. The ideal is the ultimate reality. Professor Alexander is aware that the admission is tremendous. I do not attempt, he says, to minimize the difficulties of this statement. It is enough for him that these ideal entities can be swept into the universal space-time. We cannot expect him to adopt a conclusion inevitable for idealism that if the very elements of space-time are ideal, space-time is itself an ideal construction and must be swept into the universal consciousness. For ideas, on the realist hypothesis, are non-mental, and when we come to mental space-time, it cannot be said to give a handle to idealism either. End of Book 1, Chapter 5, Section 2 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Book One, Chapter Five, Section Three of the New Idealism by May Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Book One, The Critical Preparations, Chapter Five, Space, Time, and Deity, Section Three, Quality. Meanwhile, the consideration of motion has raised again the more acute problem of quality. Quote, there is a motion quality as there is redness or sweetness, but while all other empirical qualities are correlated with motions, the quality motion is purely spatiotemporal, that of being a space-time. And presently we come to a hard saying, quality is not a category. It is not a category, because it is not pervasive as the categories are, and it is not universal, it is not a plan. Quote, it may be answered that everything possesses some quality or other, and therefore quality is categorical. Everything is a complex of space-time, and to complexity corresponds quality upon our own showing. End quote. But no. Quote, Complexity in space-time makes everything a complex, but not a quality. The quality of the color varies with the wavelength of the vibration. Now, every color has some wavelength or other. But length of wave is a quantity and not a quality. Length of wave as such has no color as such. End quote. 
could there be a plainer statement of the inability of space-time to account for quality a franker confession of the breakdown of the space-time theory here the murder is out quality is not reducible without residue to spatio-temporal terms and relations it is not quantitative its correlations with quantity are themselves mysterious and irreducible the most you can say is that quality belongs to things which are in space-time it is miraculously and magically there but on professor alexander's own showing it will not fit into his spatio-temporal scheme and that is why it is denied its age-long status as a category if it were a category it would make its occult and alien presence felt pervasively this trouble professor alexander hopes to avoid by calling quality empirical this camouflages in a sense its obstinate recalcitrance it is only empirical poor thing and knows no better and still the problem remains of accounting for its queerness in a purely spatio-temporal universe quality is an eccentricity or rather since there is no universal quality qualities are eccentricities strange new crystallizations in the matrix they belong but they are not reducible to space-time nor derivable from it they have all of them just mysteriously and miraculously emerged the problem becomes still more acute when we get to change here the only happy line for professor alexander to take would have been to say that all change is motion and have done with it but he cannot do this for though all motion is change all change is not motion Quote, primarily change is change of quality and quality is always empirical End quote. and yet it is motion quote, remembering that all existences no matter what qualities they possess are in the end complexes of motion we may describe change as a species of motion which replaces one set of motions by another it is grounded in motion and may be described as a motion from one motion to another the nature of the transitional motion may be different in different cases thus one thought may lead on to another and the motion is experienced as a direct transition between the two thoughts in every case we have not a mere difference but a motion which ends in the substitution of one empirical condition for another change is then not categorical but empirical End quote. thus the qualitative character of change breaks through something changes and its change is something more indirect and more complex than its movement so that where change is movement within the movement itself you have this mysterious and irreducible thing quality we have yet to learn all the things which space-time is not clearly it is not an existent existence belongs to that which occupies a space-time and there is no space-time outside space-time which it could occupy when we ask if space-time is not a whole and a one that includes many and a substance the answer is no space-time is not a whole of parts superficially this again is a hard saying for space-time was distinctly stated to be the totality of all existence it looks then as if existence within space-time were not its parts but i think this is not professor alexander's meaning space-time has parts the parts of space are spaces and the parts of time are times but space-time is not the whole of them for this reason quote, space-time breaks up into parts and wholes of them as it lives and moves if space-time were such a whole it would be given all at once but being time or indeed space for that matter it is not given altogether to suppose so is to ignore the reality of time to fail to take time seriously End quote. time drives space-time forward forever to the redistribution of point instants quote, for in the redistribution of dates among places new existence are generated within the one space-time i think an objection may be made to this argument the point instants are the parts of space-time all that time does is to redistribute them it does not add more point instants to the sum total there is no sum total of point instants if their number is infinite 
thus it is because its parts are infinite and not because time redistributes them that space-time is not a whole again to come to greater clarities it is evident that space-time is not a substance in spite of the previous definition of substance as space-time for substance is an existent configuration of space in so far as it is the theatre of time it is a space with definite contour occupied by time that is a space enduring in time but infinite space has no contour and is thus no substance End quote. and so of unity quote, in like manner space-time is in no case a unity of many things it is not a one End quote. to be a unity professor alexander says would imply that it can descend into the field of number and be merely an individual and be compared as one with two or three but this is not what we mean by a unity truly quote, the universe is neither one in this sense nor many it can only be described not as one and still less as one but as the one it is not so much an individual or a singular as the one and only matrix of generation to which no rival is possible because all rivalry is fashioned within the same matrix End quote. and surely this is precisely what we mean by a unity and the question is can space-time with its antinomies with its inimical attitude to quality with the marks of time's restlessness upon it be truly said to be such a unity End of Book One, Chapter Five, Section Three. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine.